Section 21 of Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Rome by Emil Zola, translated by Ernest Visitelli. Chapter 11, Part 1. Although Pierre knew that he would be unable to see Cardinal Sanguinetti before eleven o'clock, he nevertheless availed himself of an early train, so that it was barely nine when he alighted at the little station of Frascati. He had already visited the place during his enforced idleness, when he had made the classical excursion to the Roman castles which extend from Frascati to Rocco di Papa, and from Rocco di Papa to Monte Cavo, and he was now delighted with the prospect of strolling for a couple of hours along those first slopes of the Alban hills, where amidst rushes, olives and vines, Frascati, like a promontory, overlooks the immense ruddy sea of the Campania even as far as Rome, which, six full leagues away, wears the whitish aspect of a marble isle. Ah, that charming Frascati on its greeny knoll at the foot of the wooded Tusculan heights, with its famous terrace whence one enjoys the finest view in the world, its old patrician villas with proud and elegant renaissance facades and magnificent parks which planted with cypress pine and ilex are forever green there was a sweetness a delight a fascination about the spot of which pierre would never have wearied and for more than an hour he had wandered blissfully along roads edged with ancient knotty olive trees along dingle ways shaded by the spreading foliage of neighbouring estates and along perfumed paths at each turn of which the campagna was seen stretching far away, when all at once he was accosted by a person whom he was both surprised and annoyed to meet. He had strolled down to some low ground near the railway station, some old vineyards where a number of new houses had been built of recent years, and suddenly saw a stylish pair-horse Victoria, coming from the direction of Rome, draw up close by, whilst its occupant called to him, "'What, Monsieur l'Abbé Fromont, are you taking a walk here at this early hour?' Thereupon Pierre recognized Count Luigi Prada, who alighted, shook hands with him, and began to walk beside him, whilst the empty carriage went on in advance. And forthwith the Count explained his tastes. I seldom take the train, he said. I drive over. It gives my horses an outing. I have interests over here, as you may know, a big building enterprise which is unfortunately not progressing very well. And so, although the season is advanced, I am obliged to come rather more frequently than I care to do. As Prada suggested, Pierre was acquainted with the story. The Bocaneras had been obliged to sell a sumptuous villa which a cardinal of their family had built at Frascati in accordance with the plans of Giacomo della Porta during the latter part of the 16th century. A regal summer residence it had been, finely wooded, with groves and basins and cascades, and in particular a famous terrace projecting like a cape above the Roman Campagna, whose expanse stretches from the Sabine Mountains to the Mediterranean sands. Through the division of the property, Benedetta had inherited from her mother some very extensive vineyards below Frascati, and these she had brought as dowry to Prada at the very moment when the building mania was extending from Rome into the provinces, and thereupon Prada had conceived the idea of erecting on the spot a number of middle-class villas like those which litter the suburbs of Paris. Few purchasers, however, had come forward, the financial crash had supervened, and he was now with difficulty liquidating this unlucky business, having indemnified his wife at the time of their separation. And then, he continued, addressing Pierre, one can come and go as one likes with a carriage, whereas on taking the train one is at the mercy of the timetable. This morning, for instance, I have appointments with contractors, experts and lawyers, and I have no notion how long they will keep me. It's a wonderful country, isn't it? And we are quite right to be proud of it in Rome. Although I may have some worries just now, I can never set foot here without my heart beating with delight. A circumstance which he did not mention was that his amica, Lisbeth Kaufmann, had spent the summer in one of the newly erected villas where she had installed her studio and had been visited by all the foreign colony which tolerated her irregular position on account of her gay spirits and artistic talent. Indeed, people had even ended by accepting the outcome of her connection with Prada, and a fortnight previously she had returned to Rome, and there given birth to a son, an event which had again revived all the scandalous tittle-tattle respecting Benedetta's divorce suite. And Prada's attachment to Frascati doubtless sprang from the recollection of the happy hours he had spent there, and the joyful pride with which the birth of the boy inspired him. 
pierre for his part felt ill at ease in the young count's presence for he had an instinctive hatred of money-mongers and men of prey nevertheless he desired to respond to his amiability and so inquired after his father old orlando the hero of the liberation oh replied prada excepting for his legs he's in wonderfully good health he'll live a hundred years poor father i should so much have liked to install him in one of these little houses last summer but i could not get him to consent he's determined not to leave rome he's afraid perhaps that it might be taken away from him during his absence then the young count burst into a laugh quite merry at the thought of jeering at the heroic but no longer fashionable age of independence and afterwards he said my father was speaking of you again only yesterday monsieur l'abbé he is astonished that he has not seen you lately this distressed pierre for he had begun to regard orlando with respectful affection since his first visit he had twice called on the old hero but the latter had refused to broach the subject of rome so long as his young friend should not have seen felt and understood everything there would be time for a talk later on said he when they were both in a position to formulate their conclusions pray tell count orlando responded pierre that i have not forgotten him and that if i have deferred a fresh visit it is because i desire to satisfy him however i certainly will not leave rome without going to tell him how deeply his kind greeting has touched me whilst talking the two men slowly followed the ascending road past the newly erected villas several of which were not yet finished and when prada learned that the priest had come to call on cardinal sanguinetti he again laughed with the laugh of a good-natured wolf showing his white fangs true he exclaimed the cardinal has been here since the pope has been laid up ah you'll find him in a pretty fever why why because there's bad news about the holy father this morning when i left rome it was rumoured that he had spent a fearful night so speaking prada halted at a bend of the road not far from an antique chapel a little church of solitary mournful grace of aspect on the verge of an olive grove beside it stood a ruinous building the old parsonage no doubt whence there suddenly emerged a tall knotty priest with coarse and earthy face who after roughly locking the door went off in the direction of the town ah resumed the count in a tone of raillery that fellow's heart also must be beating violently he's surely gone to your cardinal in search of news pierre had looked at the priest i know him he replied i saw him i remember on the day after my arrival at cardinal Bocaneras. he brought the cardinal a basket of figs and asked him for a certificate in favour of his young brother who had been sent to prison for some deed of violence a knife thrust if i recollect rightly however the cardinal absolutely refused him the certificate it's the same man said prada you may depend on it he was often at the villa bocanera formerly for his young brother was gardener there but he's now the client the creature of cardinal sanguinetti santa bono his name is and he's a curious character such as you wouldn't find in france i fancy he lives all alone in that falling hovel and officiates at that old chapel of st mary in the fields where people don't go to hear mass three times in a year yes it's a perfect sinecure which with its stipend of a thousand francs enables him to live there like a peasant philosopher cultivating the somewhat extensive garden whose big walls you see yonder the close to which he called attention stretched down the slope behind the parsonage without an aperture like some savage place of refuge into which not even the eye could penetrate and all that could be seen above the left-hand wall was a superb gigantic fig tree whose big leaves showed blackly against the clear sky prada had moved on again and continued to speak of santa bono who evidently interested him fancy a patriot priest a garibaldian born at nemi in that yet savage nook among the alban hills he belonged to the people and was still near to the soil however he had studied and knew sufficient history to realize the past greatness of rome and dream of the re-establishment of roman dominion as represented by young italy and he had come to believe with passionate fervour that only a great pope could realise his dream by seizing upon power and then conquering all the other nations and what could be easier since the pope commanded millions of catholics did not half europe belong to him france spain and austria would give way as soon as they should see him powerful dictating laws to the world 
Germany and Great Britain, indeed all the Protestant countries, would also inevitably be conquered, for the papacy was the only dike that could be opposed to error, which must some day fatally succumb in its efforts against such a barrier. Politically, however, Santo Bono had declared himself for Germany, for he considered that France needed to be crushed before she would throw herself into the arms of the Holy Father. And thus contradictions and fancies clashed in his foggy brain, whose burning ideas swiftly turned to violence under the influence of primitive racial fierceness. Briefly, the priest was a barbarian upholder of the gospel, a friend of the humble and woeful, a sectarian of that school which is capable of like of great virtues and great crimes. Yes, concluded Prada, he is now devoted to Cardinal Sanguinetti because he believes that the latter will prove the great Pope of tomorrow, who is to make Rome the one capital of the nations. At the same time, he doubtless harbours a lower personal ambition, that of attaining to a canonry or of gaining assistance in the little worries of life, as when he wished to extricate his brother from trouble. Here, you know, people stake their luck on a cardinal just as they nurse a tray in the lottery, and if their cardinal proves the winning number and becomes pope, they gain a fortune. And that's why you now see Santa Bona striding along yonder, all anxiety to know if Leo XIII will die and Sanguinetti don the tiara. Do you think the Pope so very ill, then? asked Pierre, both anxious and interested. The Count smiled and raised both arms. Ah, said he, can one ever tell? They all get ill when their interest lies that way. However, I believe that the Pope is this time really indisposed. A complaint of the bowels, it is said. And at his age, you know, the slightest indisposition may prove fatal. The two men took a few steps in silence, then the priest again asked a question. Would Cardinal Sanguinetti have a great chance if the Holy See were vacant? A great chance? Ah, that's another of those things which one never knows. The truth is, people class Sanguinetti among the acceptable candidates, and if personal desire sufficed, he would certainly be the next Pope, for ambition consumes him to the marrow, and he displays extraordinary passion and determination in his efforts to succeed. But therein lies his very weakness. He is using himself up, and he knows it. And so he must be resolved to every step during the last days of battle. You may be quite sure that if he has shut himself up here at this critical time, it is in order that he may the better direct his operations from a distance, whilst at the same time feigning a retreat, a disinterestedness which is bound to have a good effect. Then Prada began to expatiate on Sanguinetti with no little complacency, for he liked the man's spirit of intrigue, his keen conquering appetite, his excessive and even somewhat blundering activity. He had become acquainted with him on his return from the nunciature at Vienna, when he had already resolved to win the tiara. That ambition explained everything, his quarrels and reconciliations with the reigning Pope, his affection for Germany, followed by a sudden evolution in the direction of France, his varying attitude with regard to Italy, at first a desire for agreement, and then absolute rejection of all compromises, a refusal to grant any concession so long as Rome should not be evacuated. This indeed seemed to be Sanguinetti's definite position. He made a show of disliking the wavering sway of Leo XIII, and of retaining a fervent admiration for Pius IX, the great heroic Pope of the days of resistance, whose goodness of heart had proved no impediment to unshakable firmness. And all this was equivalent to a promise that he, Sanguinetti, would again make kindliness exempt from weakness, the rule of the church, and steer clear of the dangerous compoundings of politics. Nevertheless, at bottom, politics were his only dream, and he had even formulated a complete program of intentional vagueness, which his clients and creatures spread abroad with an air of rapturous mystery. However, since a previous indisposition of the Pope's, during the spring, he had been living in mortal disquietude, for it had then been rumoured that the Jesuits would resign themselves to support Cardinal Pio Bocconera, although the latter scarcely favoured them. He was rough and stern, no doubt, and his extreme bigotry might be a source of danger in this tolerant age. But on the other hand, was he not a patrician, and would not his election imply that the papacy would never cease to claim the temporal power? From that moment Bocconera had been the one man whom Sanguinetti feared, for he beheld himself despoiled of his prize, and spent his time in devising plans to rid himself of such a powerful rival, repeating abominable stories of Cardinal Pio's alleged complaisance with regard to Benedetta and Dario, and incessantly representing him as Antichrist, the man of sin, whose reign would consummate the ruin of the papacy. 
finally to regain the support of the jesuits sanguinetti's last idea was to repeat through his familiars that for his part he would not merely maintain the principle of the temporal power intact but would even undertake to regain that power and he had a full plan on the subject which folks confided to one another in whispers a plan which in spite of its apparent concessions would lead to the overwhelming victory of the church it was to raise the prohibition which prevented catholics from voting or becoming candidates at the italian elections to send a hundred then two hundred and then three hundred deputies to the chamber and in that wise to overthrow the house of savoy and establish a federation of the italian provinces whereof the holy father once more placed in possession of rome would become the august and sovereign president as prada finished he again laughed showing his white teeth teeth which would never readily relinquish the prey they held so you see he added we need to defend ourselves since it's a question of turning us out fortunately there are some little obstacles in the way of that nevertheless such dreams naturally have great influence on excited minds such as that of santo bono for instance he's a man whom one word from sanguinetti would lead far indeed ah he has good legs look at him up yonder he has already reached the cardinal's little palace that white villa with the sculptured balconies pierre raised his eyes and perceived the episcopal residence which was one of the first houses of frascati of modern construction and renaissance style it overlooked the immensity of the roman campagna it was now eleven o'clock and as the young priest before going up to pay his own visit bade the count good-bye the latter for a moment kept hold of his hand do you know said he it would be very kind of you to lunch with me will you come and join me at that restaurant yonder with the pink front as soon as you are at liberty i shall have settled my own business in an hour's time and i shall be delighted to have your company at table pierre began by declining but he could offer no possible excuse and at last surrendered won over despite himself by prada's real charm of manner when they had parted the young priest only had to climb a street in order to reach the cardinal's door with his natural expansiveness and craving for popularity sanguinetti was easy of access and at frascati in particular his doors were flung open even to the most humble cassocks so pierre was at once ushered in a circumstance which somewhat surprised him for he remembered the bad humour of the servant whom he had seen on calling at the cardinal's residence in rome when he had been advised to forego the journey as his eminence did not like to be disturbed when he was ill however nothing spoke of illness in that pleasant villa flooded with sunshine true the waiting-room where he was momentarily left alone displayed neither luxury nor comfort but it was brightened by the finest light in the world and overlooked that extraordinary campagna so flat so bare and so unique in its beauty for in front of it one ever dreams and sees the past arise and so whilst waiting pierre stationed himself at an open window conducting on to a balcony and his eyes roamed over the endless sea of herbage to the far-away whiteness of rome above which rose the dome of st peter's at that distance a mere sparkling speck barely as large as the nail of one's little finger however the young man had scarcely taken up this position when he was surprised to hear some people talking their words reaching him with great distinctness and on leaning forward he realized that his eminence in person was standing on another balcony close by and conversing with a priest only a portion of whose cassock could be seen still this sufficed for pierre to recognize santa bono his first impulse dictated by natural discretion was to withdraw from the window but the words he next heard riveted him to the spot we shall know in a moment his eminence was saying in his full voice i sent eufemio to rome for he is the only person in whom i have any confidence and see there is the train bringing him back a train still as small as a plaything could in fact be seen approaching over the vast plain and doubtless it was to watch for its arrival that sanguinetti had stationed himself on the balcony and there he lingered with his eyes fixed on distant rome then santo bono in a passionate voice spoke some words which pierre imperfectly understood but the cardinal with clear articulation rejoined yes yes my dear fellow a catastrophe would be a great misfortune ah may his holiness long be preserved to us then he paused and as he was no hypocrite gave full expression to the thoughts which were in his mind at least i hope that he will be preserved just now for the times are bad and i am in frightful anguish the partisans of antichrist have lately gained much ground a cry escaped santo bono 
Oh, your eminence will act and triumph. I, my dear fellow, what would you have me do? I am simply at the disposal of my friends, those who are willing to believe in me, with the sole object of ensuring the victory of the Holy See. It is they who ought to act, it is they, each according to the measure of his means, who ought to bar the road to the wicked in order that the righteous may succeed. Ah, oh, if Antichrist should reign! The recurrence of this word Antichrist greatly disturbed Pierre, but he suddenly remembered what the Count had told him. Antichrist was Cardinal Bocconera. Think of that, my dear fellow, continued Sanguinetti. Picture Antichrist at the Vatican, consummating the ruin of religion by his implacable pride, his iron will, his gloomy passion for nihility. For there can be no doubt of it, he is the beast of death announced by the prophecies, the beast who will expose one and all to the danger of being swallowed up with him in his furious rush into abysmal darkness. I know him. He only dreams of obstinacy and destruction. He will seize the pillars of the temple and shake them in order that he may sink beneath the ruins, he and the whole Catholic world. In less than six months he will be driven from Rome, at strife with all the nations, execrated by Italy, and roaming the world like the phantom of the last pope. It was with a low growl, suggestive of a stifled oath, that Santo Bono responded to this frightful prediction. But the train had now reached the station, and among the few passengers who had alighted, Pierre could distinguish a little abbé who was walking so fast that his cassock flapped against his hips. It was Abbé Eofemio, the cardinal's secretary, and when he had perceived his eminence on the balcony he lost all self-respect and broke into a run in order that he might the sooner ascend the sloping street. "'Ah, here's Eofemio!' exclaimed the cardinal, quivering with anxiety. "'We shall know now, we shall know now!' The secretary had plunged into the doorway below, and he climbed the stairs with such rapidity that almost immediately afterwards Pierre saw him rush breathlessly across the waiting-room and vanish into the cardinal's sanctum. Sanguinetti had quitted the balcony to meet his messenger, but soon afterwards he returned to it asking questions, venting exclamations, raising, in fact, quite a tumult over the news which he had received. And so it's really true, the night was a bad one. His holiness scarcely slept. Colic, you are told, but nothing could be worse at his age. It might carry him off in a couple of hours. And the doctors, what do they say? The answer did not reach Pierre, but he understood its purport as the cardinal in his naturally loud voice resumed, Oh, the doctors never know. Besides, when they refuse to speak, death is never far off. Ah, what a misfortune if the catastrophe cannot be deferred for a few days. Then he became silent, and Pierre realized that his eyes were once more traveling towards Rome, gazing with ambitious anguish at the dome of St. Peter's, that little sparkling speck above the vast, ruddy plain. What a commotion, what agitation if the Pope were dead! And he wished that it had merely been necessary for him to stretch forth his arm in order to take and hold the eternal city, the holy city, which, yonder on the horizon, occupied no more space than a heap of gravel cast there by a child's spade and he was already dreaming of the coming conclave, when the canopy of each other cardinal would fall, and his own, motionless and sovereign, would crown him with purple. But you are right, my friend, he suddenly exclaimed, addressing Santa Bono. One must act. The salvation of the church is at stake. And besides, it is impossible that heaven should not be with us, since our sole desire is its triumph. If necessary, at the supreme moment, heaven will know how to crush Antichrist. Then, for the first time, Pierre distinctly heard the voice of Santo Bono, who, gruffly, with a sort of savage decision, responded, Oh, if heaven is tardy, it shall be helped. That was all. The young man heard nothing further save a confused murmur of voices. The speakers quitted the balcony, and his spell of waiting began afresh in the sunlit salon, so peaceful and delightful in its brightness. But all at once the door of his eminence's private room was thrown wide open and a servant ushered him in, and he was surprised to find the cardinal alone, for he had not witnessed the departure of the two priests who had gone off by another door. The cardinal, with his highly coloured face, big nose, thick lips, square-set, vigorous figure, which still looked young despite his sixty years, was standing near a window in the bright golden light. He had put on the paternal smile with which he greeted even the humblest from motives of good policy, and as soon as Pierre had knelt and kissed his ring, he motioned him to a chair. Sit down, dear son, sit down. 
you have come of course about that unfortunate affair of your book i am very pleased indeed to be able to speak with you about it he himself then took a chair in front of that window overlooking rome whence he seemed unable to drag himself and the young priest whilst apologizing for coming to disturb his rest perceived that he scarcely listened for his eyes again sought the prey which he so ardently coveted yet the semblance of good-natured attention was perfect and pierre marvelled at the force of will which this man must possess to appear so calm so interested in the affairs of others when such a tempest was raging in him your eminence will i hope kindly forgive me continued the young priest but you have done right to come since i am kept here by my failing health said the cardinal besides i am somewhat better and it is only natural that you should wish to give me some explanations and defend your work and enlighten my judgment in fact i was astonished at not yet having seen you for i know that your faith in your cause is great and that you spare no steps to convert your judges so speak my dear son i am listening and shall be pleased indeed if i can absolve you pierre was caught by these kind words and a hope returned to him that of winning the support of the all-powerful prefect of the index he already regarded this ex nuncio who at brussels and vienna had acquired the worldly art of sending people away satisfied with indefinite promises though he meant to grant them nothing as a man of rare intelligence and exquisite cordiality and so once more he regained the fervour of his apostolate to express his views respecting the future rome the rome he dreamt of which was destined yet again to become the mistress of the world if she would return to the christianity of jesus to an ardent love for the weak and the humble sanguinetti smiled wagged his head and raised exclamations of rapture very good very good indeed perfect oh i agree with you dear son one cannot put things better it is quite evident all good minds must agree with you and then said he the poetic side deeply touched him like leo thirteen and doubtless in a spirit of rivalry he courted the reputation of being a very distinguished latinist and professed a special and boundless affection for virgil i know i know he exclaimed i remember your page on the return of spring which consoles the poor whom winter has frozen oh i read it three times over and are you aware that your writing is full of latin turns of style i noticed more than fifty expressions which could be found in the bucolics your book is a charm a perfect charm as he was no fool and realized that the little priest before him was a man of high intelligence he ended by interesting himself not in pierre personally but in the profit which he might possibly derive from him amidst his feverish intrigues he unceasingly sought to utilize all the qualities possessed by those whom god sent to him that might in any way be conducive to his own triumph so for a moment he turned away from rome and looked his companion in the face listening to him and asking himself in what way he might employ him either at once in the crisis through which he was passing or later on when he should be pope but the young priest again made the mistake of attacking the temporal power and of employing that unfortunate expression a new religion thereupon the cardinal stopped him with a gesture still smiling still retaining all his amiability although the resolution which he had long since formed became from that moment definitive you are certainly in the right on many points my dear son he said and i often share your views share them completely but come you are doubtless not aware that i am the protector of lourdes here at rome and so after the page which you have written about the grotto how can i possibly pronounce in your favour and against the fathers pierre was utterly overcome by this announcement for he was indeed unaware of the cardinal's position with respect to lourdes nobody having taken the precaution to warn him however each of the catholic enterprises distributed throughout the world has a protector at rome a cardinal who is designated by the pope to represent it and if need be to defend it those good fathers sanguinetti continued in a gentle voice you have caused them great grief and really our hands are tied we cannot add to their sorrow if you only knew what a number of masses they send us i know more than one of our poor priests who would die of hunger if it were not for them pierre could only bow beneath the blow once more he found himself in presence of the pecuniary question the necessity in which the holy see is placed to secure the revenue it requires one year with another and thus the pope was ever in servitude for if the loss of rome had freed him of the cares of state his enforced gratitude for the alms he received still riveted him to earth so great indeed were the requirements that money was the ruler the sovereign power 
before which all bowed at the court of Rome. And now Sanguinetti rose to dismiss his visitor. You must not despair, dear son, he said effusively. I have only my own vote, you know, and I promise you that I will take into account the excellent explanations which you have just given me. And who can tell? If God be with you, he will save you, even in spite of all. This speech formed part of the cardinal's usual tactics, for one of his principles was never to drive people to extremes by sending them away hopeless. What good, indeed, would it do to tell this one that the condemnation of his book was a foregone conclusion, and that his only prudent course would be to disavow it? Only a savage like Bocanera breathed anger upon fiery souls and plunged them into rebellion. You must hope, hope, repeated Sanguinetti with a smile, as if implying a multitude of fortunate things which he could not plainly express. Thereupon Pierre, who was deeply touched, felt born anew. He even forgot the conversation he had surprised, the cardinal's keen ambition and covert rage with his redoubtable rival. Besides, might not intelligence take the place of heart among the powerful? If this man should some day become Pope, and had understood him, might he not prove the Pope who was awaited, the Pope who would accept the task of reorganizing the Church of the United States of Europe, and making it the spiritual sovereign of the world? So he thanked him with emotion, bowed, and left him to his dream, standing before that widely open window whence Rome appeared to him, glittering like a jewel, even indeed as the tiara of gold and gems, in the splendour of the autumn sun. It was nearly one o'clock when Pierre and Count Prada were at last able to sit down to déjeuner in the little restaurant where they had agreed to meet. They had both been delayed by their affairs. However, the Count, having settled some worrying matters to his own advantage, was very lively, whilst the priest on his side was again hopeful and yielded to the delightful charm of that last fine day and so the meal proved a very pleasant one in the large bright room which as usual at that season of the year was quite deserted pink and blue predominated in the decoration but cupids fluttered on the ceiling and landscapes vaguely recalling the roman castles adorned the walls the things they ate were fresh and they drank the wine of frascati to which the soil imparts a kind of burnt flavour as if the old volcanoes of the region had left some little of their fire behind for a long while the conversation ranged over those wild and graceful alban hills which fortunately for the pleasure of the eye overlook the flat roman campagna pierre who had made the customary carriage excursion from frascati to nemi still felt its charm and spoke of it in glowing language first came the lovely road from frascati to albano ascending and descending hillsides planted with reeds vines and olive trees amongst which one obtained frequent glimpses of the campagna's wavy immensity on the left hand the village of rocca di papa arose in amphitheatrical fashion showing whitely on a knoll below monte cavo which was crowned by lofty and ancient trees and from this point of the road on looking back towards frascati one saw high up on the verge of a pine wood the ruins of tusculum large ruddy ruins baked by centuries of sunshine and whence the boundless panorama must have been superb Next one passed through Marino, with its sloping streets, its large cathedral, and its black decaying palace belonging to the Colonnas. Then, beyond a wood of ilex trees, the lake of Albano was skirted with scenery which has no parallel in the world. In front, beyond the clear mirror of motionless water, were the ruins of Alba Longa. On the left rose Monte Cavo with Rocca di Papa and Palazzuolo, whilst on the right Castel Gandolfo overlooked the lake as from the summit of a cliff. Down below, in the extinct crater, as in the depths of a gigantic cup of verdure, the lake slept heavy and lifeless. A sheet of molten metal, which the sun on one side streaked with gold, whilst the other was black with shade. And the road then ascended all the way to Castel Gandolfo, which was perched on its rock, like a white bird betwixt the lake and the sea. Ever refreshed by breezes, even in the most burning hours of summer, the little place was once famous for its papal villa, where Pius IX loved to spend hours of indolence, and whither Leo XIII has never come. And next the road dipped down, and the ilex trees appeared again, ilex trees famous for their size, a double row of monsters with twisted limbs, two and three hundred years old. Then one at last reached Albano, a small town less modernized and less cleansed than Frascati, a patch of the old land which has retained some of its ancient wildness. And afterwards there was Ariccia with the Palazzo Chigi, 
and hills covered with forests and viaducts spanning ravines which overflowed with foliage and there was yet genzano and yet nemi growing still wilder and more remote lost in the midst of rocks and trees ah how ineffaceable was the recollection which pierre had retained of nemi nemi on the shore of its lake nemi so delicious and fascinating from afar conjuring up all the ancient legends of fairy towns springing from amidst the greenery of mysterious waters but so repulsively filthy when one at last reaches it crumbling on all sides but yet dominated by the orsini tower as by the evil genius of the middle ages which there seems to perpetuate the ferocious habits the violent passions the knife thrusts of the past thence came that santo bono whose brother had killed and who himself with his eyes of crime glittering like live embers seems to be consumed by a murderous flame and the lake that lake round like an extinguished moon fallen into the depths of a former crater a deeper and less open cup than that of the lake of albano a cup rimmed with trees of wondrous vigour and density pines elms and willows descend to the very margin with a green mass of tangled branches which weigh each other down this formidable fecundity springs from the vapour which constantly arises from the water under the parching action of the sun whose rays accumulate in this hollow till it becomes like a furnace there is a warm heavy dampness the paths of the adjacent gardens grow green with moss and in the morning dense mists often fill the large cup with white vapour as with the steaming milk of some sorceress of malevolent craft and pierre well remembered how uncomfortable he had felt before that lake where ancient atrocities a mysterious religion with abominable rites seemed to slumber amidst the superb scenery he had seen it at the approach of evening looking in the shade of its forest girdle like a plate of dull metal black and silver motionless by reason of its weight and that water clear and yet so deep that water deserted without a bark upon its surface that water august lifeless and sepulchral had left him a feeling of inexpressible sadness of mortal melancholy the hopelessness of great solitary passion earth and water alike swollen by the mute spasms of germs troublous in their fecundity ah those black and plunging banks and that black mournful lake prone at the bottom count prada began to laugh when pierre told him of these impressions yes yes said he it's true nemi isn't always gay in dull weather i have seen the lake looking like lead and even the full sunshine scarcely animates it for my part i know i should die of ennui if i had to live face to face with that bare water but it is admired by poets and romantic women those who adore great tragedies of passion then as he and pierre rose from table to go and take coffee on the terrace of the restaurant the conversation changed do you mean to attend prince buon giovanni's reception this evening the count inquired it will be a curious sight especially for a foreigner and i advise you not to miss it yes i have an invitation pierre replied a friend of mine monsieur narcisse Arbert, an attache at our embassy procured it for me and i am going with him that evening indeed there was to be a fete at the palazzo buon giovanni on the corso one of the few galas that take place in rome each winter people said that this one would surpass all others in magnificence for it was to be given in honour of the betrothal of little princess celia the prince her father after boxing her ears it was rumoured and narrowly escaping an attack of apoplexy as the result of a frightful fit of anger had all at once yielded to her quiet gentle stubbornness and consented to her marriage with lieutenant attilio the son of minister sacco and all the drawing-rooms of rome those of the white world quite as much as those of the black were thoroughly upset by the tidings count prada made merry over the affair ah you'll see a fine sight he exclaimed personally i'm delighted with it all for the sake of my good cousin attilio who was really a very nice and worthy fellow and nothing in the world would keep me from going to see my dear uncle sacco make his entry into the ancient salons of the buon giovanni it will be something extraordinary and superb he has at last become minister of agriculture you know my father who always takes things so seriously told me this morning that the affair so worried him he hadn't closed his eyes all night the count paused but almost immediately added i say it is half past two and you won't have a train before five o'clock do you know what you ought to do why drive back to rome with me in my carriage no no rejoined pierre i'm deeply obliged to you but i'm to dine with my friend narcisse this evening and i mustn't be late but you won't be late on the contrary 
we shall start at three and reach rome before five o'clock there can't be a more pleasant promenade when the light falls and come i promise you a splendid sunset he was so pressing that the young priest had to accept quite subjugated by so much amiability and good humour they spent another half hour very pleasantly in chatting about rome italy and france then for a moment they went up into frascati where the count wished to say a few words to a contractor and just as three o'clock was striking they started off seated side by side on the soft cushions and gently rocked by the motion of the victoria as the two horses broke into a light trot as prada had predicted that return to rome across the bare campagna under the vast limpid heavens at the close of such a mild autumn day proved most delightful first of all however the victoria had to descend the slopes of frascati between vineyards and olive trees the paved road snaked and was but little frequented they merely saw a few peasants in old felt hats a white mule and a cart drawn by a donkey for it is only upon sundays that the osterie or wine shops are filled and that artisans in easy circumstances come to eat a dish of kid at the surrounding bastides however at one turn of the road they passed a monumental fountain then a flock of sheep momentarily barred the way before defiling past and beyond the gentle undulations of the ruddy campagna rome appeared amidst the violet vapours of evening sinking by degrees as the carriage itself descended to a lower and lower level there came a moment when the city was a mere thin grey streak speckled whitely here and there by a few sunlit house fronts and then it seemed to plunge below the ground to be submerged by the swell of the far-spreading fields the victoria was now rolling over the plain leaving the alban hills behind whilst before it and on either hand came the expanse of meadows and stubbles and then it was that the count after leaning forward exclaimed just look ahead yonder there's our man of this morning santo bono in person what a strapping fellow he is and how fast he walks my horses can scarcely overtake him pierre in his turn leant forward and likewise perceived the priest of st mary in the fields looking tall and knotty fashioned as it were with a bill-hook robed in a long black cassock he showed like a vigorous splotch of ink amidst the bright sunshine streaming around him and he was walking on at such a fast stern regular pace that he suggested destiny on the march something which could not be well distinguished was hanging from his right arm when the carriage had at last overtaken him prada told the coachman to slacken speed and then entered into conversation good day abbe you are well i hope he asked very well signor conte i thank you and where are you going so bravely signor conte i am going to rome what to rome at this late hour oh i shall be there nearly as soon as yourself the distance doesn't frighten me and money's quickly earned by walking scarcely turning his head to reply stepping out beside the wheels santo bono did not miss a stride and prada diverted by the meeting whispered to pierre wait a bit he'll amuse us then he added aloud since you are going to rome abbe you had better get in here there's room for you end of section twenty one Section 22 of Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Rome by Emil Zola. Translated by Ernest Visitelli. Chapter 11, Part 2. Santo Bono required no pressing, but at once accepted the offer. Willingly, a thousand thanks, he said. It's still better to save one's shoe leather. Then he got in and installed himself on the bracket seat, declining with abrupt humility the place which Pierre politely offered him beside the Count. The young priest and the latter now saw that the object he was carrying was a little basket of fresh figs, nicely arranged and covered with leaves. The horses set off again at a faster trot, and the carriage rolled on and on over the superb flat plain. "'So you are going to Rome,' the Count resumed, in order to make Santo Bono talk. "'Yes,' the other replied. I am taking his eminence, Cardinal Bocanera, these few figs, the last of the season, a little present which I had promised him. He had placed the basket on his knees and was holding it between his big knotty hands as if it were something rare and fragile. Ah, some of the famous figs of your garden, said Prada. It's quite true, they are like honey. But why don't you rid yourself of them? You surely don't mean to keep them on your knees all the way to Rome. Give them to me, I'll put them in the hood. 
However, Santa Bona became quite agitated and vigorously declined the offer. No, no, a thousand thanks. They don't embarrass me in the least. They are very well here. And in this way I shall be sure that no accident will befall them. His passion for the fruit he grew quite amused Prada, who nudged Pierre and then inquired, Is the cardinal fond of your figs? Oh, his eminence condescends to adore them. In former years, when he spent the summer at the villa, he would never touch the figs from other trees. And so, you see, knowing his tastes, it costs me very little to gratify him. Whilst making this reply, Santo Bono had shot such a keen glance in the direction of Pierre that the Count felt it necessary to introduce them to one another. This he did, saying, As it happens, Monsieur l'Abbé Fromont is stopping at the Palazzo Bocconera. He has been there for three months or so. Yes, I'm aware of it, Santo Bono quietly replied. I found Monsieur l'Abbé with his eminence one day when I took some figs to the Palazzo. Those were less ripe, but these are perfect. So speaking, he gave the little basket a complacent glance, and seemed to press it yet more closely between his huge and hairy fingers. Then came a spell of silence, whilst on either hand the Campagna spread out as far as the eye could reach. All houses had long since disappeared. There was not a wall, not a tree, nothing but the undulating expanse whose sparse, short herbage was, with the approach of winter, beginning to turn green once more. A tower, a half-fallen ruin which came into sight on the left, rising in solitude into the limpid sky above the flat, boundless line of the horizon, suddenly assumed extraordinary importance. Then, on the right, the distant silhouettes of cattle and horses were seen in a large enclosure with wooden rails. Urged on by the goad, oxen, still yoked, were slowly coming back from ploughing, whilst a farmer, cantering beside the ploughed land on a little sorrel nag, gave a final look round for the night. Now and again the road became peopled. A birocino, an extremely light vehicle with two huge wheels and a small seat perched upon the springs, whisked by like a gust of wind. From time to time also the Victoria passed a carrotino, one of the low carts in which peasants, sheltered by a kind of bright-hued tent, bring the wine, vegetables and fruit of the castle lands to Rome. The shrill tinkling of horses' bells was heard afar off as the animals followed the well-known road of their own accord, their peasant drivers usually being sound asleep. Women with bare, black hair, scarlet neckerchiefs, and skirts caught up were seen going home in groups of three and four. And then the road again emptied, and the solitude became more and more complete, without a wayfarer or an animal appearing for miles and miles, whilst yonder at the far end of the lifeless sea, so grandiose and mournful in its monotony, the sun continued to descend from the infinite vault of heaven. "'And the Pope, Abbe, is he dead?' Prada suddenly inquired. Santa Bono did not even start. I trust, he replied in all simplicity, that his holiness still has many long years to live for the triumph of the church. So you had good news this morning when you called on your bishop, Cardinal Sanguinetti. This time the priest was unable to restrain a slight start. Had he been seen then? In his haste he had failed to notice the two men following the road behind him. However, he at once regained self-possession and replied, Oh, one can never tell exactly whether news is good or bad. It seems that His Holiness passed a somewhat painful night, but I devoutly hope that the next will be a better one. Then he seemed to meditate for a moment, and added, Moreover, if God should have deemed it time to call His Holiness to himself, he would not leave his flock without a shepherd. He would have already chosen and designated the sovereign pontiff of tomorrow. This superb answer increased Prada's gaiety. You are really extraordinary, Abbe, he said. So you think that popes are solely created by the grace of the divinity? The Pope of tomorrow is chosen up in heaven, eh, and simply waits. Well, I fancied that men had something to do with the matter, but perhaps you already know which cardinal it is that the divine favour has thus elected in advance. Then, like the unbeliever he was, he went on with his facile jests, which left the priest unruffled. In fact, the latter also ended by laughing when the Count, after alluding to the gambling passion which at each fresh conclave sets well nigh the whole population of Rome, betting for or against this or that candidate, told him that he might easily make his fortune if he were in the divine secret. Next the talk turned on the three white cassocks of different sizes which are always kept in readiness in a cupboard at the Vatican. Which of them would be required on this occasion? The short one, the long one, or the one of medium size? 
each time that the reigning pope falls somewhat seriously ill there is in this wise an extraordinary outburst of emotion a keen awakening of all ambitions and intrigues to such a point that not merely in the black world but throughout the city people have no other subject of curiosity conversation and occupation than that of discussing the relative claims of the cardinals and predicting which of them will be elected come come prada resumed since you know the truth i'm determined that you shall tell me will it be cardinal moretta santo bono in spite of his evident desire to remain dignified and disinterested like a good pious priest was gradually growing impassioned yielding to the hidden fire which consumed him and this interrogatory finished him off he could no longer restrain himself but replied moretta what an idea why he is sold to all europe well will it be cardinal bartolini oh you can't think that bartolini has used himself up in striving for everything and getting nothing will it be cardinal dozio then dozio dozio why if dozio were to win one might altogether despair of our holy church for no man can have a baser mind than he prada raised his hands as if he had exhausted the serious candidates in order to increase the priest's exasperation he maliciously refrained from naming cardinal sanguinetti who was certainly santo bono's nominee all at once however he pretended to make a good guess and gaily exclaimed ah i have it i know your man cardinal bocanera the blow struck santo bono full in the heart wounding him both in his rancour and his patriotic faith his terrible mouth was already opening and he was about to shout no no with all his strength but he managed to restrain the cry compelled as he was to silence by the present on his knees that little basket of figs which he pressed so convulsively with both hands and the effort which he was obliged to make left him quivering to such a point that he had to wait some time before he could reply in a calm voice his most reverend eminence cardinal bocanera is a saintly man well worthy of the throne and my only fear is that with his hatred of new italy he might bring us warfare prada however desired to enlarge the wound at all events said he you accept him and love him too much not to rejoice over his chances of success and i really think that we have arrived at the truth for everybody is convinced that the conclave's choice cannot fall elsewhere come come bocanera is a very tall man so it's the long white cassock which will be required the long cassock a long cassock growled santa bono despite himself that's all very well but then he stopped short and again overcoming his passion left his sentence unfinished pierre listening in silence marvelled at the man's self-restraint for he remembered the conversation which he had overheard at cardinal sanguinetti's those figs were evidently a mere pretext for gaining admission to the bocanera mansion where some friend abbe paparelli no doubt could alone supply certain positive information which was needed but how great was the command which that hot-blooded priest exercised over himself amidst the riotous impulses of his soul on either side of the road the campagna still and ever spread its expanse of verdure and prada who had become grave and dreamy gazed before him without seeing anything at last however he gave expression to his thoughts you know abbe what will be said if the pope should die this time that sudden illness those colics those refusals to make any information public mean nothing good yes yes poison just as for the others pierre gave a start of stupefaction the pope poisoned what poison again he exclaimed as he gazed at his companions with dilated eyes poison at the end of the nineteenth century as in the days of the borgias as on the stage in a romanticist melodrama to him the idea appeared both monstrous and ridiculous santo bono whose features had become motionless and impenetrable made no reply but prada nodded and the conversation was henceforth confined to him and the young priest why yes poison he replied the fear of it has remained very great in rome whenever a death seems inexplicable either by reason of its suddenness or the tragic circumstances which attend it the unanimous thought is poison and remark this in no city i believe are sudden deaths so frequent the causes i don't exactly know but some doctors put everything down to the fevers among the people however the one thought is poison poison with all its legends poison which kills like lightning and leaves no trace the famous recipe bequeathed from age to age through the emperors and the popes down to these present times of middle-class democracy 
as he spoke he ended by smiling for he was inclined to be somewhat sceptical on the point despite the covert terror with which he was inspired by racial and educational causes however he quoted instances the roman matrons had rid themselves of their husbands and lovers by employing the venom of red toads locusta in a more practical spirit sought poison in plants one of which probably aconite she was wont to boil then long afterwards came the age of the borgias and subsequently at naples la tofana sold a famous water doubtless some preparation of arsenic in phials decorated with a representation of saint nicholas of bari there were also extraordinary stories of pins a prick from which killed one like lightning of cups of wine poisoned by the infusion of rose petals of woodcocks cut in half with prepared knives which poisoned but one half of the bird so that he who partook of that half was killed i myself in my younger days continued prada had a friend whose bride fell dead in church during the marriage service through simply inhaling a bouquet of flowers and so isn't it possible that the famous recipe may really have been handed down and have remained known to a few adepts but chemistry has made too much progress pierre replied if mysterious poisons were believed in by the ancients and remained undetected in their time it was because there were no means of analysis but the drug of the borgias would now lead the simpleton who might employ it straight to the assizes such stories are mere nonsense and at the present day people scarcely tolerate them in newspaper serials and shockers perhaps so resumed the count with his uneasy smile you are right no doubt only go and tell that to your host for instance cardinal bocanera who last summer held in his arms an old and deeply loved friend monsignor gallo who died after a seizure of a couple of hours but apoplexy may kill in one or two hours and aneurysm only takes two minutes true but ask the cardinal what he thought of his friend's prolonged shudders the leaden hue which overcame his face the sinking of his eyes and the expression of terror which made him quite unrecognizable the cardinal is convinced that monsignor gallo was poisoned because he was his dearest confidant the counsellor to whom he always listened and whose wise advice was a guarantee of success pierre's bewilderment was increasing and irritated by the impassibility of santo bono he addressed him direct it's idiotic it's awful does your reverence also believe in these frightful stories but the priest of frascati gave no sign his thick passionate lips remained closed while his black glowing eyes never ceased to gaze at prada the latter moreover was quoting other instances there was the case of monsignor nazzarelli who had been found in bed shrunken and calcined like carbon and there was that of monsignor brando struck down in his sacerdotal vestments at st peter's itself in the very sacristy during vespers ah mon dieu sighed pierre you will tell me so much that i myself shall end by trembling and shan't dare to eat anything but boiled eggs as long as i stay in this terrible rome of yours for a moment this whimsical reply enlivened both the count and pierre but it was quite true that their conversation showed rome under a terrible aspect for it conjured up the eternal city of crime the city of poison and the knife where for more than two thousand years ever since the raising of the first bit of wall the lust of power the frantic hunger for possession and enjoyment had armed men's hands ensanguined the pavements and cast victims into the river and the ground assassinations and poisonings under the emperors poisonings and assassinations under the popes ever did the same torrent of abominations strew that tragic soil with death amidst the sovereign glory of the sun all the same said the count those who take precautions are perhaps not ill-advised it is said that more than one cardinal shudders and mistrusts people one whom i know will never eat anything that has not been bought and prepared by his own cook and as for the pope if he is anxious pierre again raised a cry of stupefaction what the pope himself the pope afraid of being poisoned well my dear abbe people commonly assert it there are certainly days when he considers himself more menaced than anybody else and are you not aware of the old roman view that a pope ought never to live till too great an age and that when he is so obstinate as not to die at the right time he ought to be assisted as soon as a pope begins to fall into second childhood and by reason of his senility becomes a source of embarrassment and possibly even danger to the church his right place is heaven moreover matters are managed in a discreet manner a slight cold becomes a decent pretext to prevent him from tarrying any longer on the throne of st peter prada then gave some curious details one prelate it was said wishing to dispel his holiness's fears had devised an elaborate precautionary system which among other things 
was to comprise a little padlocked vehicle in which the food destined for the frugal pontifical table was to be securely placed before leaving the kitchen so that it might not be tampered with on its way to the pope's apartments however this project had not yet been carried into effect after all the count concluded with a laugh every pope has to die some day especially when his death is needful for the welfare of the church isn't that so abbe santo bono whom he addressed had a moment previously lowered his eyes as if to contemplate the little basket of figs which he held on his lap with as much care as if it had been the blessed sacrament on being questioned in such a direct sharp fashion he could not do otherwise than look up however he did not depart from his prolonged silence but limited his answer to a slow nod and it is god alone and not poison who causes one to die is that not so abbe repeated prada it is said that those were the last words of poor monsignor gallo before he expired in the arms of his friend cardinal bocanera for the second time santo bono nodded without speaking and then silence fell all three sinking into a dreamy mood meantime without a pause the carriage rolled on across the immensity of the campagna the road straight as an arrow seemed to extend into the infinite as the sun descended towards the horizon the play of light and shade became more marked on the broad undulations of the ground which stretched away alternately of a pinky green and a violet grey till they reached the distant fringe of the sky at the roadside on either hand there were still and ever tall withered thistles and giant fennel with yellow umbels then after a time came a team of four oxen that had been kept ploughing until late and stood forth black and huge in the pale atmosphere and mournful solitude farther on some flocks of sheep whence the breeze wafted a tallowy odour set patches of brown amidst the herbage which once more was becoming verdant whilst at intervals a dog was heard to bark his voice the only distinct sound amidst the low quivering of that silent desert where the sovereign peacefulness of death seemed to reign but all at once a light melody arose and some larks flew up one of them soaring into the limpid golden heavens and ahead at the far extremity of the pure sky rome with her towers and domes grew larger and larger like a city of white marble springing from a mirage amidst the greenery of some enchanted garden Matteo prada called to his coachman pull up at the osteria romana and to his companions he added pray excuse me but i want to see if i can get some new laid eggs for my father he is so fond of them a few minutes afterwards the carriage stopped at the very edge of the road stood a primitive sort of inn bearing the proud and sonorous name of antica osteria romana it had now become a mere house of call for carters and chance sportsmen who ventured to drink a flagon of white wine whilst eating an omelette and a slice of ham occasionally on sundays some of the humble classes would walk over from rome and make merry there but the weekdays often went by without a soul entering the place such was its isolation amidst the bare campagna the count was already springing from the carriage i shall only be a minute said he as he turned away the osteria was a long low pile with a ground floor and one upper story the last being reached by an outdoor stairway built of large blocks of stone which had been scorched by hot suns the entire place indeed was corroded tinged with the hue of old gold on the ground floor one found a common room a cart house and a stable with adjoining sheds at one side near a cluster of parasol pines the only trees that could grow in that ungrateful soil there was an arbor of reeds where five or six rough wooden tables were set out and as a background to this sorry mournful nook of life there arose a fragment of an ancient aqueduct whose arches half fallen and opening onto space alone interrupted the flat line of the horizon all at once however the count retraced his steps and addressing santo bono exclaimed i say abbe you'll surely accept a glass of white wine i know that you are a bit of a vine grower and they have a little white wine here which you ought to make acquaintance with santo bono again required no pressing but quietly alighted oh i know it said he it's a wine from marino it's grown in a lighter soil than ours at frascati then as he would not relax his hold on his basket of figs but even now carried it along with him the count lost patience come you don't want that basket said he leave it in the carriage the priest gave no reply but walked ahead whilst pierre also made up his mind to descend from the carriage in order to see what a suburban osteria was like prada was known at this place and an old woman tall withered but looking quite queenly in her wretched garments had at once presented herself on the last occasion when the count had called she had managed to find half a dozen eggs 
this time she said she would go to sea but could promise nothing for the hens laid here and there all over the place and she could never tell what eggs there might be all right prada answered go and look and meantime we'll have a carafa of white wine the three men entered the common room which was already quite dark although the hot weather was now over one heard the buzzing of innumerable flies immediately one reached the threshold and a pungent odour of acidulous wine and rancid oil caught one at the throat as soon as their eyes became accustomed to the dimness they were able to distinguish the spacious blackened malodorous chamber whose only furniture consisted of some roughly made tables and benches it seemed to be quite empty so complete was the silence apart from the buzz of the flies however two men were seated there two wayfarers who remained mute and motionless before their untouched brimming glasses moreover on a low chair near the door in the little light which penetrated from without a thin sallow girl the daughter of the house sat idle trembling with fever her hands close pressed between her knees realizing that pierre felt uncomfortable there the count proposed that they should drink their wine outside we shall be better out of doors said he it's so very mild this evening accordingly whilst the mother looked for the eggs and the father mended a wheel in an adjacent shed the daughter was obliged to get up shivering to carry the flagon of wine and three glasses to the arbor where she placed them on one of the tables and having pocketed the price of the wine three pence in silence she went back to her seat with a sullen look as if annoyed at having been compelled to make such a long journey meanwhile the three men had sat down and prada gaily filled each of the glasses although pierre declared that he was quite unable to drink wine between his meals pooh pooh said the count you can always chink glasses with us and now abbe isn't this little wine droll come here's to the pope's better health since he's unwell santa borno at one gulp emptied his glass and clacked his tongue with gentle paternal care he had deposited his basket on the ground beside him and taking off his hat he drew a long breath the evening was really delightful a superb sky of a soft golden hue stretched over that endless sea of the campagna which was soon to fall asleep with sovereign quiescence and the light breeze which went by amidst the deep silence brought with it an exquisite odour of wild herbs and flowers how pleasant it is muttered pierre affected by the surrounding charm and what a desert for eternal rest for forgetfulness of all the world prada who had emptied the flagon by filling santa bono's glass a second time made no reply he was silently amusing himself with an occurrence which at first he was the only one to observe however with a merry expression of complicity he gave the young priest a wink and then they both watched the dramatic incidents of the affair some scraggy fowls were wandering around them searching the yellow turf for grasshoppers and one of these birds a little shiny black hen with an impudent manner had caught sight of the basket of figs and was boldly approaching it when she got near however she took fright and retreated somewhat with neck stiffened and head turned so as to cast suspicious glances at the basket with her round sparkling eye but at last covetousness gained the victory for she could see one of the figs between the leaves and so she slowly advanced lifting her feet very high at each step and all at once stretching out her neck she gave the fig a formidable peck which ripped it open and made the juice exude prada who felt as happy as a child was then able to give vent to the laughter which he had scarcely been able to restrain look out abbe he called mind your figs at that very moment santa borna was finishing his second glass of wine with his head thrown back and his eyes blissfully raised to heaven he gave a start looked round and on seeing the hen at once understood the position and then came a terrible outburst of anger with sweeping gestures and terrible invectives but the hen who was again pecking would not be denied she dug her beak into the fig and carried it off flapping her wings so quick and so comical that prada and pierre as well laughed till tears came into their eyes their merriment increasing at sight of the impotent fury of santa bono who for a moment pursued the thief threatening her with his fist ah said the count that's what comes of not leaving the basket in the carriage if i hadn't warned you the hen would have eaten all the figs the priest did not reply but growling out vague imprecations placed the basket on the table where he raised the leaves and artistically rearranged the fruit so as to fill up the void then the harm having been repaired as far as was possible he at last calmed down it was now time for them to resume their journey for the sun was sinking towards the horizon and night would soon fall thus the count ended by getting impatient well and those eggs he called then as the woman did not return he went to seek her he entered the stable and afterwards the cart-house 
but she was neither here nor there. Next he went towards the rear of the osteria in order to look in the sheds. But all at once an unexpected spectacle made him stop short. The little black hen was lying on the ground, dead, killed as by lightning. She showed no sign of hurt. There was nothing but a little streamlet of violet blood still trickling from her beak. Prada was at first merely astonished. He stooped and touched the hen. She was still warm and soft like a rag. Doubtless some apoplectic stroke had killed her. But immediately afterwards he became fearfully pale. The truth appeared to him and turned him as cold as ice. In a moment he conjured up everything. Leo XIII attacked by illness, Santo Bono hurrying to Cardinal Sanguinetti for tidings, and then starting for Rome to present a basket of figs to Cardinal Bocanera. And Prada also remembered the conversation in the carriage, the possibility of the Pope's demise, the candidates for the tiara, the legendary stories of poison which still fostered terror in and around the Vatican. And he once more saw the priest, with his little basket on his knees, lavishing paternal attention on it, and he saw the little black hen pecking at the fruit and fleeing with a fig on her beak. And now that little black hen lay there, suddenly struck down, dead. His conviction was immediate and absolute, but he did not have time to decide what course he should take, for a voice behind him exclaimed, Why, it's the little hen! What's the matter with her? The voice was that of Pierre, who, letting Santo Bono climb into the carriage alone, had in his turn come round to the rear of the house in order to obtain a better view of the ruined aqueduct among the parasol pines. Prada, who shuddered as if he himself were the culprit, answered him with a lie, a lie which he did not premeditate, but to which he was impelled by a sort of instinct. "'But she's dead,' he said. "'Just fancy, there was a fight. At the moment when I got here, that other hen, which you see yonder, sprang on this one to get the fig.' which she was still holding, and with the thrust of the beak split her head open. The blood's flowing, as you can see yourself. Why did he say these things? He himself was astonished at them while he went on inventing them. Was it then that he wished to remain master of the situation, keep the abominable secret entirely to himself, in order that he might afterwards act in accordance with his own desires? Certainly his feelings partook of shame and embarrassment in presence of that foreigner whilst his personal inclination for violence set some admiration amidst the revolt of his conscience, and a covert desire arose within him to examine the matter from the standpoint of his interests before he came to a decision. But on the other hand he claimed to be a man of integrity, and would assuredly not allow people to be poisoned. Pierre, who was compassionately inclined towards all creation, looked at the hen with the emotion which he always felt at the sudden severance of life. However, he at once accepted Prada's story. Ah, those fowls, said he, they treat one another with an idiotic ferocity which even men can scarcely equal. I kept fowls at home at one time, and one of the hens no sooner hurt her leg than all the others, on seeing the blood oozing, would flock round and peck at the limb till they stripped it to the bone. Prada, however, did not listen, but at once went off, and it so happened that the woman was on her side looking for him in order to hand him four eggs which, after a deal of searching, she had discovered in odd corners about the house. The Count made haste to pay for them, and called to Pierre, who was lingering behind. We must look sharp. We shan't reach Rome now until it is quite dark. They found Santo Bono quietly waiting in the carriage, where he had again installed himself on the bracket with his spine resting against the box seat, and his long legs drawn back under him, and he again had the little basket of figs on his knees, and clasped it with his big knotty hands as though it was something fragile and rare, which the slightest jolting might damage. His cassock showed like a huge blot, and in his coarse ashen face, that of a peasant yet near to the wild soil and but slightly polished by a few years of theological studies, his eyes alone seemed to live, glowing with the dark flame of a devouring passion. On seeing him seated there in such composure, Prada could not restrain a slight shudder. Then, as soon as the Victoria was again rolling along the road, he exclaimed, "'Well, I be, that glass of wine will guarantee us against the malaria.' The Pope would soon be cured if he could imitate our example. Santo Bono's only reply was a growl. He was in no mood for conversation, but wrapped himself in perfect silence, as in the night which was slowly falling. And Prada, in his turn, ceased to speak, and with his eyes still fixed upon the other, reflected on the course that he should follow. The road turned, and then the carriage rolled on and on over another interminable straight highway with white paving, whose brilliancy made the road look like a ribbon of snow stretching across the Campagna, where delicate shadows were slowly falling. 
gloom gathered in the hollows of the broad undulations whence a tide of violet hue seemed to spread over the short herbage until all mingled and the expanse became an indistinct swell of neutral hue from one to the other horizon and the solitude was now yet more complete a last indolent cart had gone by and a last tinkling of horses bells had subsided in the distance there was no longer a passer-by no longer a beast of the fields to be seen colour and sound died away all forms of life sank into slumber into the serene stillness of nihility some fragments of an aqueduct were still to be seen at intervals on the right hand where they looked like portions of gigantic millipedes severed by the scythe of time next on the left came another tower whose dark and ruined pile barred the sky as with a huge black stake and then the remains of another aqueduct spanned the road assuming yet greater dimensions against the sunset glow ah that unique hour the hour of twilight in the campagna when all is blotted out and simplified the hour of bare immensity of the infinite in its simplest expression there is nothing nothing all around you but the flat line of the horizon with the one splotch of an isolated tower and yet that nothing is instinct with sovereign majesty however on the left towards the sea the sun was setting descending in the limpid sky like a globe of fire of blinding redness it slowly plunged beneath the horizon and the only sign of cloud was some fiery vapour as if indeed the distant sea had seethed at contact with that royal and flaming visit and directly the sun had disappeared the heavens above it purpled and became a lake of blood whilst the campagna turned to grey at the far end of the fading plain there was only left that purple lake whose brazier slowly died out behind the black arches of the aqueduct, while in the opposite direction the scattered arches remained bright and rosy against a pewter-like sky. Then the fiery vapour was dissipated, and the sunset ended by fading away. One by one the stars came out in the pacified vault, now of an ashen blue, while the lights of Rome, still far away on the verge of the horizon, scintillated like the lamps of lighthouses and prada amidst the dreamy silence of his companions and the infinite melancholy of the evening and the inexpressible distress which even he experienced continued to ask himself what course he should adopt again and again he mentally repeated that he could not allow people to be poisoned the figs were certainly intended for cardinal bocanera and on the whole it mattered little to him whether there were a cardinal the more or the fewer in the world moreover it had always seemed to him best to let destiny follow its course and infidel that he was he saw no harm in one priest devouring another again it might be dangerous for him to intervene in that abominable affair to mix himself up in the base fathomless intrigues of the black world but on the other hand the cardinal was not the only person who lived in the bocanera mansion and might not the figs go to others might they not be eaten by people to whom no harm was intended this idea of a treacherous chance haunted him and in spite of every effort the figures of benedetta and dario rose up before him returned and imposed themselves on him though he again and again sought to banish them from his mind what if benedetta what if dario should partake of that fruit for benedetta he felt no fear for he knew that she and her aunt ate their meals by themselves and that their cuisine and the cardinals had nothing in common but dario sat at his uncle's table every day and for a moment prada pictured the young prince suddenly seized with a spasm then falling like poor monsignor gallo into the cardinal's arms with livid face and receding eyes and dying within two hours but no no that would be frightful he could not suffer such an abomination and thereupon he made up his mind he would wait till the night had completely gathered round and would then simply take the basket from santa bono's lap and fling it into some dark hollow without saying a word the priest would understand him the other one the young frenchman would perhaps not even notice the incident besides that mattered little for he would not even attempt to explain his action and he felt quite calm again when the idea occurred to him to throw the basket away while the carriage passed through the porta furba a couple of miles or so before reaching rome that would suit him exactly in the darkness of the gateway nothing whatever would be seen we stopped too long at that osteria he suddenly exclaimed aloud turning towards pierre we shan't reach rome much before six o'clock still you will have time to dress and join your friend and then without awaiting the young man's reply he said to santo bono your figs will arrive very late abbe oh answered the priest his eminence receives until eight o'clock and besides the figs are not for this evening people don't eat figs in the evening they will be for tomorrow morning and thereupon he again relapsed into silence for tomorrow morning yes yes no doubt repeated prada 
and the cardinal will be able to thoroughly regale himself if nobody helps him to eat the fruit thereupon pierre without pausing to reflect exclaimed he will no doubt eat it by himself for his nephew prince dario must have started today for naples on a little convalescence trip to rid himself of the effects of the accident which laid him up during the last month then having got so far the young priest remembered to whom he was speaking and abruptly stopped short the count noticed his embarrassment oh speak on my dear monsieur Fromont," said he you don't offend me it's an old affair now so that young man has left you say yes unless he has postponed his departure however i don't expect to find him at the palazzo when i get there for a moment the only sound was that of the continuous rumble of the wheels prada again felt worried a prey to the discomfort of uncertainty why should he mix himself up in the affair if dario were really absent all the ideas which came to him tired his brain and he ended by thinking aloud if he has gone away it must be for propriety's sake so as to avoid attending the buon giovanni reception for the congregation of the council met this morning to give its decision in the suit which the countess has brought against me yes i shall know by and by whether our marriage is to be dissolved it was in a somewhat hoarse voice that he spoke these words and one could realize that the old wound was again bleeding within him although lisbeth had borne him a son the charge levelled against him in his wife's petition for divorce still filled him with blind fury each time that he thought of it and all at once he shuddered violently as if an icy blast had darted through his frame then turning the conversation he added it's not at all warm this evening this is the dangerous hour of the roman climate the twilight hour when it's easy to catch a terrible fever if one isn't prudent here pull the rug over your legs wrap it round you as carefully as you can then as they drew near to the porta furba silence again fell more profound like the slumber which was invincibly spreading over the campagna now steeped in night and at last in the bright starlight appeared the gate an arch of the aqua felice under which the road passed from a distance this fragment seemed to bar the way with its mass of ancient half-fallen walls but afterwards the gigantic arch where all was black opened like a gaping porch and the carriage passed under it in darkness whilst the wheels rumbled with increased sonority when the victoria emerged on the other side santo bono still had the little basket of figs upon his knees and prada looked at it quite overcome asking himself what sudden paralysis of the hands had prevented him from seizing it and throwing it into the darkness such had still been his intention but a few seconds before they passed under the arch he had even given the basket a final glance in order that he might the better realize what movements he should make what had taken place within him then at present he was yielding to increasing irresolution henceforth incapable of decisive action feeling a need of delay in order that he might before everything else fully satisfy himself as to what was likely to happen and as dario had doubtless gone away and the figs would certainly not be eaten until the following morning what reason was there for him to hurry he would know that evening if the congregation of the council had annulled his marriage and he would know how far the so-called justice of god was venal and mendacious certainly he would suffer nobody to be poisoned not even cardinal bocanera though the latter's life was of little account to him personally but had not that little basket ever since leaving frascati been like destiny on the march and was it not enjoyment the enjoyment of omnipotence to be able to say to himself that he was the master who could stay that basket's course or allow it to go onward and accomplish its deadly purpose moreover he yielded to the dimmest of mental struggles ceasing to reason unable to raise his hand and yet convinced that he would drop a warning note into the letter-box at the palazzo before he went to bed though at the same time he felt happy in the thought that if his interest directed otherwise he would not do so and the remainder of the journey was accomplished in silent weariness amidst the shiver of evening which seemed to have chilled all three men in vain did the count endeavour to escape from the battle of his thoughts by reverting to the buon giovanni reception and giving particulars of the splendours which would be witnessed at it his words fell sparsely in an embarrassed and absent-minded way then he sought to inspirit pierre by speaking to him of cardinal sanguinetti's amiable manner and fair words but although the young priest was returning home well pleased with his journey in the idea that with a little help he might yet triumph he scarcely answered the count so rapt was he in his reverie and santo bono on his side neither spoke nor moved black like the knight himself he seemed to have vanished however the lights of rome were increasing in number and houses again appeared on either hand at first at long intervals and then in close succession there were suburban houses 
and there were yet more fields of reeds, quickset hedges, olive trees overtopping long walls, and big gateways with vase surmounted pillars. But at last came the city with its rows of small grey houses, its petty shops and its dingy taverns, whence at times came shouts and rumours of battle. Prada insisted on setting his companions down in the Via Giulia, at fifty paces from the palazzo. It doesn't inconvenience me at all, said he to Pierre. Besides, with the little time you have before you, it would never do for you to go on foot. The Via Giulia was already steeped in slumber, and wore a melancholy aspect of abandonment in the dreary light of the gas lamps standing on either hand. And as soon as Santo Bono had alighted from the carriage, he took himself off without waiting for Pierre, who, moreover, always went in by the little door at the side lane. "'Good-bye, Abbey," exclaimed Prada. "'Good-bye, Count. A thousand thanks,' was Santo Bono's response. Then the two others stood watching him as he went towards the Bocanera mansion, whose old, monumental entrance, full of gloom, was still wide open. For a moment they saw his tall, rugged figure erect against that gloom. Then in he plunged, he and his little basket, bearing destiny. End of section 22「Section 23 of Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Rome by Emil Zola, translated by Ernest Visitelli. Chapter 12, Part 1. It was ten o'clock when Pierre and Narcisse, after dining at the Café di Roma, where they had long lingered chatting, at last walked down the Corso towards the Palazzo Buon Giovanni. They had the greatest difficulty to reach its entrance, for carriages were coming up in serried files, and the inquisitive crowd of onlookers, who pressed even into the roadway, in spite of the injunctions of the police, was growing so compact that even the horses could no longer approach. The ten lofty windows on the first floor of the long monumental façade shone with an intense white radiance, the radiance of electric lamps, which illumined the street like sunshine, spreading over the equipages a ground in that human sea, whose billows of eager, excited faces rolled to and fro amidst an extraordinary tumult. And in all this there was not merely the usual curiosity to see uniforms go by, and ladies in rich attire alight from their carriages, for Pierre soon gathered from what he heard that the crowd had come to witness the arrival of the king and queen, who had promised to appear at the ball given by Prince Buon Giovanni in celebration of the betrothal of his daughter Celia to Lieutenant Attilio Sacco, the son of one of his majesty's ministers. Moreover, people were enraptured with this marriage, the happy ending of a love story which had impassioned the whole city. To begin with, love at first sight, with the suddenness of a lightning flash, and then stubborn fidelity triumphing over all obstacles, amidst romantic circumstances whose story sped from lip to lip, moistening every eye and stirring every heart. It was this story that Narcisse had related a dessert to Pierre, who already knew some portion of it. People asserted that if the prince had ended by yielding after a final terrible scene, it was only from fear of seeing Celia elope from the palace with her lover. She did not threaten to do so, but, amidst her virginal calmness, there was so much contempt for everything foreign to her love that her father felt her to be capable of acting with the greatest folly in all ingenuousness. Only indifference was manifested by the prince's wife, a phlegmatic and still beautiful Englishwoman, who considered that she had done quite enough for the household by bringing her husband a dowry of five millions and bearing him five children. The prince, anxious and weak despite his violence, in which one found a trace of the old Roman blood, already spoilt by mixture with that of a foreign race, was nowadays ever influenced in his actions by the fear that his house and fortune, which hitherto had remained intact amidst the accumulated ruins of the Patriziato, might suddenly collapse. And in finally yielding to Celia, he must have been guided by the idea of rallying to the new regime through his daughter, so as to have one foot firmly set at the Quirinal, without withdrawing the other from the Vatican. It was galling, no doubt. His pride must have bled at the idea of allying his name with that of such low folks as the Sarkos. But then Sarko was a minister, and had sped so quickly from success to success that it seemed likely he would rise yet higher, and after the portfolio of agriculture, secure that of finances which he had long coveted. 
and an alliance with Sacco meant the certain favour of the king, an assured retreat in that direction should the papacy some day collapse. Then, too, the prince had made inquiries respecting the son, and was somewhat disarmed by the good looks, bravery, and rectitude of young Attilio, who represented the future, and possibly the glorious Italy of tomorrow. He was a soldier, and could be helped forward to the highest rank, and people spitefully added that the last reason which had influenced the prince, who was very avaricious, and greatly worried by the thought that his fortune must be divided among his five children, was that an opportunity presented itself for him to bestow a ridiculously small dowry on Celia. However, having consented to the marriage, he resolved to give a splendid fete, such as was now seldom witnessed in Rome, throwing his doors open to all the rival sections of society, inviting the sovereigns and setting the palazzo ablaze as in the grand days of old in doing this he would necessarily have to expend some of the money to which he clung but a boastful spirit incited him to show the world that he at any rate had not been vanquished by the financial crisis and that the buon giovannis had nothing to hide and nothing to blush for to tell the truth some people asserted that this bravado had not originated with himself but had been instilled into him without his knowledge by the quiet and innocent celia who wished to exhibit her happiness to all applauding rome dear me said narcisse whom the throng prevented from advancing we shall never get in why they seem to have invited the whole city and then as pierre seemed surprised to see a prelate drive up in his carriage the attache added oh you will elbow more than one of them upstairs the cardinals won't like to come on account of the presence of the king and queen but the prelates are sure to be here this you know is a neutral drawing-room where the black and the white worlds can fraternize and then too there are so few fetes that people rush on them he went on to explain that there were two grand balls at court every winter but that it was only under exceptional circumstances that the patriziato gave similar galas two or three of the black salons were opened once in a way towards the close of the carnival but little dances among intimates replaced the pompous entertainments of former times some princesses moreover merely had their day and as for the few white salons that existed these likewise retained the same character of intimacy more or less mixed for no lady had yet become the undisputed queen of the new society well here we are at last resumed narcisse as they eventually climbed the stairs let us keep together pierre somewhat anxiously replied my only acquaintance is with the fiancée and i want you to introduce me however a considerable effort was needed even to climb the monumental staircase so great was the crush of arriving guests never in the old days of wax candles and oil lamps had this staircase offered such a blaze of light electric lamps burning in clusters in superb bronze candelabra on the landings steeped everything in a white radiance the cold stucco of the walls was hidden by a series of lofty tapestries depicting the story of cupid and psyche marvels which had remained in the family since the days of the renaissance and a thick carpet covered the worn marble steps whilst clumps of evergreens and tall spreading palms decorated every corner an affluence of new blood warmed the antique mansion that evening there was a resurrection of life so to say as the women surged up the staircase smiling and perfumed bare-shouldered and sparkling with diamonds at the entrance of the first reception room pierre at once perceived prince and princess buongiovanni standing side by side and receiving their guests the prince a tall slim man with fair complexion and hair turning grey had the pale northern eyes of his american mother in an energetic face such as became a former captain of the popes the princess with small delicate and rounded features looked barely thirty though she had really passed her fortieth year and still pretty displaying a smiling serenity which nothing could disconcert she purely and simply basked in self-adoration her gown was of pink satin and a marvellous parure of large rubies set flamelets about her dainty neck and in her fine fair hair of her five children her son the eldest was travelling and three of the girls mere children were still at school so that only celia was present celia in a modest gown of white muslin fair like her mother quite bewitching with her large innocent eyes and her candid lips and retaining to the very end of her love story the semblance of a closed lily of impenetrable virginal mysteriousness the sacos had but just arrived and attilio in his simple lieutenant's uniform had remained near his betrothed so naively and openly delighted with his great happiness that his handsome face with its caressing mouth and brave eyes was quite resplendent with youth and strength 
standing there near one another in the triumph of their passion they appeared like life's very joy and health like the personification of hope in the morrow's promises and the entering guests who saw them could not refrain from smiling and feeling moved momentarily forgetting their loquacious and malicious curiosity to give their hearts to those chosen ones of love who looked so handsome and so enraptured narcisse stepped forward in order to present pierre but celia anticipated him going to meet the young priest she led him to her father and mother saying monsieur l'abbé pierre Fromont, a friend of my dear benedetta ceremonious salutations followed then the young girl whose graciousness greatly touched pierre said to him benedetta is coming with her aunt and dario she must be very happy this evening and you will also see how beautiful she will be pierre and narcisse next began to congratulate her but they could not remain there the throng was ever jostling them and the prince and princess quite lost in the crush had barely time to answer the many salutations with amiable continuous nods and celia after conducting the two friends to attilio was obliged to return to her parents so as to take her place beside them as the little queen of the fete narcisse was already slightly acquainted with attilio and so fresh congratulations ensued then the two friends manoeuvred to find a spot where they might momentarily tarry and contemplate the spectacle which this first salon presented it was a vast hall hung with green velvet broidered with golden flowers and contained a very remarkable collection of weapons and armour breastplates battle-axes and swords almost all of which had belonged to the buon giovannis of the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries and amidst those stern implements of war there was a lovely sedan chair of the last century gilded and decorated with delicate paintings it was in this chair that the prince's great-grandmother the celebrated bettina whose beauty was historical had usually been carried to mass on the walls moreover there were numerous historical paintings battles peace congresses and royal receptions in which the buon giovannis had taken part without counting the many family portraits tall and proud figures of sea captains commanders in the field great dignitaries of the church prelates and cardinals amongst whom in the place of honour appeared the family pope the white-robed buon giovanni whose accession to the pontifical throne had enriched a long line of descendants and it was among those armours near that coquettish sedan and below those antique portraits that the sacos husband and wife had in their turn just halted at a few steps from the master and mistress of the house in order to secure their share of congratulations and bows look over there narcisse whispered to pierre those are the sacos in front of us that dark little fellow and the lady in mauve silk pierre promptly recognized the bright face and pleasant smile of stefana whom he had already met at old orlando's but he was more interested in her husband a dark dry man with big eyes sallow complexion prominent chin and vulturine nose like some gay neapolitan pulcinello he was dancing shouting and displaying such infectious good humour that it spread to all around him he possessed a wonderful gift of speech with a voice that was unrivalled as an instrument of fascination and conquest and on seeing how easily he ingratiated himself with the people in that drawing-room one could understand his lightning-like successes in the political world he had manoeuvred with rare skill in the matter of his son's marriage affecting such exaggerated delicacy of feeling as to set himself against the lovers and declare that he would never consent to their union as he had no desire to be accused of stealing a dowry and a title as a matter of fact he had only yielded after the buon giovannis had given their consent and even then he had desired to take the opinion of old orlando whose lofty integrity was proverbial however he knew right well that he would secure the old hero's approval in this particular affair for orlando made no secret of his opinion that the buon giovannis ought to be glad to admit his grand nephew into their family as that handsome young fellow with brave and healthy heart would help to regenerate their impoverished blood and throughout the whole affair sacco had shrewdly availed himself of orlando's famous name for ever talking of the relationship between them and displaying filial veneration for this glorious founder of the country as if indeed he had no suspicion that the latter despised and execrated him and mourned his accession to power in the conviction that he would lead italy to shame and ruin ah resumed narcisse addressing pierre he's one of those supple practical men who care nothing for a smack in the face it seems that unscrupulous individuals like himself become necessary when states get into trouble and have to pass through political financial and moral crises 
it is said that sacco with his imperturbable assurance and ingenious and resourceful mind has quite won the king's favour just look at him why with that crowd of courtiers round him one might think him the master of this palace and indeed the guests after passing the prince and princess with a bow at once congregated around sacco for he represented power emoluments pensions and crosses and if folks still smiled at seeing his dark turbulent and scraggy figure amidst that framework of family portraits which proclaimed the mighty ancestry of the buon giovannis they none the less worshipped him as the personification of the new power the democratic force which was confusedly rising even from the old roman soil where the patriziato lay in ruins what a crowd muttered pierre who are all these people oh replied narcisse it is a regular mixture these people belong neither to the black nor the white world they form a grey world as it were the evolution was certain a man like cardinal bocanera may retain an uncompromising attitude but a whole city a nation can't the pope alone will always say no and remain immutable but everything around him progresses and undergoes transformation so that in spite of all resistance rome will become italian in a few years time even now whenever a prince has two sons only one of them remains on the side of the vatican the other goes over to the quirinal people must live you see and the great families threatened with annihilation have not sufficient heroism to carry obstinacy to the point of suicide and i have already told you that we are here on neutral ground for prince buon giovanni was one of the first to realize the necessity for conciliation he feels that his fortune is perishing he does not dare to risk it either in industry or in speculation and already sees it portioned out among his five children by whose descendants it will be yet further divided and this is why he prudently makes advances to the king without however breaking with the pope in this salon therefore you see a perfect picture of the debacle the confusion which reigns in the prince's ideas and opinions narcisse paused and then began to name some of the persons who were coming in there's a general said he who has become very popular since his last campaign in africa there will be a great many military men here this evening for all attilio's superiors have been invited so as to give the young man an entourage of glory ah and there's the german ambassador i fancy that nearly all the corps diplomatique will come on account of their majesty's presence but by way of contrast just look at that stout fellow yonder he's a very influential deputy a parvenu of the new middle class thirty years ago he was merely one of prince albertini's farmers one of those mercanti di campagna who go about the environs of rome in stout boots and a soft felt hat and now look at that prelate coming in oh i know him pierre interrupted he's monsignor fornaro exactly monsignor fornaro a personage of some importance you told me i remember that he is the reporter of the congregation in that affair of your book a most delightful man did you see how he bowed to the princess and what a noble and graceful bearing he has in his little mantle of violet silk then narcisse went on enumerating the princes and princesses the dukes and duchesses the politicians and functionaries the diplomatists and ministers and the officers and well-to-do middle-class people who of themselves made up a most wonderful medley of guests to say nothing of the representatives of the various foreign colonies english people americans germans spaniards and russians in a word all ancient europe and both americas and afterwards the young man reverted to the saccos to the little signora sacco in particular in order to tell pierre of the heroic efforts which she had made to open a salon for the purpose of assisting her husband's ambition gentle and modest as she seemed she was also very shrewd endowed with genuine qualities piedmontese patience and strength of resistance orderly habits and thriftiness and thus it was she who re-established the equilibrium in household affairs which her husband by his exuberance so often disturbed he was indeed greatly indebted to her though nobody suspected it at the same time however she had so far failed in her attempts to establish a white salon which should take the lead in influencing opinion only the people of her own set visited her not a single prince ever came and her monday dances were the same as in a score of other middle-class homes having no brilliancy and no importance in fact the real white salon which should guide men and things and sway all rome was still in dreamland just notice her keen smile as she examines everything here resumed narcisse she's teaching herself and forming plans i'm sure of it now that she is about to be connected with a princely family she probably hopes to receive some of the best society 
large as was the room the crowd in it had by this time grown so dense that the two friends were pressed back to a wall and felt almost stifled the attache therefore decided to lead the priest elsewhere and as they walked along he gave him some particulars concerning the palace which was one of the most sumptuous in rome and renowned for the magnificence of its reception rooms dancing took place in the picture gallery a superb apartment more than sixty feet long with eight windows overlooking the corso while the buffet was installed in the hall of the antiques a marble hall which among other precious things contained a statue of venus rivalling the one at the capitol then there was a suite of marvellous salons still resplendent with ancient luxury hung with the rarest stuffs and retaining some unique specimens of old-time furniture on which covetous antiquaries kept their eyes fixed whilst waiting and hoping for the inevitable future ruin and one of these apartments the little saloon of the mirrors was particularly famous of circular shape and louis quinze style it was surrounded by mirrors in rococo frames extremely rich and most exquisitely carved you will see all that by and by continued narcisse at present we had better go in here if you want to breathe a little it is here that the armchairs from the adjacent gallery have been brought for the accommodation of the ladies who desire to sit down and be seen and admired the apartment they entered was a spacious one draped with the most superb genoese velvet that antique jardiniere velvet with pale satin ground and flowers once of dazzling brightness whose greens and blues and reds had now become exquisitely soft with the subdued faded tones of old floral love tokens on the pier tables and in the cabinets all around were some of the most precious curios in the palace ivory caskets gilt and painted wood carvings pieces of antique plate briefly a collection of marvels and several ladies fleeing the crush had already taken refuge on the numerous seats clustering in little groups and laughing and chatting with the few gentlemen who had discovered this retreat of grace and galanterie in the bright glow of the lamps nothing could be more delightful than the sight of all those bare sheeny shoulders and those supple necks above whose napes were coiled tresses of fair or raven hair bare arms emerged like living flowers of flesh from amidst the mingling lace and silk of soft-hued bodices the fans played slowly as if to heighten the fires of the precious stones and at each beat wafted around an odore di femina blended with a predominating perfume of violets hallo exclaimed narcisse there's our good friend monsignor nani bowing to the austrian ambassadress as soon as nani perceived the young priest and his companion he came towards them and the trio then withdrew into the embrasure of a window in order that they might chat for a moment at their ease the prelate was smiling like one enchanted with the beauty of the fete but at the same time he retained all the serenity of innocence as if he had not even noticed the exhibition of bare shoulders by which he was surrounded ah my dear son he said to pierre i am very pleased to see you well and what do you think of our rome when she makes up her mind to give fetes why it is superb monseigneur then in an emotional manner nani spoke of celia's lofty piety and in order to give the vatican the credit of this sumptuous gala affected to regard the prince and princess as staunch adherents of the church as if he were altogether unaware that the king and queen were presently coming and afterwards he abruptly exclaimed i have been thinking of you all day my dear son yes i heard that you had gone to see his eminence cardinal sanguinetti well and how did he receive you oh in a most paternal manner pierre replied at first he made me understand the embarrassment in which he was placed by his position as protector of lourdes but just as i was going off he showed himself charming and promised me his help with a delicacy which deeply touched me did he indeed my dear son but it doesn't surprise me his eminence is so good-hearted and i must add monseigneur that i came back with a light and hopeful heart it now seems to me as if my suit were half gained naturally i understand it replied nani who was still smiling with that keen intelligent smile of his sharpened by a touch of almost imperceptible irony and after a short pause he added in a very simple way the misfortune is that on the day before yesterday your book was condemned by the congregation of the index which was convoked by its secretary expressly for that purpose and the judgment will be laid before his holiness for him to sign it on the day after tomorrow pierre looked at the prelate in bewilderment had the old mansion fallen on his head he would not have felt more overcome what was it all over his journey to rome the experiment he had come to attempt there 
had resulted in that defeat of which he was thus suddenly apprised amidst that betrothal fate and he had not even been able to defend himself he had sacrificed his time without finding any one to whom he might speak before whom he might plead his cause anger was rising within him and he could not prevent himself from muttering bitterly ah oh, how i have been duped and that cardinal who said to me only this morning if god be with you he will save you in spite of everything yes yes i now understand him he was juggling with words he only desired a disaster in order that submission might lead me to heaven submit indeed ah i cannot i cannot yet my heart is too full of indignation and grief nani examined and studied him with curiosity but my dear son he said nothing is final so long as the holy father has not signed the judgment you have all tomorrow and even the morning of the day after before you a miracle is always possible then lowering his voice and drawing pierre on one side whilst narcisse in an aesthetical spirit examined the ladies he added listen i have a communication to make to you in great secrecy come and join me in the little saloon of the mirrors by and by during the cotillon we shall be able to talk there at our ease pierre nodded and thereupon the prelate discreetly withdrew and disappeared in the crowd however the young man's ears were buzzing he could no longer hope what indeed could he accomplish in one day since he had lost three months without even being able to secure an audience with the pope and his bewilderment increased as he suddenly heard narcisse speaking to him of art it's astonishing how the feminine figure has deteriorated in these dreadful democratic days it's all fat and horribly common not one of those women yonder shows the florentine contour with small bosom and slender elegant neck ah that one yonder isn't so bad perhaps the fair one with her hair coiled up whom monsignor fornaro has just approached for a few minutes indeed monsignor fornaro had been fluttering from beauty to beauty with an amiable air of conquest he looked superb that evening with his lofty decorative figure blooming cheeks and victorious affability no unpleasant scandal was associated with his name he was simply regarded as a prelate of gallant ways who took pleasure in the society of ladies and he paused and chatted and leant over their bare shoulders with laughing eyes and humoured lips as if experiencing a sort of devout rapture however on perceiving narcisse whom he occasionally met he at once came forward and the attache had to bow to him you have been in good health i hope monseigneur since i had the honour of seeing you at the embassy oh yes i am very well very well indeed what a delightful fate is it not pierre also had bowed this was the man whose report had brought about the condemnation of his book and it was with resentment that he recalled his caressing air and charming greeting instinct with such lying promise however the prelate who was very shrewd must have guessed that the young priest was already acquainted with the decision of the congregation and have thought it more dignified to abstain from open recognition for on his side he merely nodded and smiled at him what a number of people he went on and how many charming persons there are it will soon be impossible for one to move in this room all the seats in fact were now occupied by ladies and what with the strong perfume of violets and the exhalations of warm necks and shoulders the atmosphere was becoming most oppressive the fans flapped more briskly and clear laughter rang out amidst a growing hubbub of conversation in which the same words constantly recurred some news doubtless had just arrived some rumour was being whispered from group to group throwing them all into feverish excitement as it happened monsignor fornaro who was always well informed desired to be the proclaimer of this news which nobody as yet had ventured to announce aloud do you know what is exciting them all he inquired is it the holy father's illness asked pierre in his anxiety is he worse this evening the prelate looked at him in astonishment and then somewhat impatiently replied oh no 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 his holiness is much better thank heaven a person belonging to the vatican was telling me just now that he was able to get up this afternoon and receive his intimates as usual all the same people have been alarmed interrupted narcisse i must confess that we did not feel easy at the embassy for a conclave at the present time would be a great worry for france she would exercise no influence at it it is a great mistake on the part of our republican government to treat the holy see as of no importance however can one ever tell whether the pope is ill or not i know for a certainty that he was nearly carried off last winter when nobody breathed a word about any illness whereas on the last occasion when the newspapers killed him and talked about a dreadful attack of bronchitis 
i myself saw him quite strong and in the best of spirits his reported illnesses are mere matters of policy i fancy with a hasty gesture however monsignor fornaro brushed this importunate subject aside no no said he people are tranquillized and no longer talk of it what excites all those ladies is that the congregation of the council today voted the dissolution of the prada marriage by a great majority again did pierre feel moved however not having had time to see any members of the bocanera family on his return from frascati he feared that the news might be false and said so thereupon the prelate gave his word of honour that things were as he stated the news is certain he declared i had it from a member of the congregation and then all at once he apologized and hurried off excuse me but i see a lady whom i had not yet caught sight of and i desire to pay my respects to her he at once hastened to the lady in question and being unable to sit down inclined his lofty figure as if to envelope her with his gallant courtesy while she young fresh and bare-shouldered laughed with a pearly laugh as his cape of violet silk lightly brushed her sheeny skin you know that person don't you narcisse inquired of pierre no really why that is count prada's inamorata the charming lisbeth kaufmann by whom he has just had a son it's her first appearance in society since that event she is a german you know and lost her husband here she paints a little in fact rather nicely a great deal is forgiven to the ladies of the foreign colony and this one is particularly popular on account of the very affable manner in which she receives people in her little palazzo in the via principe amedeo as you may imagine the news of the dissolution of that marriage must amuse her she looked really exquisite that lisbeth very fair rosy and gay with satiny skin soft blue eyes and lips wreathed in an amiable smile which was renowned for its grace and that evening in her gown of white silk spangled with gold she showed herself so delighted with life so securely happy in the thought that she was free that she loved and was loved in return that the whispered tidings the malicious remarks exchanged behind the fans of those around her seemed to turn to her personal triumph for a moment all eyes had sought her and people talked of the outcome of her connection with prada the man whose manhood the church solemnly denied by its decision of that very day and there came stifled laughter and whispered jests whilst she radiant in her insolent serenity accepted with a rapturous air the gallantry of monsignor fornaro who congratulated her on a painting of the virgin with the lily which she had lately sent to a fine art show ah that matrimonial nullity suit which for a year had supplied rome with scandal what a final hubbub it occasioned as the tidings of its termination burst forth amidst that ball the black and white worlds had long chosen it as a battlefield for the exchange of incredible slander endless gossip the most nonsensical tittle-tattle and now it was over the vatican with imperturbable impudence had pronounced the marriage null and void on the ground that the husband was no man and all rome would laugh over the affair with that free scepticism which it displayed as soon as the pecuniary affairs of the church came into question the incidents of the struggle were already common property prada's feelings revolting to such a point that he had withdrawn from the contest the bocaneras moving heaven and earth in their feverish anxiety the money which they had distributed among the creatures of the various cardinals in order to gain their influence and the large sum which they had indirectly paid for the second and favourable report of monsignor palma people said that altogether more than a hundred thousand francs had been expended but this was not thought over much as a well-known french countess had been obliged to disperse nearly ten times that amount to secure the dissolution of her marriage but then the holy father's need was so great and moreover nobody was angered by this venality it merely gave rise to malicious witticisms and the fans continued waving in the increasing heat and the ladies quivered with contentment as the whispered pleasantries took wing and fluttered over their bare shoulders oh how pleased the contessina must be pierre resumed i did not understand what her little friend princess celia meant by saying when we came in that she would be so happy and beautiful this evening it is doubtless on that account that she is coming here after cloistering herself all the time the affair lasted as if she were in mourning however lisbeth's eyes had chanced to meet those of narcisse and as she smiled at him he was in his turn obliged to pay his respects to her for like everybody else of the foreign colony he knew her through having visited her studio 
he was again returning to pierre when a fresh outburst of emotion stirred the diamond aigrettes and the flowers adorning the lady's hair people turned to see what was the matter and again did the hubbub increase ah it's count prada in person murmured narcisse with an admiring glance he has a fine bearing whatever folks may say dress him up in velvet and gold and what a splendid unscrupulous fifteenth-century adventurer he would make prada entered the room looking quite gay in fact almost triumphant and above his large white shirt front edged by the black of his coat he really had a commanding predacious expression with his frank stern eyes and his energetic features barred by a large black moustache never had a more rapturous smile of sensuality revealed the wolfish teeth of his voracious mouth with rapid glances he took stock of the women dived into their very souls then on seeing lisbeth who looked so pink and fair and girlish his expression softened and he frankly went up to her without troubling in the slightest degree about the ardent inquisitive eyes which were turned upon him as soon as monsignor fornaro had made room he stooped and conversed with the young woman in a low tone and she no doubt confirmed the news which was circulating for as he again drew himself erect he laughed a somewhat forced laugh and made an involuntary gesture however he then caught sight of pierre and joined him in the embrasure of the window and when he had also shaken hands with narcisse he said to the young priest with all his wonted bravura you recollect what i told you as we were coming back from frascati well it's done it seems they've annulled my marriage it's such an impudent such an imbecile decision that i still doubted it a moment ago oh the news is certain pierre made bold to reply it has just been confirmed to us by monsignor fornaro who had it from a member of the congregation and it is said that the majority was very large prada again shook with laughter no no said he such a farce is beyond belief it's the finest smack given to justice and common sense that i know of ah if the marriage can also be annulled by the civil courts and if my friend whom you see yonder be only willing we shall amuse ourselves in rome yes indeed i'd marry her at santa maria maggiore with all possible pomp and there's a dear little being in the world who would take part in the fete in his nurse's arms he laughed too loud as he spoke alluded in too brutal a fashion to his child that living proof of his manhood was it suffering that made his lips curve upwards and reveal his white teeth it could be divined that he was quivering fighting against an awakening of covert tumultuous passion which he would not acknowledge even to himself and you my dear abbe he hastily resumed do you know the other report do you know that the countess is coming here it was thus by force of habit that he designated benedetta forgetting that she was no longer his wife yes i have just been told so pierre replied and then he hesitated for a moment before adding with a desire to prevent any disagreeable surprise and we shall no doubt see prince dario also for he has not started for naples as i told you something prevented his departure at the last moment i believe at least so i gathered from a servant prada no longer laughed his face suddenly became grave and he contented himself with murmuring ah so the cousin is to be of the party well we shall see them we shall see them both then whilst the two friends went on chatting he became silent as if serious considerations impelled him to reflect and suddenly making a gesture of apology he withdrew yet farther into the embrasure in which he stood pulled a notebook out of his pocket and tore from it a leaf on which without modifying his handwriting otherwise than by slightly enlarging it he penciled these four lines a legend avers that the fig tree of judas now grows at frascati and that its fruit is deadly for him who may desire to become pope eat not the poisoned figs nor give them either to your servants or your fowls then he folded the paper fastened it with a postage stamp and wrote on it the address to his most reverent and most illustrious eminence cardinal bocanera and when he had placed everything in his pocket again he drew a long breath and once more called back his laugh a kind of invincible discomfort a faraway terror had momentarily frozen him without being guided by any clear train of reasoning he had felt the need of protecting himself against any cowardly temptation any possible abomination he could not have told what course of ideas had induced him to write those four lines without a moment's delay on the very spot where he stood under penalty of contributing to a great catastrophe 
but one thought was firmly fixed in his brain that on leaving the ball he would go to the via giulia and throw that note into the letter-box at the palazzo bocconera and that decided he was once more easy in mind why what is the matter with you my dear abbe he inquired on again joining in the conversation of the two friends you are quite gloomy and on pierre telling him of the bad news which he had received the condemnation of his book and the single day which remained to him for action if he did not wish his journey to rome to result in defeat he began to protest as if he himself needed agitation and diversion in order to continue hopeful and bear the ills of life never mind never mind don't worry yourself said he one loses all one's strength by worrying a day is a great deal one can do ever so many things in a day an hour a minute suffices for destiny to intervene and turn defeat into victory he grew feverish as he spoke and all at once added come let's go to the ballroom it seems that the scene there is something prodigious then he exchanged a last loving glance with lisbeth whilst pierre and narcisse followed him the three of them extricating themselves from their corner with the greatest difficulty and then wending their way towards the adjoining gallery through a sea of serried skirts a billowy expanse of necks and shoulders whence ascended the passion which makes life the odour alike of love and of death End of section 23section twenty four of rome this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org rome by emil zola translated by ernest visitelli chapter twelve part two with its eight windows overlooking the corso their panes uncurtained and throwing a blaze of light upon the houses across the road the picture gallery sixty-five feet in length and more than thirty in breadth spread out with incomparable splendour the illumination was dazzling clusters of electric lamps had changed seven pairs of huge marble candelabra into gigantic torchères akin to constellations and all along the cornice up above other lamps set in bright-hued floral glasses formed a marvellous garland of flaming flowers tulips peonies and roses the antique red velvet worked with gold which draped the walls glowed like a furnace fire about the doors and windows there were hangings of old lace broidered with flowers in coloured silk whose hues had the very intensity of life but the sight of sights beneath the sumptuous panelled ceiling adorned with golden roses the unique spectacle of a richness not to be equalled was the collection of masterpieces such as no museum could excel there were works of raffaele and titian rembrandt and rubens velasquez and ribera famous works which in this unexpected illumination suddenly showed forth triumphant with youth regained as if awakened to the immortal life of genius and as their majesties would not arrive before midnight the ball had just been opened and flights of soft-hued gowns were whirling in a waltz past all the pompous throng the glittering jewels and decorations the gold-broidered uniforms and the pearl-broidered robes whilst silk and satin and velvet spread and overflowed upon every side it is prodigious really declared prada with his excited air let us go this way and place ourselves in a window recess again there is no better spot for getting a good view without being too much jostled they lost narcis somehow or other and on reaching the desired recess found themselves but two pierre and the count the orchestra installed on a little platform at the far end of the gallery had just finished the waltz and the dancers with an air of giddy rapture were slowly walking through the crowd when a fresh arrival caused every head to turn donna serafina arrayed in a robe of purple silk as if she had worn the colours of her brother the cardinal was making a royal entry on the arm of consistorial advocate morano and never before had she laced herself so tightly never had her waist looked so slim and girlish and never had her stern wrinkled face which her white hair scarcely softened expressed such stubborn and victorious domination a discreet murmur of approval ran round a murmur of public relief as it were for all roman society had condemned the unworthy conduct of morano in severing a connection of thirty years to which the drawing-rooms had grown as accustomed as if it had been a legal marriage the rupture had lasted for two months to the great scandal of rome where the cult of long and faithful affection still abides and so the reconciliation touched every heart and was regarded as one of the happiest consequences of the victory which the bocconeras had that day gained in the affair of benedetta's marriage 
Morano repentant and Donna Serafina reappearing on his arm, nothing could have been more satisfactory. Love had conquered, decorum was preserved, and good order re-established. But there was a deeper sensation as soon as Benedetta and Dario were seen to enter, side by side, behind the others. This tranquil indifference for the ordinary forms of propriety, on the very day when the marriage with Prada had been annulled, this victory of love, confessed and celebrated before one and all, seemed so charming in its audacity, so full of the bravery of youth and hope, that the pair were at once forgiven amidst a murmur of universal admiration. And as in the case of Celia and Attilio, all hearts flew to them, to their radiant beauty, to the wondrous happiness that made their faces so resplendent. Dario, still pale after his long convalescence, somewhat slight and delicate of build, with the fine clear eyes of a big child, and the dark curly beard of a young god, bore himself with a light pride, in which all the old princely blood of the Bocconeros could be traced. And Benedetta, she so white under her cask of jetty hair, she so calm and so sensible, wore her lovely smile, that smile so seldom seen on her face, but which was irresistibly fascinating, transfiguring her, imparting the charm of a flower to her somewhat full mouth, and filling the infinite of her dark and fathomless eyes with a radiance as of heaven. And in this gay return of youth and happiness, an exquisite instinct had prompted her to put on a white gown, a plain girlish gown which symbolized her maidenhood, which told that she had remained through all a pure untarnished lily for the husband of her choice and nothing of her form was to be seen, not a glimpse of bosom or shoulder. It was as if the impenetrable, redoubtable mystery of love, the sovereign beauty of woman, slumbered there, all-powerful, but veiled with white. Again not a jewel appeared on her fingers or in her ears. There was simply a necklace falling about her corsage, but a necklace fit for royalty, the famous pearl necklace of the Bocaneras, which she had inherited from her mother, and which was known to all Rome pearls of fabulous size cast negligently about her neck, and sufficing, simply as she was gowned, to make her queen of all. Oh, murmured Pierre in ecstasy, how happy and how beautiful she is! But he at once regretted that he had expressed his thoughts aloud, for beside him he heard a low plaint, an involuntary growl which reminded him of the Count's presence. However, Prada promptly stifled this cry of returning anguish, and found strength enough to affect a brutish gaiety, the devil said he they have plenty of impudence i hope we shall see them married and bedded at once then regretting this coarse jest which had been prompted by the revolt of passion he sought to appear indifferent she looks very nice this evening he said she has the finest shoulders in the world you know and it's a real success for her to hide them and yet appear more beautiful than ever he went on speaking contriving to assume an easy tone and giving various little particulars about the countess as he still obstinately called the young woman However, he had drawn rather further into the recess, for fear, no doubt, that people might remark his pallor and the painful twitch which contracted his mouth. He was in no state to fight, to show himself gay and insolent in presence of the joy which the lovers so openly and naively expressed. And he was glad of the respite which the arrival of the king and queen at this moment offered him. "'Ah, here are their majesties!' he exclaimed, turning towards the window. "'Look at the scramble in the street!' Although the windows were closed, a tumult could be heard rising from the footways, and Pierre, on looking down, saw, by the light of the electric lamps, a sea of human heads pour over the road and encompass the carriages. He had several times already seen the king during the latter's daily drives to the grounds of the Villa Borghese, whither he came like any private gentleman, unguarded, unescorted, with merely an aide-de-camp accompanying him in his Victoria. At other times he drove a light phaeton with only a footman in black livery to attend him and on one occasion Pierre had seen him with the Queen, the pair of them seated side by side like worthy middle-class folks driving abroad for pleasure. And as the royal couple went by, the busy people in the streets and the promenaders in the public gardens contented themselves with wafting them an affectionate wave of the hand, the most expansive simply approaching to smile at them, and no one importuning them with acclamations. Pierre, who harboured the traditional idea of kings closely guarded and passing processionally with all the accompaniment of military pomp, was therefore greatly surprised and touched by the amiable bonhomie of this royal pair, who went wherever they listed in full security amidst the smiling affection of their people. Everybody, moreover, had told him of the king's kindliness and simplicity, his desire for peace, and his passion for sport, solitude, and the open air, which, amidst the worries of power, must often have made him dream of a life of freedom far from the imperious duties of royalty for which he seemed unfitted. But the queen was yet more tenderly loved. 
so naturally and serenely virtuous that she alone remained ignorant of the scandals of rome she was also a woman of great culture and great refinement conversant with every field of literature and very happy in being so intelligent so superior to those around her a preeminence which she realized and which she was fond of showing but in the most natural and most graceful of ways like pierre prada had remained with his face to the window and suddenly pointing to the crowd he said now that they have seen the queen they will go to bed well pleased and there isn't a single police agent there i'm sure ah oh, to be loved to be loved plainly enough his distress of spirit was coming back and so turning towards the gallery again he tried to play the jester attention my dear abbe we mustn't miss their majesty's entry that will be the finest part of the fete a few minutes went by and then in the very midst of a polka the orchestra suddenly ceased playing but a moment afterwards with all the blare of its brass instruments it struck up the royal march the dancers fled in confusion the centre of the gallery was cleared and the king and queen entered escorted by the prince and princess buon giovanni who had received them at the foot of the staircase the king was in ordinary evening dress while the queen wore a robe of straw-coloured satin covered with superb white lace and under the diadem of brilliance which encircled her beautiful fair hair she looked still young with a fresh and rounded face whose expression was all amiability gentleness and wit the music was still sounding with the enthusiastic violence of welcome behind her father and mother celia appeared amidst the press of people who were following to see the sight and then came attilio the sacos and various relatives and official personages and pending the termination of the royal march only salutations glances and smiles were exchanged amidst the sonorous music and dazzling light whilst all the guests crowded around on tiptoe with outstretched necks and glittering eyes a rising tide of heads and shoulders flashing with the fires of precious stones at last the march ended and the presentations began their majesties were already acquainted with celia and congratulated her with quite affectionate kindliness however sacco both as minister and father was particularly desirous of presenting his son attilio he bent his supple spine and summoned to his lips the fine words which were appropriate in such wise that he contrived to make the young man bow to the king in the capacity of a lieutenant in his majesty's army whilst his homage as a handsome young man so passionately loved by his betrothed was reserved for queen margarita again did their majesties show themselves very gracious even towards the signora sacco who ever modest and prudent had remained in the background and then occurred an incident that was destined to give rise to endless gossip catching sight of benedetta whom count prada had presented to her after his marriage the queen who greatly admired her beauty and charm of manner addressed her a smile in such wise that the young woman was compelled to approach a conversation of some minutes duration ensued and the contesina was favoured with some extremely amiable expressions which were perfectly audible to all around most certainly the queen was ignorant of the event of the day the dissolution of benedetta's marriage with prada and her coming union with dario so publicly announced at this gala which now seemed to have been given to celebrate a double betrothal nevertheless that conversation caused a deep impression the guests talked of nothing but the compliments which benedetta had received from the most virtuous and intelligent of queens and her triumph was increased by it all she became yet more beautiful and more victorious amidst the happiness she felt at being at last able to bestow herself on the spouse of her choice that happiness which made her look so radiant but on the other hand the torture which prada experienced now became intense whilst the sovereigns continued conversing the queen with the ladies who came to pay her their respects the king with the officers diplomatists and other important personages who approached him prada saw none but benedetta benedetta congratulated caressed exalted by affection and glory dario was near her flushing with pleasure radiant like herself it was for them that this ball had been given for them that the lamps shone out for them that the music played for them that the most beautiful women of rome had bared their bosoms and adorned them with precious stones it was for them that their majesties had entered to the strains of the royal march for them that the fete was becoming like an apotheosis for them that a fondly loved queen was smiling appearing at that betrothal gala like the good fairy of the nursery tales whose coming betokens lifelong happiness and for prada this wondrously brilliant hour when good fortune and joyfulness attained their apogee was one of defeat it was fraught with the victory of that woman who had refused to be his wife in aught but name and of that man who now was about to take her from him 
such a public ostentatious insulting victory that it struck him like a buffet in the face and not merely did his pride and passion bleed for that he felt that the triumph of the sacos dealt a blow to his fortune was it true then that the rough conquerors of the north were bound to deteriorate in the delightful climate of rome was that the reason why he already experienced such a sensation of weariness and exhaustion that very morning at frascati in connection with that disastrous building enterprise he had realized that his millions were menaced albeit he refused to admit that things were going badly with him as some people rumored and now that evening amidst that fete he beheld the south victorious sacco winning the day like one who feeds at his ease on the warm prey so gluttonously pounced upon under the flaming sun and the thought of sacco being a minister the intimate of the king allying himself by marriage to one of the noblest families of the roman aristocracy and already laying hands on the people and the national funds with the prospect of some day becoming the master of rome and italy that thought again was a blow for the vanity of this man of prey for the ever voracious appetite of this enjoyer who felt as if he were being pushed away from the table before the feast was over all crumbled and escaped him sacco stole his millions and benedetta tortured his flesh stirring up that awful wound of unsatisfied passion which never would be healed again did pierre hear that dull plaint that involuntary despairing growl which had upset him once before and he looked at the count and asked him are you suffering but on seeing how livid was the face of prada who only retained his calmness by a superhuman effort he regretted his indiscreet question which moreover remained unanswered and then to put the other more at ease the young priest went on speaking venting the thoughts which the sight before him inspired your father was right said he we frenchmen whose education is so full of the catholic spirit even in these days of universal doubt we never think of rome otherwise than as the old rome of the popes we scarcely know we can scarcely understand the great changes which year by year have brought about the italian rome of the present day why when i arrived here the king and his government and the young nation working to make a great capital for itself seemed to me of no account whatever yes i dismissed all that thought nothing of it in my dream of resuscitating a christian and evangelical rome which should assure the happiness of the world he laughed as he spoke pitying his own artlessness and then pointed towards the gallery where prince buon giovanni was bowing to the king whilst the princess listened to the gallant remarks of sacco a scene full of symbolism the old papal aristocracy struck down the parvenus accepted the black and white worlds so mixed together that one and all were little else than subjects on the eve of forming but one united nation that conciliation between the quirinal and the vatican which in principle was regarded as impossible was it not in practice fatal in face of the evolution which went on day by day people must go on living loving and creating life throughout the ages and the marriage of attilio and celia would be the symbol of the needful union youth and love triumphing over ancient hatred all quarrels forgotten as a handsome lad goes by wins a lovely girl and carries her off in his arms in order that the world may last look at them resumed pierre how handsome and young and gay both the fiancés are all confidence in the future ah i well understand that your king should have come here to please his minister and win one of the old roman families over to his throne it is good brave and fatherly policy but i like to think that he has also realized the touching significance of that marriage old rome in the person of that candid loving child giving herself to young italy that upright enthusiastic young man who wears his uniform so jauntily and may their nuptials be definitive and fruitful from them and from all the others may there arise the great nation which now that i begin to know you i trust you will soon become amidst the tottering of his former dream of an evangelical and universal rome pierre expressed these good wishes for the eternal city's future fortune with such keen and deep emotion that prada could not help replying i thank you that wish of yours is in the heart of every good italian but his voice quavered for even whilst he was looking at celia and attilio who stood smiling and talking together he saw benedetta and dario approach them wearing the same joyful expression of perfect happiness and when the two couples were united so radiant and so triumphant so full of superb and happy life he no longer had strength to stay there see them and suffer i am frightfully thirsty he coarsely exclaimed let's go to the buffet to drink something and thereupon in order to avoid notice he so manoeuvred as to glide behind the throng skirting the windows in the direction of the entrance to the hall of the antiques which was beyond the gallery whilst pierre was following him they were parted by an eddy of the crowd 
and the young priest found himself carried towards the two loving couples who still stood chatting together and Celia, on recognizing him beckoned him in a friendly way with her passionate cult for beauty she was enraptured with the appearance of benedetta before whom she joined her little lily hands as before the image of the madonna oh monsieur l'abbé said she to please me now do tell me how beautiful she is more beautiful than anything on earth more beautiful than even the sun and the moon and the stars if you only knew my dear it makes me quiver to see you so beautiful as that as beautiful as happiness as beautiful as love itself benedetta began to laugh while the two young men made merry but you are as beautiful as i am darling said the contesina and if we are beautiful it is because we are happy yes yes happy celia gently responded do you remember the evening when you told me that one didn't succeed in marrying the pope and the king but attilio and i are marrying them and yet we are very happy but we don't marry them dario and i on the contrary said benedetta gaily no matter as you answered me that same evening it is sufficient that we should love one another love saves the world when pierre at last succeeded in reaching the door of the hall of the antiques where the buffet was installed he found prada there motionless gazing despite himself on the galling spectacle which he desired to flee a power stronger than his will had kept him there forcing him to turn round and look and look again and thus with a bleeding heart he still lingered and witnessed the resumption of the dancing the first figure of a quadrille which the orchestra began to play with a lively flourish of its brass instruments benedetta and dario celia and attilio were vis-a-vis -vis. and so charming and delightful was the sight which the two couples presented dancing in the white blaze all youth and joy that the king and queen drew near to them and became interested and soon bravos of admiration rang out while from every heart spread a feeling of infinite tenderness i'm dying of thirst let's go repeated prada at last managing to wrench himself away from the torturing sight he called for some iced lemonade and drank the glassful at one draught gulping it down with the greedy eagerness of a man stricken with fever who will never more be able to quench the burning fire within him the hall of the antiques was a spacious room with mosaic pavement and decorations of stucco and a famous collection of vases bas-reliefs and statues was disposed along its walls the marbles predominated but there were a few bronzes and among them a dying gladiator of extreme beauty the marvel however was the famous statue of venus a companion to that of the capitol but with a more elegant and supple figure and with the left arm falling loosely in a gesture of voluptuous surrender that evening a powerful electric reflector threw a dazzling light upon the statue which in its divine and pure nudity seemed to be endowed with superhuman immortal life against the end wall was the buffet a long table covered with an embroidered cloth and laden with fruit pastry and cold meats sheaves of flowers rose up amidst the bottles of champagne hot punch and iced sorbetto and here and there were marshalled armies of glasses teacups and broth bowls a perfect wealth of sparkling crystal porcelain and silver and a happy innovation had been to fill half of the hall with rows of little tables at which the guests in lieu of being obliged to refresh themselves standing were able to sit down and order what they desired as in a cafe at one of these little tables pierre perceived narcisse seated near a young woman whom prada on approaching recognized to be lisbeth you find me you see in delightful company gallantly exclaimed the attache as we lost one another i could think of nothing better than of offering madame my arm to bring her here it was in fact a good idea said lisbeth with her pretty laugh for i was feeling very thirsty they had ordered some iced coffee which they were slowly sipping out of little silver gilt spoons i have a terrible thirst too declared the count and i can't quench it you will allow us to join you will you not my dear sir some of that coffee will perhaps calm me and then to lisbeth he added ah my dear allow me to introduce to you monsieur l'abbé Froment, a young french priest of great distinction then for a long time they all four remained seated at that table chatting and making merry over certain of the guests who went by prada however in spite of his usual gallantry towards lisbeth frequently became absent-minded at times he quite forgot her being again mastered by his anguish and in spite of all his efforts his eyes ever turned towards the neighbouring gallery whence the sound of music and dancing reached him why what are you thinking of caro mio lisbeth asked in her pretty way on seeing him at one moment so pale and lost are you indisposed he did not reply however but suddenly exclaimed ah look there that's the real pair there's real love and happiness for you with a jerk of the hand he designated dario's mother 
the marchioness montefiori and her second husband jules laporte that ex-sergeant of the papal swiss guard her junior by fifteen years whom she had one day hooked at the corso with her eyes of fire which yet had remained superb and whom she had afterwards triumphantly transformed into a marquis montefiori in order to have him entirely to herself such was her passion that she never relaxed her hold on him whether at ball or reception but despite all usages kept him beside her and even made him escort her to the buffet so much did she delight in being able to exhibit him and say that this handsome man was her own exclusive property and standing there side by side the pair of them began to drink champagne and eat sandwiches she yet a marvel of massive beauty although she was over fifty and he with long wavy moustaches and proud bearing like a fortunate adventurer whose jovial impudence pleased the ladies you know that she had to extricate him from a nasty affair resumed the count in a lower tone yes he travelled in relics he picked up a living by supplying relics on commission to convents in france and switzerland and he had launched quite a business in false relics with the help of some jews here who concocted little ancient reliquaries out of mutton bones with everything sealed and signed by the most genuine authorities the affair was hushed up as three prelates were also compromised in it ah the happy man do you see how she devours him with her eyes and he doesn't he look quite a grand seigneur by the mere way in which he holds that plate for her whilst she eats the breast of a fowl out of it then in a rough way and with biting irony he went on to speak of the amours of rome the roman women said he were ignorant obstinate and jealous when a woman had managed to win a man she kept him forever he became her property and she disposed of him as she pleased by way of proof he cited many interminable liaisons such as that of donna serafina and morano which in time became virtual marriages and he sneered at such a lack of fancy such an excess of fidelity whose only ending when it did end was some very disagreeable unpleasantness at this lisbeth interrupted him but what is the matter with you this evening my dear she asked with a laugh what you speak of is on the contrary very nice and pretty when a man and a woman love one another they ought to do so for ever she looked delightful as she spoke with her fine wavy blonde hair and delicate fair complexion and narcisse with a languorous expression in his half-closed eyes compared her to a botticelli which he had seen at florence however the night was now far advanced and pierre had once more sunk into gloomy thoughtfulness when he heard a passing lady remark that they had already begun to dance the cotillon in the gallery and thereupon he suddenly remembered that monsignor nani had given him an appointment in the little saloon of the mirrors are you leaving hastily inquired prado on seeing him rise and bow to lisbeth no no not yet pierre answered oh all right don't go away without me i want to walk a little and i'll see you home it's agreed eh you will find me here the young priest had to cross two rooms one hung with yellow and the other with blue before he at last reached the mirrored salon this was really an exquisite example of the rococo style a rotunda as it were of pale mirrors framed with superb gilded carvings even the ceiling was covered with mirrors disposed slantwise so that on every side things multiplied mingled and appeared under all possible aspects discreetly enough no electric lights had been placed in the room the only illumination being that of some pink tapers burning in a pair of candelabra the hangings and upholstery were of soft blue silk and the impression on entering was very sweet and charming as if one had found oneself in the abode of some fairy queen of the rills a palace of limpid water illumined to its furthest depths by clusters of stars pierre at once perceived monsignor nani who was sitting on a low couch and as the prelate had hoped he was quite alone for the cotillon had attracted almost everybody to the picture gallery and the silence in the little salon was nearly perfect for at that distance the blare of the orchestra subsided into a faint flute-like murmur the young priest at once apologized to the prelate for having kept him waiting no no my dear son said nani with his inexhaustible amiability i was very comfortable in this retreat when the press of the crowd became over threatening i took refuge here he did not speak of the king and queen but he allowed it to be understood that he had politely avoided their company if he had come to the fete it was on account of his sincere affection for celia and also with a very delicate diplomatic object for the church wished to avoid any appearance of having entirely broken with the buon giovanni family that ancient house which was so famous in the annals of the papacy doubtless the vatican was unable to subscribe to this marriage which seemed to unite old rome with the young kingdom of italy 
but on the other hand it did not desire people to think that it abandoned old and faithful supporters and took no interest in what befell them but come my dear son the prelate resumed it is you who are now in question i told you that although the congregation of the index had pronounced itself for the condemnation of your book the sentence would only be submitted to the holy father and signed by him on the day after tomorrow so you still have a whole day before you at this pierre could not refrain from a dolorous and vivacious interruption alas monseigneur what can i do said he i have thought it all over and i see no means no opportunity of defending myself how could i even see his holiness now that he is so ill oh ill ill muttered nani with his shrewd expression his holiness is ever so much better for this very day like every other wednesday i had the honour to be received by him when his holiness is a little tired and people say that he is very ill he often lets them do so for it gives him a rest and enables him to judge certain ambitions and manifestations of impatience around him pierre however was too upset to listen attentively no it's all over he continued i'm in despair you spoke to me of the possibility of a miracle but i am no great believer in miracles since i am defeated here at rome i shall go away i shall return to paris and continue the struggle there oh i cannot resign myself my hope in salvation by the practice of love cannot die and i shall answer my denounces in a new book in which i shall tell in what new soil the new religion will grow up silence fell nani looked at him with his clear eyes in which intelligence shone distinct and sharp like steel and amidst the deep calm the warm heavy atmosphere of the little salon whose mirrors were starred with countless reflections of candles a more sonorous burst of music was suddenly wafted from the gallery a rhythmical waltz melody which slowly expanded then died away my dear son said nani anger is always harmful you remember that on your arrival here i promised that if your own efforts to obtain an interview with the holy father should prove unavailing i would myself endeavour to secure an audience for you then seeing how agitated the young priest was getting he went on listen to me and don't excite yourself his holiness unfortunately is not always prudently advised around him are persons whose devotion however great is at times deficient in intelligence i told you that and warned you against inconsiderate applications and this is why already three weeks ago i myself handed your book to his holiness in the hope that he would deign to glance at it i rightly suspected that it had not been allowed to reach him and this is what i am instructed to tell you his holiness who has had the great kindness to read your book expressly desires to see you a cry of joy and gratitude died away in pierre's throat ah monseigneur ah monseigneur but nani quickly silenced him and glanced around with an expression of keen anxiety as if he feared that someone might hear them hush hush said he it is a secret his holiness wishes to see you privately without taking anybody else into his confidence listen attentively it is now two o'clock in the morning well this very day at nine in the evening precisely you must present yourself at the vatican and at every door ask for signor squadra you will invariably be allowed to pass signor squadra will be waiting for you upstairs and will introduce you and not a word mind not a soul must have the faintest suspicion of these things pierre's happiness and gratitude at last flowed forth he had caught hold of the prelate's soft plump hands and stammered oh, monseigneur how can i express my gratitude to you if you only knew how full my soul was of night and rebellion since i realized that i had been a mere plaything in the hands of those powerful cardinals but you have saved me and again i feel sure that i shall win the victory for i shall at last be able to fling myself at the feet of his holiness the father of all truth and all justice he can but absolve me i who love him i who admire him i who have never battled for aught but his own policy and most cherished ideas no no it is impossible he will not sign that judgment he will not condemn my book releasing his hands nani sought to calm him with a fatherly gesture whilst retaining a faint smile of contempt for such a useless expenditure of enthusiasm at last he succeeded and begged him to retire the orchestra was again playing more loudly in the distance and when the young priest at last withdrew thanking him once more he said very simply remember my dear son that only obedience is great pierre whose one desire now was to take himself off found prada almost immediately afterwards in the first reception room their majesties had just left the ball in grand ceremony escorted to the threshold by the buon giovannis and the saccos and before departing the queen had maternally kissed celia 
whilst the king shook hands with attilio honours instinct with the charming good nature which made the members of both families quite radiant however a good many of the guests were following the example of the sovereigns and disappearing in small batches and the count who seemed strangely nervous and showed more sternness and bitterness than ever was on his side also eager to be gone ah it's you at last i was waiting for you he said to pierre well let's get off at once eh your compatriot monsieur narcisse Abert, asked me to tell you not to look for him the fact is he has gone to see my friend lisbeth to her carriage i myself want a breath of fresh air a stroll and so i'll go with you as far as the via julia then as they took their things from the cloak-room he could not help sneering and saying in his brutal way i saw your good friends go off all four together it's lucky that you prefer to go home on foot for there was no room for you in the carriage what superb impudence it was on the part of that donna seraphina to drag herself here at her age with that morano of hers so as to triumph over the return of the fickle one and the two others the two young ones ah i confess that i can hardly speak calmly of them for in parading here together as they did this evening they have shown an impudence and a cruelty such as is rarely seen prada's hands trembled and he murmured a good journey a good journey to the young man since he is going to naples yes i heard celia say that he was starting for naples this evening at six o'clock well my wishes go with him a good journey the two men found the change delightful when they at last emerged from the stifling heat of the reception rooms into the lovely cool and limpid night it was a night illumined by a superb full moon one of those matchless roman nights when the city slumbers in elysian radiance steeped in a dream of the infinite under the vast vault of heaven and they took the most agreeable route going down the corso proper and then turning into the corso vittorio emanuele prada had grown somewhat calmer but remained full of irony to divert his mind no doubt he talked on in the most voluble manner reverting to the women of rome and to that fete which he had at first found splendid but at which he now began to rail oh of course they have very fine gowns said he speaking of the women but gowns which don't fit them gowns which are sent to them from paris and which of course they can't try on it's just the same with their jewels they still have diamonds and pearls in particular which are very fine but they are so wretchedly so heavily mounted that they look frightful and if you only knew how ignorant and frivolous these women are despite all their conceit everything is on the surface with them even religion there's nothing beneath i looked at the meeting at the buffet oh they at least have fine appetites this evening some decorum was observed there wasn't too much gorging but at one of the court balls you would see a general pillage the buffets besieged and everything swallowed up amidst a scramble of amazing veracity to all this talk pierre only returned monosyllabic responses he was wrapped in overflowing delight at the thought of that audience with the pope which unable as he was to confide in any one he strove to arrange and picture in his own mind even in its pettiest details and meantime the footsteps of the two men rang out on the dry pavement of the clear broad deserted thoroughfare whose black shadows were sharply outlined by the moonlight all at once prada himself became silent his loquacious bravura was exhausted the frightful struggle going on in his mind wholly possessed and paralyzed him twice already he had dipped his hand into his coat pocket and felt the penciled note whose four lines he mentally repeated a legend avers that the fig tree of judas now grows at frascati and that its fruit is deadly for him who may desire to become pope eat not the poisoned figs nor give them either to your servants or your fowls the note was there he could feel it and if he had desired to accompany pierre it was in order that he might drop it into the letter-box at the palazzo bocconera and he continued to step out briskly so that within another ten minutes that note would surely be in the box for no power in the world could prevent it since such was his express determination never would he commit such a crime as to allow people to be poisoned but he was suffering such abominable torture that benedetta and that dario had raised such a tempest of jealous hatred within him for them he forgot lisbeth whom he loved and even that flesh of his flesh the child of whom he was so proud all sex as he was eager to conquer and subdue he had never cared for facile loves his passion was to overcome and now there was a woman in the world who defied him a woman forsooth whom he had bought whom he had married who had been handed over to him but who would never never be his ah in the old days to subdue her he would if needful have fired rome like a nero but now he asked himself what he could possibly do to prevent her from belonging to another 
that galling thought made the blood gush from his gaping wound how that woman and her lover must deride him and to think that they had sought to turn him to ridicule by a baseless charge an arrant lie which still and ever made him smart all proof of its falsity to the contrary he on his side had accused them in the past without much belief in what he said but now the charges he had imputed to them must come true for they were free freed at all events of the religious bond and that no doubt was their only care and then visions of their happiness passed before his eyes infuriating him ah no ah no it was impossible he would rather destroy the world then as he and pierre turned out of the corso vittorio emanuele to thread the old narrow tortuous streets leading to the via giulia he pictured himself dropping the note into the letter-box at the palazzo and next he conjured up what would follow the note would lie in the letter-box till morning at an early hour don vigilio the secretary who by the cardinal's express orders kept the key of the box would come down find the note and hand it to his eminence who never allowed another to open any communication addressed to him and then the figs would be thrown away there would be no further possibility of crime the black world would in all prudence keep silent but if the note should not be in the letter-box what would happen then and admitting that supposition he pictured the figs placed on the table at the one o'clock meal in their pretty little leaf-covered basket dario would be there as usual alone with his uncle since he was not to leave for naples till the evening and would both the uncle and the nephew eat the figs or would only one of them partake of the fruit and which of them would that be at this point prada's clearness of vision failed him again he conjured up destiny on the march that destiny which he had met on the road from frascati going on towards its unknown goal athwart all obstacles without possibility of stoppage ay the little basket of figs went ever on and on to accomplish its fateful purpose which no hand in the world had power enough to prevent and at last on either hand of pierre and prada the via giulia stretched away in a long line white with moonlight and the young priest emerged as if from a dream at sight of the palazzo bocanera rising blackly under the silver sky three o'clock struck at a neighbouring church and he felt himself quivering slightly as once again he heard near him the dolorous moan of a lion wounded unto death that low involuntary growl which the count amidst the frightful struggle of his feelings had for the third time allowed to escape him but immediately afterwards he burst into a sneering laugh and pressing the priest's hands exclaimed no no i am not going farther if i were seen here at this hour people would think that i have fallen in love with my wife again and thereupon he lighted a cigar and retraced his steps in the clear night without once looking round end of section twenty four section twenty five of rome this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org rome by emil zola translated by ernest visitelli chapter thirteen part one when pierre awoke he was much surprised to hear eleven o'clock striking fatigued as he was by that ball where he had lingered so long he had slept like a child in delightful peacefulness and as soon as he opened his eyes the radiant sunshine filled him with hope his first thought was that he would see the pope that evening at nine o'clock ten more hours to wait what would he be able to do with himself during that lovely day whose radiant sky seemed to him of such happy augury he rose and opened the windows to admit the warm air which as he had noticed on the day of his arrival had a savour of fruit and flowers a blending as it were of the perfume of rose and orange could this possibly be december what a delightful land that the spring should seem to flower on the very threshold of winter then having dressed he was leaning out of the window to glance across the golden tiber at the evergreen slopes of the geniculum when he espied benedetta seated in the abandoned garden of the mansion and thereupon unable to keep still full of a desire for life gaiety and beauty he went down to join her with radiant visage and outstretched hands she at once vented the cry he had expected ah my dear abbe how happy i am they had often spent their mornings in that quiet forsaken nook but what sad mornings those had been hopeless as they both were Today, however the weed-grown paths the box plants growing in the old basin the orange trees which alone marked the outline of the beds all seemed full of charm 
instinct with a sweet and dreamy coziness in which it was very pleasant to lull one's joy and it was so warm too beside the big laurel bush in the corner where the streamlet of water ever fell with flute-like music from the gaping tragic mask ah repeated benedetta how happy i am i was stifling upstairs and my heart felt such a need of space and air and sunlight that i came down here she was seated on the fallen column beside the old marble sarcophagus and desired the priest to place himself beside her never had he seen her looking so beautiful with her black hair encompassing her pure face which in the sunshine appeared pinky and delicate as a flower her large fathomless eyes showed in the light like braziers rolling gold and her childish mouth all candour and good sense laughed the laugh of one who was at last free to love as her heart listed without offending either god or man and dreaming aloud she built up plans for the future it's all simple enough said she i have already obtained a separation and shall easily get that changed into civil divorce now that the church has annulled my marriage and i shall marry dario next spring perhaps sooner if the formalities can be hastened he is going to naples this evening about the sale of some property which we still possessed there but which must now be sold for all this business has cost us a lot of money still that doesn't matter since we now belong to one another and when he comes back in a few days what a happy time we shall have i could not sleep when i got back from that splendid ball last night for my head was so full of plans oh splendid plans as you shall see for i mean to keep you in rome until our marriage like herself pierre began to laugh so gained upon by this explosion of youth and happiness that he had to make a great effort to refrain from speaking of his own delight his hopefulness at the thought of his coming interview with the pope of that however he had sworn to speak to nobody every now and again amidst the quivering silence of the sunlit garden the cry of a bird persistently rang out and benedetta raising her head and looking at a cage hanging beside one of the first floor windows jestingly exclaimed yes yes tata make a good noise show that you are pleased my dear everybody in the house must be pleased now then turning towards pierre she added gaily you know tata don't you what no why tata is my uncle's parrot i gave her to him last spring he's very fond of her and lets her help herself out of his plate and he himself attends to her puts her out and takes her in and keeps her in his dining-room for fear lest she should take cold as that is the only room of his which is at all warm pierre in his turn looked up and saw the bird one of those pretty little parrots with soft silky dull green plumage it was hanging by the beak from a bar of its cage swinging itself and flapping its wings all mirth in the bright sunshine does the bird talk he asked no she only screams replied benedetta laughing still my uncle pretends that he understands her and then the young woman abruptly darted to another subject as if this mention of her uncle the cardinal had made her think of the uncle by marriage whom she had in paris i suppose you have heard from viscount de la choux said she i had a letter from him yesterday in which he said how grieved he was that you were unable to see the holy father as he had counted on you for the triumph of his ideas pierre indeed frequently heard from the viscount who was greatly distressed by the importance which his adversary baron de fouras had acquired since his success with the international pilgrimage of the peters pence the old uncompromising catholic party would awaken said the viscount and all the conquests of neo-catholicism would be threatened if one could not obtain the holy father's formal adhesion to the proposed system of free guilds in order to overcome the demand for closed guilds which was brought forward by the conservatives and the viscount overwhelmed pierre with injunctions and sent him all sorts of complicated plans in his eagerness to see him received at the vatican yes yes muttered the young priest in reply to benedetta i had a letter on sunday and found another waiting for me on my return from frascati yesterday ah it would make me very happy to be able to send the viscount some good news then again pierre's joy overflowed at the thought that he would that evening see the pope and on opening his loving heart to the pontiff receive the supreme encouragement which would strengthen him in his mission to work social salvation in the name of the lowly and the poor and he could not restrain himself any longer but let his secret escape him it's settled you know said he my audience is for this evening benedetta did not understand at first what audience she asked oh monsignor nani was good enough to tell me at the ball this morning that the holy father has read my book and desires to see me 
I shall be received this evening at nine o'clock. At this the Contessina flushed with pleasure, participating in the delight of the young priest to whom she had grown much attached. And this success of his, coming in the midst of her own felicity, acquired extraordinary importance in her eyes, as if it were an augury of complete success for one and all. Superstitious as she was, she raised a cry of rapture and excitement. Ah, Dio, that will bring us good luck. How happy I am, my friend, to see happiness coming to you at the same time as to me. You cannot think how pleased I am. And all will go well now, it's certain, for a house where there is anyone whom the Pope welcomes is blessed. The thunder of heaven falls on it no more. She laughed yet more loudly as she spoke, and clapped her hands with such exuberant gaiety that Pierre became anxious. Hush, hush, said he, it is a secret. Pray don't mention it to anyone, either to your aunt or even his eminence. Monsignor Nani would be much annoyed. She thereupon promised to say nothing, and in a kindly voice spoke of Nani as a benefactor, for was she not indebted to him for the dissolution of her marriage? Then, with a fresh explosion of gaiety, she went on, But come, my friend, is not happiness the only good thing? You don't ask me to weep over the suffering poor today. Ah, the happiness of life, that's everything. People don't suffer or feel cold or hungry when they are happy. He looked at her in stupefaction at the idea of that strange solution of the terrible question of human misery. And suddenly he realized that, with that daughter of the son who had inherited so many centuries of sovereign aristocracy, all his endeavors at conversion were vain. He had wished to bring her to a Christian love for the lowly and the wretched, win her over to the new enlightened and compassionate Italy that he had dreamt of. But if she had been moved by the sufferings of the multitude at the time when she herself had suffered, when grievous wounds had made her own heart bleed, she was no sooner healed than she proclaimed the doctrine of universal felicity like a true daughter of a clime of burning summers and winters as mild as spring. But everybody is not happy, said he. Yes, yes, they are, she exclaimed. You don't know the poor. Give a girl of the Trastevere the lad she loves, and she becomes as radiant as a queen, and finds her dry bread quite sweet. The mothers who save a child from sickness, the men who conquer in a battle, or who win at the lottery, one and all, in fact, are like that. People only ask for good fortune and pleasure. And despite all your striving to be just and to arrive at a more even distribution of fortune, the only satisfied ones will be those whose hearts sing, often without their knowing the cause, on a fine sunny day like this. Pierre made a gesture of surrender, not wishing to sadden her by again pleading the cause of all the poor ones who at that very moment were somewhere agonizing with physical or mental pain. But all at once, through the luminous mild atmosphere, a shadow seemed to fall, tinging joy with sadness, the sunshine with despair. And the sight of the old sarcophagus, with its bacchanal of satyrs and nymphs, brought back the memory that death lurks even amidst the bliss of passion, the unsatiated kisses of love. For a moment the clear song of the water sounded in Pierre's ears like a long-drawn sob, and all seemed to crumble in the terrible shadow which had fallen from the invisible. Benedetta, however, caught hold of his hands and roused him once more to the delight of being there beside her. "'Your pupil is rebellious, is she not, my friend?' said she. "'But what would you have? There are ideas which can't enter into our heads. No, you will never get those things into the head of a Roman girl.' So be content with loving us as we are, beautiful with all our strength, as beautiful as we can be. She herself, in her resplendent happiness, looked at that moment so beautiful that he trembled as in the presence of a divinity whose all-powerfulness swayed the world. Yes, yes, he stammered, beauty, beauty, still and ever sovereign. Ah, why can it not suffice to satisfy the eternal longings of poor suffering men? Never mind, she gaily responded, do not distress yourself, it is pleasant to live. And now let us go upstairs, my aunt must be waiting. The midday meal was served at one o'clock, and on the few occasions when Pierre did not eat at one or another restaurant, a cover was laid for him at the ladies' table in the little dining room of the second floor, overlooking the courtyard. At the same hour, in the sunlit dining room of the first floor, whose windows faced the Tiber, the cardinal likewise sat down to table, happy in the society of his nephew, Dario, for his secretary, Don Vigilio, who also was usually present, never opened his mouth unless to reply to some question. And the two services were quite distinct, each having its own kitchen and servants, the only thing at all common to them both being a large room downstairs, which served as a pantry and store-place. 
Although the second-floor dining room was so gloomy, saddened by the greeny half-light of the courtyard, the meal shared that day by the two ladies and the young priest proved a very gay one. Even Donna Serafina, usually so rigid, seemed to relax under the influence of great internal felicity. She was no doubt still enjoying her triumph of the previous evening, and it was she who first spoke of the ball and sung its praises, though the presence of the king and queen had much embarrassed her, said she. According to her account, she had only avoided presentation by skilful strategy. However, she hoped that her well-known affection for Celia, whose godmother she was, would explain her presence in that neutral mansion where Vatican and Quirinal had met. At the same time she must have retained certain scruples, for she declared that directly after dinner she was going to the Vatican to see the Cardinal Secretary, to whom she desired to speak about an enterprise of which she was Lady Patroness. This visit would compensate for her attendance at the Buon Giovanni entertainment. And on the other hand, never had Donna Serafina seemed so zealous and hopeful of her brother's speedy accession to the throne of St. Peter. Therein lay a supreme triumph, an elevation of her race, which her pride deemed both needful and inevitable. And indeed, during Leo XIII's last indisposition, she had actually concerned herself about the trousseau which would be needed, and which would require to be marked with the new pontiff's arms. On her side, Benedetta was all gaiety during the repast, laughing at everything, and speaking of Celia and Attilio with the passionate affection of a woman whose own happiness delights in that of her friends. Then, just as the dessert had been served, she turned to the servant with an air of surprise. Well, and the figs, Giacomo? she asked. Giacomo, slow and sleepy of motion, looked at her without understanding. However, Victorine was crossing the room, and Benedetta's next question was for her. Why are the figs not served, Victorine? she inquired. What figs, Contessina? Why, the figs I saw in the pantry as I passed through it this morning on my way to the garden. They were in a little basket and looked superb. I was even astonished to see that there were still some fresh figs left at this season. I'm very fond of them and felt quite pleased at the thought that I should eat some at dinner. Victorine began to laugh. Ah, yes, Contessina, I understand, she replied. There were some figs which that priest of Frascati, whom you know very well, brought yesterday evening as a present for his eminence. I was there, and I heard him repeat three or four times that they were a present, and were to be put on his eminence's table without a leaf being touched. And so one did as he said. Well, that's nice, retorted Benedetta with comical indignation. What gourmands my uncle and Dario are to regale themselves without us. They might have given us a share. Donna Serafina thereupon intervened and asked Victorine, You are speaking, are you not, of that priest who used to come to the villa at Frascati? Yes, yes, Abbess Santobono, his name is. He officiates at the little church of St. Mary in the fields. He always asks for Abbe Paparelli when he calls. I think they were at the seminary together. And it was Abbe Paparelli who brought him to the pantry with his basket last night. To tell the truth, the basket was forgotten there in spite of all the injunctions, so that nobody would have eaten the figs today if Abbe Paparelli hadn't run down just now and carried them upstairs as piously as if they were the blessed sacrament. It's true, though, that His Eminence is so fond of them. My brother won't do them much honour today, remarked the princess. He is slightly indisposed. He passed a bad night. The repeated mention of Abbe Paparelli had made the old lady somewhat thoughtful. She had regarded the train-bearer with displeasure ever since she had noticed the extraordinary influence he was gaining over the cardinal despite all his apparent humility and self-effacement he was but a servant and apparently a very insignificant one yet he governed and she could feel that he combated her own influence often undoing things which she had done to further her brother's interests twice already moreover she had suspected him of having urged the cardinal to courses which she looked upon as absolute blunders but perhaps she was wrong she did the train-bearer the justice to admit that he had great merits and displayed exemplary piety However, Benedetta went on laughing and jesting, and as Victorine had now withdrawn, she called the man-servant. Listen, Giacomo, I have a commission for you. Then she broke off to say to her aunt and to Pierre, Pray let us assert our rights. I can see them at table almost underneath us. Uncle is taking the leaves off the basket and serving himself with a smile. Then he passes the basket to Dario, who passes it on to Don Vigilio. And all three of them eat and enjoy the figs. You can see them, can't you? She herself could see them well, and it was her desire to be near Dario, a constant flight of her thoughts to him, that now made her picture him at table with the others. Her heart was down below, 
and there was nothing there that she could not see and hear and smell with such keenness of the senses did her love endow her giacomo she resumed you are to go down and tell his eminence that we are longing to taste his figs and that it will be very kind of him if he will send us such as he can spare again however did donna serafina intervene recalling her wonted severity of voice giacomo you will please stay here and to her niece she added that's enough childishness i dislike such silly freaks oh aunt benedetta murmured but i'm so happy it's so long since i laughed so good-heartedly pierre had hitherto remained listening enlivened by the sight of her gaiety but now as a little chill fell he raised his voice to say that on the previous day he himself had been astonished to see the famous fig tree of frascati still bearing fruit so late in the year this was doubtless due however to the tree's position and the protection of a high wall ah oh, so you saw the tree said benedetta yes and i even travelled with those figs which you would so much like to taste why how was that the young man already regretted the reply which had escaped him however having gone so far he preferred to say everything i met somebody at frascati who had come there in a carriage and who insisted on driving me back to rome said he on the way we picked up abbe santo bono who was bravely making the journey on foot with his basket in his hand and afterwards we stopped at an osteria then he went on to describe the drive and relate his impressions whilst crossing the campagna amidst the falling twilight but benedetta gazed at him fixedly aware as she was of prada's frequent visits to the land and houses which he owned at frascati and suddenly she murmured somebody somebody it was the count was it not yes madame the count pierre answered i saw him again last night he was overcome and really deserves to be pitied the two women took no offence at this charitable remark which fell from the young priest with such deep and natural emotion full as he was of overflowing love and compassion for one and all donna serafina remained motionless as if she had not even heard him and benedetta made a gesture which seemed to imply that she had neither pity nor hatred to express for a man who had become a perfect stranger to her however she no longer laughed but thinking of the little basket which had travelled in prada's carriage she said ah i don't care for those figs at all now i am even glad that i haven't eaten any of them immediately after the coffee donna serafina withdrew saying that she was at once going to the vatican and the others being left to themselves lingered at table again full of gaiety and chatting like friends the priest with his feverish impatience once more referred to the audience which he was to have that evening it was now barely two o'clock and he had seven more hours to wait how should he employ that endless afternoon thereupon benedetta good-naturedly made him a proposal i'll tell you what said she as we are all in such good spirits we mustn't leave one another dario has his victoria you know he must have finished lunch by now and i'll ask him to take us for a long drive along the tiber this fine project so delighted her that she began to clap her hands but just then don vigilio appeared with a scared look on his face isn't the princess here he inquired no my aunt has gone out what is the matter his eminence sent me the prince has just felt unwell on rising from table oh it's nothing nothing serious no doubt benedetta raised a cry of surprise rather than anxiety what dario well we'll all go down come with me monsieur l'abbé he mustn't get ill if he is to take us for a drive then meeting victorine on the stairs she bade her follow dario isn't well she said you may be wanted they all four entered the spacious antiquated and simply furnished bedroom where the young prince had lately been laid up for a whole month it was reached by way of a small salon and from an adjoining dressing room a passage conducted to the cardinal's apartments the relatively small dining room bedroom and study which had been devised by subdividing one of the huge galleries of former days in addition the passage gave access to his eminence's private chapel a bare uncarpeted chairless room where there was nothing beyond the painted wooden altar and the hard cold tiles on which to kneel and pray on entering benedetta hastened to the bed where dario was lying still fully dressed near him in fatherly fashion stood cardinal boccanera who amidst his dawning anxiety retained his proud and lofty bearing the calmness of a soul beyond reproach why what is the matter dario mio asked the young woman he smiled eager to reassure her one only noticed that he was very pale with a look as of intoxication on his face 
oh it's nothing mere giddiness he replied it's just as if i had drunk too much all at once things swam before my eyes and i thought i was going to fall and then i only had time to come and fling myself on the bed then he drew a long breath as though talking exhausted him and the cardinal in his turn gave some details we had just finished our meal said he i was giving don vigilio some orders for this afternoon and was about to rise when i saw dario get up and reel he wouldn't sit down again but came in here staggering like a somnambulist and fumbling at the doors to open them we followed him without understanding and i confess that i don't yet comprehend it so saying the cardinal punctuated his surprise by waving his arm towards the rooms through which a gust of misfortune seemed to have suddenly swept all the doors had remained wide open the dressing-room could be seen and then the passage at the end of which appeared the dining-room in a disorderly state like an apartment suddenly vacated the table still laid the napkins flung here and there and the chairs pushed back as yet however there was no alarm benedetta made the remark which is usually made in such cases i hope you haven't eaten anything which has disagreed with you the cardinal smiling again waved his hand as if to attest the frugality of his table oh said he there were only some eggs some lamb cutlets and a dish of sorrel they couldn't have overloaded his stomach i myself only drink water he takes just a sip of white wine no no the food has nothing to do with it besides in that case his eminence and i would also have felt indisposed don vigilio made bold to remark dario after momentarily closing his eyes opened them again and once more drew a long breath whilst endeavouring to laugh oh it will be nothing he said i feel more at ease already i must get up and stir myself in that case said benedetta this is what i had thought of you will take monsieur l'abbé fromont and me for a long drive in the campagna willingly it's a nice idea victorine help me whilst speaking he had raised himself by means of one arm but before the servant could approach a slight convulsion seized him and he fell back again as if overcome by a fainting fit it was the cardinal still standing by the bedside who caught him in his arms whilst the contesina this time lost her head dio dio it has come on him again quick quick a doctor shall i run for one asked pierre whom the scene was also beginning to upset no no not you stay with me victorine will go at once she knows the address dr giordano victorine the servant hurried away and a heavy silence fell on the room where the anxiety became more pronounced every moment benedetta now quite pale had again approached the bed whilst the cardinal looked down at dario whom he still held in his arms and a terrible suspicion vague indeterminate as yet had just awoke in the old man's mind dario's face seemed to him to be ashen to wear that mask of terrified anguish which he had already remarked on the countenance of his dearest friend monsignor gallo when he had held him in his arms in like manner two hours before his death there was also the same swoon and the same sensation of clasping a cold form whose heart ceases to beat and above everything else there was in bocanera's mind the same growing thought of poison poison coming one knew not whence or how but mysteriously striking down those around him with the suddenness of lightning and for a long time he remained with his head bent over the face of his nephew that last scion of his race seeking studying and recognizing the signs of the mysterious implacable disorder which once already had rent his heart a twain but benedetta addressed him in a low entreating voice you will tire yourself uncle let me take him a little i beg you have no fear i'll hold him very gently he will feel that it is i and perhaps that will rouse him at last the cardinal raised his head and looked at her and allowed her to take his place after kissing her with distracted passion his eyes the while full of tears a sudden burst of emotion in which his great love for the young woman melted the stern frigidity which he usually affected ah oh, my poor child my poor child he stammered trembling from head to foot like an oak tree about to fall immediately afterwards however he mastered himself and whilst pierre and don vigilio mute and motionless regretted that they could be of no help he walked slowly to and fro soon moreover that bedchamber became too small for all the thoughts revolving in his mind and he strayed first into the dressing-room and then down the passage as far as the dining-room and again and again he went to and fro grave and impassable his head low ever lost in the same gloomy reverie what were the multitudinous thoughts stirring in the brain of that believer that haughty prince who had given himself to god and could do naught to stay inevitable destiny 
from time to time he returned to the bedside observed the progress of the disorder and then started off again at the same slow regular pace disappearing and reappearing carried along as it were by the monotonous alternations of forces which man cannot control possibly he was mistaken possibly this was some mere indisposition at which the doctor would smile one must hope and wait and again he went off and again he came back and amidst the heavy silence nothing more clearly bespoke the torture of anxious fear than the rhythmical footsteps of that tall old man who was thus awaiting destiny the door opened and victorine came in breathless i found the doctor here he is she gasped with his little pink face and white curls his discreet paternal bearing which gave him the air of an amiable prelate dr giordano came in smiling but on seeing that room and all the anxious people waiting in it he turned very grave at once assuming the expression of profound respect for all ecclesiastical secrets which he had acquired by long practice amongst the clergy and when he had glanced at the sufferer he let but a low murmur escape him what again is it beginning again he was probably alluding to the knife thrust for which he had recently tendered dario who could be thus relentlessly pursuing that poor and inoffensive young prince however no one heard the doctor unless it were benedetta and she was so full of feverish impatience so eager to be tranquillized that she did not listen but burst into fresh entreaties oh doctor pray look at him examine him tell us that it is nothing it can't be anything serious since he was so well and gay but a little while ago it's nothing serious is it you are right no doubt contesina it can be nothing dangerous we will see however on turning round dr giordano perceived the cardinal who with regular thoughtful footsteps had come back from the dining-room to place himself at the foot of the bed and while bowing the doctor doubtless detected a gleam of mortal anxiety in the dark eyes fixed upon his own for he added nothing but began to examine dario like a man who realizes that time is precious and as his examination progressed the affable optimism which usually appeared upon his countenance gave place to ashen gravity a covert terror which made his lips slightly tremble it was he who had attended monsignor gallo when the latter had been carried off so mysteriously it was he who for imperative reasons had then delivered a certificate stating the cause of death to be infectious fever and doubtless he now found the same terrible symptoms as in that case a leaden hue overspreading the sufferer's features a stupor as of excessive intoxication and old roman practitioner that he was accustomed to sudden deaths he realized that the malaria which kills was passing that malaria which science does not yet fully understand which may come from the putrescent exhalations of the tiber unless it be but a name for the ancient poison of the legends as the doctor raised his head his glance again encountered the black eyes of the cardinal which never left him signor giordano said his eminence you are not over anxious i hope it is only some case of indigestion is it not the doctor again bowed by the slight quiver of the cardinal's voice he understood how acute was the anxiety of that powerful man who once more was stricken in his dearest affections your eminence must be right he said there's a bad digestion certainly such accidents sometimes become dangerous when fever supervenes i need not tell your eminence how thoroughly you may rely on my prudence and zeal then he broke off and added in a clear professional voice we must lose no time the prince must be undressed i should prefer to remain alone with him for a moment whilst speaking in this way however dr giordano detained victorine who would be able to help him said he should he need any further assistance he would take giacomo his evident desire was to get rid of the members of the family in order that he might have more freedom of action and the cardinal who understood him gently led benedetta into the dining-room with a pierre and don vigilio followed when the doors had been closed the most mournful and oppressive silence reigned in that dining-room which the bright sun of winter filled with such delightful warmth and radiance the table was still laid its cloth strewn here and there with bread-crumbs and a coffee-cup had remained half full in the centre stood the basket of figs whose covering of leaves had been removed however only two or three of the figs were missing and in front of the window was tata the female parrot who had flown out of her cage and perched herself on her stand where she remained dazzled and enraptured amidst the dancing dust of a broad yellow sunray in her astonishment however at seeing so many people enter she had ceased to scream and smooth her feathers and had turned her head the better to examine the newcomers with her round and scrutinizing eye 
the minutes went by slowly amidst all the feverish anxiety as to what might be occurring in the neighbouring room don vigilio had taken a corner seat in silence whilst benedetta and pierre who had remained standing preserved similar muteness and immobility but the cardinal had reverted to that instinctive lulling tramp by which he apparently hoped to quiet his impatience and arrive the sooner at the explanation for which he was groping through a tumultuous maze of ideas and whilst his rhythmical footsteps resounded with mechanical regularity dark fury was taking possession of his mind exasperation at being unable to understand the why and wherefore of that sickness as he passed the table he had twice glanced at the things lying on it in confusion as if seeking some explanation from them perhaps the harm had been done by that unfinished coffee or by that bread whose crumbs lay here and there or by those cutlets a bone of which remained then as for the third time he passed by again glancing his eyes fell upon the basket of figs and at once he stopped as if beneath the shock of a revelation an idea seized upon him and mastered him without any plan however occurring to him by which he might change his sudden suspicion into certainty for a moment he remained puzzled with his eyes fixed upon the basket then he took a fig and examined it but noticing nothing strange was about to put it back when tata the parrot who was very fond of figs raised a strident cry and this was like a ray of light the means of changing suspicion into certainty was found slowly with grave air and gloomy visage the cardinal carried the fig to the parrot and gave it to her without hesitation or regret she was a very pretty bird the only being of the lower order of creation to which he had ever really been attached stretching out her supple delicate form whose silken feathers of dull green here and there assumed a pinky tinge in the sunlight she took hold of the fig with her claws then ripped it open with her beak but when she had raked it she ate but little and let all the rest fall upon the floor still grave and impassable the cardinal looked at her and waited quite three minutes went by and then feeling reassured he began to scratch the bird's pole whilst she taking pleasure in the caress turned her neck and fixed her bright ruby eye upon her master but all at once she sank back without even a flap of the wings and fell like a bullet she was dead killed as by a thunderbolt Bocanera made but a gesture raising both hands to heaven as if in horror at what he now knew great god such a terrible crime and such a fearful mistake such an abominable trick of destiny no cry of grief came from him but the gloom upon his face grew black and fierce yet there was a cry a piercing cry from benedetta who like pierre and don vigilio had watched the cardinal with an astonishment which had changed into terror poison poison ah oh, dario my heart my soul but the cardinal violently caught his niece by the wrist whilst darting a suspicious glance at the two petty priests the secretary and the foreigner who were present be quiet be quiet said he she shook herself free rebelling frantic with rage and hatred why should i be quiet she cried it is prada's work i shall denounce him he shall die as well i tell you it is prada i know it for yesterday abbe fromont came back with him from frascati in his carriage with that priest santo bono and that basket of figs yes yes i have witnesses it is prada prada no no you are mad be quiet said the cardinal who had again taken hold of the young woman's hands and sought to master her with all his sovereign authority he who knew the influence which cardinal sanguinetti exercised over santo bono's excitable mind had just understood the whole affair no direct complicity but covert propulsion the animal excited and then let loose upon the troublesome rival at the moment when the pontifical throne seemed likely to be vacant the probability the certainty of all this flashed upon bocanera who though some points remained obscure did not seek to penetrate them it was not necessary indeed that he should know every particular the thing was as he said since it was bound to be so no no it was not prada he exclaimed addressing benedetta that man can bear me no personal grudge and i alone was aimed at it was to me that those figs were given come think it out only an unforeseen indisposition prevented me from eating the greater part of the fruit for it is known that i am very fond of figs and while my poor dario was tasting them i jested and told him to leave the finer ones for me to-morrow yes the abominable blow was meant for me and it is on him that it has fallen by the most atrocious of chances the most monstrous of the follies of fate ah lord god lord god have you then forsaken us 
tears came into the old man's eyes whilst she still quivered and seemed unconvinced but you have no enemies uncle she said why should that santo bono try to take your life for a moment he found no fitting reply with supreme grandeur he had already resolved to keep the truth secret then a recollection came to him and he resigned himself to the telling of a lie santo bono's mind has always been somewhat unhinged said he and i know that he has hated me ever since i refused to help him get a brother of his one of our former gardeners out of prison deadly spite often has no more serious cause he must have thought that he had reason to be revenged on me thereupon benedetta exhausted unable to argue any further sank upon a chair with a despairing gesture ah oh, god god i no longer know and what matters it now that my dario is in such danger there's only one thing to be done he must be saved how long they are over what they are doing in that room why does not victorine come for us the silence again fell full of terror Without speaking, the cardinal took the basket of figs from the table and carried it to a cupboard in which he locked it. Then he put the key in his pocket. No doubt when night had fallen, he himself would throw the proofs of the crime into the Tiber. However, on coming back from the cupboard, he noticed the two priests, who naturally had watched him, and with mingled grandeur and simplicity he said to them, Gentlemen, I need not ask you to be discreet. There are scandals which we must spare the church, which is not, cannot be guilty to deliver one of ourselves even when he is a criminal to the civil tribunals often means a blow for the whole church for men of evil mind may lay hold of the affair and seek to impute the responsibility of the crime even to the church itself we therefore have but to commit the murderer to the hands of god who will know more surely how to punish him ah for my part whether i be struck in my own person or whether the blow be directed against my family my dearest affections I declare in the name of the Christ who died upon the cross that I feel neither anger nor desire for vengeance, that I efface the murderer's name from my memory and bury his abominable act in the eternal silence of the grave. End of section 25。section 26 of Rome。this is a LibriVox recording。All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Rome by Emil Zola, translated by Ernest Visitelli. Chapter 13, Part 2 Tall as he was, he seemed of yet loftier stature, whilst with hand upraised he took that oath to leave his enemies to the justice of God alone. For he did not refer merely to Santo Bono, but to Cardinal Sanguinetti, whose evil influence he had divined and amidst all the heroism of his pride he was rent by tragic dolor at the thought of the dark battle which was waged around the tiara all the evil hatred and voracious appetite which stirred in the depths of the gloom then as pierre and don vigilio bowed to him as a sign that they would preserve silence he almost choked with invincible emotion a sob of loving grief which he strove to keep down rising to his throat whilst he stammered ah oh, my poor child my poor child the only scion of our race the only love and hope of my heart ah to die to die like this but benedetta again all violence sprang up die who dario i won't have it we'll nurse him we'll go back to him we will take him in our arms and save him come uncle come at once i won't i won't i won't have him die she was going towards the door and nothing would have prevented her from re-entering the bedroom when as it happened victorine appeared with a wild look on her face for despite her wonted serenity all her courage was now exhausted the doctor begs madame and his eminence to come at once at once said she stupefied by all these things pierre did not follow the others but lingered for a moment in the sunlit dining-room with don vigilio what poison poison as in the time of the borgias elegantly hidden away served up with luscious fruit by a crafty traitor whom one dared not even denounce and he recalled the conversation on his way back from frascati and his parisian scepticism with respect to those legendary drugs which to his mind had no place save in the fifth acts of melodramas yet those abominable stories were true those tales of poisoned knives and flowers of prelates and even dilatory popes being suppressed by a drop or a grain of something administered to them in their morning chocolate 
that passionate tragical santa bona was really a poisoner pierre could no longer doubt it for a lurid light now illumined the whole of the previous day there were the words of ambition and menace which had been spoken by cardinal sanguinetti the eagerness to act in presence of the probable death of the reigning pope the suggestion of a crime for the sake of the church's salvation then that priest with his little basket of figs encountered on the road then that basket carried for hours so carefully so devoutly on the priest's knees that basket which now haunted pierre like a nightmare and whose colour and odour and shape he would ever recall with a shudder ay poison poison there was truth in it it existed and still circulated in the depths of the black world amidst all the ravenous rival longings for conquest and sovereignty and all at once the figure of prada likewise arose in pierre's mind a little while previously when benedetta had so violently accused the count he pierre had stepped forward to defend him and cry aloud what he knew whence the poison had come and what hand had offered it but a sudden thought had made him shiver though prada had not devised the crime he had allowed it to be perpetrated another memory darted keen like steel through the young priest's mind that of the little black hen lying lifeless beside the shed amidst the dismal surroundings of the osteria with a tiny streamlet of violet blood trickling from her beak and here again tata the parrot lay still soft and warm at the foot of her stand with her beak stained by oozing blood why had prada told that lie about a battle between two fowls all the dim intricacy of passion and contention bewildered pierre he could not thread his way through it nor was he better able to follow the frightful combat which must have been waged in that man's mind during the night of the ball at the same time he could not again picture him by his side during their nocturnal walk towards the bocanera mansion without shuddering dimly divining what a frightful decision had been taken before that mansion's door moreover whatever the obscurities whether prada had expected that the cardinal alone would be killed or had hoped that some chance stroke of fate might avenge him on others the terrible fact remained he had known he had been able to stay destiny on the march but had allowed it to go onward and blindly accomplish its work of death turning his head pierre perceived don vigilio still seated on the corner chair whence he had not stirred and looking so pale and haggard that perhaps he also had swallowed some of the poison do you feel unwell the young priest asked at first the secretary could not reply for terror had gripped him at the throat then in a low voice he said no no i didn't eat any ah oh, heaven when i think that i so much wanted to taste them and that merely deference kept me back on seeing that his eminence did not take any don vigilio's whole body shivered at the thought that his humility alone had saved him and on his face and his hands there remained the icy chill of death which had fallen so near and grazed him as it passed then twice he heaved a sigh and with a gesture of affright sought to brush the horrid thing away while murmuring ah paparelli paparelli pierre deeply stirred and knowing what he thought of the train-bearer tried to extract some information from him what do you mean he asked do you accuse him too do you think they urged him on and that it was they at bottom the word jesuits was not even spoken but a big black shadow passed athwart the gay sunlight of the dining-room and for a moment seemed to fill it with darkness they ah yes exclaimed don vigilio they are everywhere it is always they as soon as one weeps as soon as one dies they are mixed up in it and this was intended for me too i am quite surprised that i haven't been carried off then again he raised a dull moan of fear hatred and anger ah paparelli paparelli and he refused to reply any further but darted scared glances at the walls as if from one or another of them he expected to see the train-bearer emerge with his wrinkled flabby face like that of an old maid his furtive mouse-like trot and his mysterious invading hands which had gone expressly to bring the forgotten figs from the pantry and deposit them on the table at last the two priests decided to return to the bedroom where perhaps they might be required and pierre on entering was overcome by the heart-rending scene which the chamber now presented dr giordano suspecting poison had for half an hour been trying the usual remedies an emetic and then magnesia just then too he had made victorine whip some whites of eggs in water but the disorder was progressing with such lightning-like rapidity that all succour was becoming futile undressed and lying on his back 
his bust propped up by pillows and his arms lying outstretched over the sheets dario looked quite frightful in the sort of painful intoxication which characterized that redoubtable and mysterious disorder to which already monsignor gallo and others had succumbed the young man seemed to be stricken with a sort of dizzy stupor his eyes receded farther and farther into the depths of their dark sockets whilst his whole face became withered aged as it were and covered with an earthy pallor a moment previously he had closed his eyes and the only sign that he still lived was the heaving of his chest induced by painful respiration and leaning over his poor dying face stood benedetta sharing his sufferings and mastered by such impotent grief that she also was unrecognizable so white so distracted by anguish that it seemed as if death were gradually taking her at the same time as it was taking him in the recess by the window where the cardinal bocanera had led dr giordano a few words were exchanged in low tones he is lost is he not the doctor made the despairing gesture of one who is vanquished alas yes i must warn your eminence that in an hour all will be over a short interval of silence followed and the same malady as gallo is it not asked the cardinal and as the doctor trembling and averting his eyes did not answer he added at all events of an infectious fever giordano well understood what the cardinal thus asked of him silence the crime forever hidden away for sake of the good renown of his mother the church and there could be no loftier no more tragical grandeur than that of this old man of seventy still so erect and sovereign who would neither suffer a slur to be cast upon his spiritual family nor consent to his human family being dragged into the inevitable mire of a sensational murder trial no no there must be none of that there must be silence the eternal silence in which all becomes forgotten at last the doctor bowed with his gentle air of discretion evidently of an infectious fever as your eminence so well says he replied two big tears then again appeared in bocanera's eyes now that he had screened the deity from attack in the person of the church his heart as a man again bled he begged the doctor to make a supreme effort to attempt the impossible but pointing to the dying man with trembling hands giordano shook his head for his own father his own mother he could have done nothing death was there so why weary why torture a dying man whose sufferings he would only have increased and then as the cardinal finding the end so near at hand thought of his sister seraphina and lamented that she would not be able to kiss her nephew for the last time if she lingered at the vatican the doctor offered to fetch her in his carriage which was waiting below it would not take him more than twenty minutes said he and he would be back in time for the end should he then be needed left to himself in the window recess the cardinal remained there motionless for another moment with eyes blurred by tears he gazed towards heaven and his quivering arms were suddenly raised in a gesture of ardent entreaty o oh god since the science of man was so limited and vain since that doctor had gone off happy to escape the embarrassment of his impotence o oh god why not a miracle which should proclaim the splendour of thy almighty power a miracle a miracle that was what the cardinal asked from the depths of his believing soul with the insistence the imperious entreaty of a prince of the earth who deemed that he had rendered considerable services to heaven by dedicating his whole life to the church and he asked for that miracle in order that his race might be perpetuated in order that its last male scion might not thus miserably perish but be able to marry that fondly loved cousin who now stood there all woe and tears a miracle a miracle for the sake of those two dear children a miracle which would endow the family with fresh life a miracle which would eternize the glorious name of bocanera by enabling an innumerable posterity of valiant ones and faithful ones to spring from that young couple when the cardinal returned to the centre of the room he seemed transfigured faith had dried his eyes his soul had become strong and submissive exempt from all human weakness he had placed himself in the hands of god and had resolved that he himself would administer extreme unction to dario with a gesture he summoned don vigilio and led him into the little room which served as a chapel and the key of which he always carried a cupboard had been contrived behind the altar of painted wood and the cardinal went to it to take both stole and surplice the coffer containing the holy oils was likewise there a very ancient silver coffer bearing the bocanera arms 
and on don vigilio following the cardinal back into the bedroom they in turn pronounced the latin words pax huic domui et omnibus habitantibus in ea death was coming so fast and threatening that all the usual preparations were perforce dispensed with neither the two lighted tapers nor the little table covered with white cloth had been provided and in the same way don vigilio the assistant having failed to bring the holy water basin and sprinkler the cardinal as officiating priest could merely make the gesture of blessing the room and the dying man whilst pronouncing the words of the ritual asperges me domine hisopo et mundabor lavabis me et supernivem de albabor benedetta on seeing the cardinal appear carrying the holy oils had with a long quiver fallen on her knees at the foot of the bed whilst somewhat farther away pierre and victorine likewise knelt overcome by the dolorous grandeur of the scene and the dilated eyes of the contesina whose face was pale as snow never quitted her dario whom she no longer recognized so earthy was his face its skin tanned and wrinkled like that of an old man and it was not for their marriage which he so much desired that their uncle the all-powerful prince of the church was bringing the sacrament but for the supreme rupture the end of all pride death which finishes off the haughtiest races and sweeps them away even as the wind sweeps the dust of the roads it was needful that there should be no delay so the cardinal promptly repeated the credo in an undertone credo in unum deum amen responded don vigilio who after the prayers of the ritual stammered the litanies in order that heaven might take pity on the wretched man who was about to appear before god if god by a prodigy did not spare him then without taking time to wash his fingers the cardinal opened the case containing the holy oils and limiting himself to one anointment as is permissible in pressing cases he deposited a single drop of the oil on dario's parched mouth which was already withered by death and in doing so he repeated the words of the formula his heart all aglow with faith as he asked that the divine mercy might efface each and every sin that the young man had committed by either of his five senses those five portals by which everlasting temptation assails the soul and the cardinal's fervour was also instinct with the hope that if god had smitten the poor sufferer for his offences perhaps he would make his indulgence entire and even restore him to life as soon as he should have forgiven his sins life o oh lord life in order that the ancient line of the bocaneras might yet multiply and continue to serve thee in battle and at the altar until the end of time for a moment the cardinal remained with quivering hands gazing at the mute face the closed eyes of the dying man and waiting for the miracle but no sign appeared not the faintest glimmer brightened that haggard countenance nor did a sigh of relief come from the withered lips as don vigilio wiped them with a little cotton wool and the last prayer was said and whilst the frightful silence fell once more the cardinal followed by his assistant returned to the chapel there they both knelt the cardinal plunging into ardent prayer upon the bare tiles with his eyes raised to the brass crucifix upon the altar he saw nothing heard nothing but gave himself wholly to his entreaties supplicating god to take him in place of his nephew if a sacrifice were necessary and yet clinging to the hope that so long as dario retained a breath of life and he himself thus remained on his knees addressing the deity he might succeed in pacifying the wrath of heaven he was both so humble and so great would not accord surely be established between god and a bocanera the old palace might have fallen to the ground he himself would not even have felt the toppling of its beams in the bedroom however nothing had yet stirred beneath the weight of the tragic majesty which the ceremony had left there it was only now that dario raised his eyelids and when on looking at his hands he saw them so aged and wasted the depths of his eyes kindled with an expression of immense regretfulness that life should be departing doubtless it was at this moment of lucidity amidst the kind of intoxication with which the poison overwhelmed him that he for the first time realized his perilous condition ah to die amidst such pain such physical degradation what a revolting horror for that frivolous and egotistical man that lover of beauty joy and light who knew not how to suffer in him ferocious fate chastised racial degeneracy with too heavy a hand he became horrified with himself seized with childish despair and terror which lent him strength enough to sit up and gaze wildly about the room in order to see if everyone had not abandoned him 
and when his eyes lighted on benedetta still kneeling at the foot of the bed a supreme impulse carried him towards her he stretched forth both arms as passionately as his strength allowed and stammered her name oh benedetta benedetta she motionless in the stupor of her anxiety had not taken her eyes from his face the horrible disorder which was carrying off her lover seemed also to possess and annihilate her more and more even as he himself grew weaker and weaker her features were assuming an immaterial whiteness and through the void of her clear eyeballs one began to espy her soul however when she perceived him thus resuscitating and calling her with arms outstretched she in her turn arose and standing beside the bed made answer i am coming my dario here i am and then pierre and victorine still on their knees beheld a sublime deed of such extraordinary grandeur that they remained rooted to the floor spellbound as in the presence of some supraterrestrial spectacle in which human beings may not intervene benedetta herself spoke and acted like one freed from all social and conventional ties already beyond life only seeing and addressing beings and things from a great distance from the depths of the unknown in which she was about to disappear ah my dario so an attempt has been made to part us it was in order that i might never belong to you that we might never be happy that your death was resolved upon and it was known that with your life my own must cease and it is that man who is killing you yes he is your murderer even if the actual blow has been dealt by another he is the first cause he who stole me from you when i was about to become yours he who ravaged our lives and who breathed around us the hateful poison which is killing us ah how i hate him how i hate him how i should like to crush him with my hate before i die with you she did not raise her voice but spoke those terrible words in a deep murmur simply and passionately prada was not even named and she scarcely turned towards pierre who knelt paralyzed behind her to add with a commanding air you who will see his father i charge you to tell him that i cursed his son that kind-hearted hero loved me well i love him even now and the words you will carry to him from me will rend his heart but i desire that he should know he must know for the sake of truth and justice distracted by terror sobbing amidst a last convulsion dario again stretched forth his arms feeling that she was no longer looking at him that her clear eyes were no longer fixed upon his own benedetta benedetta i am coming i am coming my dario i am here she responded drawing yet nearer to the bedside and almost touching him ah oh, she went on that vow which i made to the madonna to belong to none not even you until god should allow it by the blessing of one of his priests ah i set a noble a divine pride in remaining immaculate for him who should be the one master of my soul and body and that chastity which i was so proud of i defended it against the other as one defends oneself against a wolf and i defended it against you with tears for fear of sacrilege and if you only knew what terrible struggles i was forced to wage with myself for i loved you and longed to be yours like a woman who accepts the whole of love the love that makes wife and mother ah my vow to the madonna with what difficulty did i keep it when the old blood of our race arose in me like a tempest and now what a disaster she drew yet nearer and her low voice became more ardent you remember that evening when you came back with a knife thrust in your shoulder i thought you dead and cried aloud with rage at the idea of losing you like that i insulted the madonna and regretted that i had not damned myself with you that we might die together so tightly clasped that we must needs be buried together also and to think that such a terrible warning was of no avail i was blind and foolish and now you are again stricken again being taken from my love ah oh, my wretched pride my idiotic dream that which now rang out in her stifled voice was the anger of the practical woman that she had ever been all superstition notwithstanding could the madonna who was so maternal desire the woe of lovers no assuredly not nor did the angels make the mere absence of a priest a cause for weeping over the transports of true and mutual love was not such love holy in itself and did not the angels rather smile upon it and burst into gladsome song and ah how one cheated oneself by not loving to heart's content under the sun when the blood of life coursed through one's veins benedetta benedetta repeated the dying man full of childlike terror at thus going off all alone into the depths of the black and everlasting night here i am my dario i am coming 
then as she fancied that the servant albeit motionless had stirred as if to rise and interfere she added leave me leave me victorine nothing in the world can henceforth prevent it a moment ago when i was on my knees something roused me and urged me on i know whither i am going and besides did i not swear on the night of the knife thrust did i not promise to belong to him alone even in the earth if it were necessary i must embrace him and he will carry me away we shall be dead and we shall be wedded in spite of all and for ever and for ever she stepped back to the dying man and touched him here i am my dario here i am then came the apogee amidst growing exultation buoyed up by a blaze of love careless of glances candid like a lily she divested herself of her garments and stood forth so white that neither marble statue nor dove nor snow itself was ever whiter here i am my dario here i am recoiling almost to the ground as at the sight of an apparition the glorious flash of a holy vision pierre and victorine gazed at her with dazzled eyes the servant had not stirred to prevent this extraordinary action seized as she was with that shrinking reverential terror which comes upon one in presence of the wild mad deeds of faith and passion and the priest whose limbs were paralyzed felt that something so sublime was passing that he could only quiver in distraction and no thought of impurity came to him on beholding that lily snowy whiteness all candour and all nobility as she was that virgin shocked him no more than some sculptured masterpiece of genius here i am my dario here i am she had lain herself down beside the spouse whom she had chosen she had clasped the dying man whose arms only had enough strength left to fold themselves around her death was stealing him from her but she would go with him and again she murmured my dario here i am and at that moment against the wall at the head of the bed pierre perceived the escutcheon of the bocaneras embroidered in gold and coloured silks on a groundwork of violet velvet there was the winged dragon belching flames there was the fierce and glowing motto bocanera alma rosa black mouth red soul the mouth darkened by a roar the soul flaming like a brazier of faith and love and behold all that old race of passion and violence with its tragic legends had reappeared its blood bubbling up afresh to urge that last and adorable daughter of the line to those terrifying and prodigious nuptials in death and to pierre that escutcheon recalled another memory that of the portrait of cassia bocconera the amorosa and avengeress who had flung herself into the tiber with her brother ercole and the corpse of her lover flavio was there not here even with benedetta the same despairing clasp seeking to vanquish death the same savagery in hurling oneself into the abyss with the corpse of the one's only love benedetta and cassia were as sisters cassia who lived anew in the old painting in the salon overhead benedetta who was here dying of her lover's death as though she were but the other's spirit both had the same delicate childish features the same mouth of passion the same large dreamy eyes set in the same round practical and stubborn head my dario here i am for a second which seemed an eternity they clasped one another she neither repelled nor terrified by the disorder which made him so unrecognizable but displaying a delirious passion a holy frenzy as if to pass beyond life to penetrate with him into the black unknown and beneath the shock of the felicity at last offered to him he expired with his arms yet convulsively wound around her as though indeed to carry her off then whether from grief or from bliss amidst that embrace of death there came such a rush of blood to her heart that the organ burst she died on her lover's neck both tightly and forever clasped in one another's arms there was a faint sigh victorine understood and drew near while pierre also erect remained quivering with the tearful admiration of one who has beheld the sublime look look whispered the servant she no longer moves she no longer breathes ah oh, my poor child my poor child she is dead then the priest murmured oh god how beautiful they are it was true never had loftier and more resplendent beauty appeared on the faces of the dead dario's countenance so lately aged and earthen had assumed the pallor and nobility of marble its features lengthened and simplified as by a transport of ineffable joy benedetta remained very grave her lips curved by ardent determination whilst her whole face was expressive of dolorous yet infinite beatitude in a setting of infinite whiteness 
their hair mingled and their eyes which had remained open continued gazing as into one another's souls with eternal caressing sweetness they were forever linked soaring into immortality amidst the enchantment of their union vanquishers of death radiant with the rapturous beauty of love the conqueror the immortal but victorine's sobs at last burst forth mingled with such lamentations that great confusion followed pierre now quite beside himself in some measure failed to understand how it was that the room suddenly became invaded by terrified people the cardinal and don vigilio however must have hastened in from the chapel and at the same moment no doubt dr giordano must have returned with donna serafina for both were now there she stupefied by the blows which had thus fallen on the house in her absence whilst he the doctor displayed the perturbation and astonishment which comes upon the oldest practitioners when facts seem to give the lie to their experience however he sought an explanation of benedetta's death and hesitatingly ascribed it to aneurysm or possibly embolism thereupon victorine like a servant whose grief makes her the equal of her employers boldly interrupted him ah sir said she they loved each other too fondly did not that suffice for them to die together meantime donna serafina after kissing the poor children on the brow desired to close their eyes but she could not succeed in doing so for the lids lifted directly she removed her finger and once more the eyes began to smile at one another to exchange in all fixity their loving and eternal glance and then as she spoke of parting the bodies victorine again protested oh madame oh madame she said you would have to break their arms cannot you see that their fingers are almost dug into one another's shoulders no they can never be parted thereupon cardinal boccanera intervened god had not granted the miracle and he his minister was livid tearless and full of icy despair but he waved his arm with a sovereign gesture of absolution and sanctification as if prince of the church that he was disposing of the will of heaven he consented that the lovers should appear in that embrace before the supreme tribunal in presence of such wondrous love indeed profoundly stirred by the sufferings of their lives and the beauty of their death he showed a broad and lofty contempt for mundane proprieties leave them leave me my sister said he do not disturb their slumber let their eyes remain open since they desire to gaze on one another till the end of time without ever wearying and let them sleep in one another's arms since in their lives they did not sin and only locked themselves in that embrace in order that they might be laid together in the ground and then again becoming a roman prince whose proud blood was yet hot with old-time deeds of battle and passion he added two bocconeras may well sleep like that all rome will admire them and weep for them leave them leave them together my sister god knows them and awaits them all knelt and the cardinal himself repeated the prayers for the dead night was coming increasing gloom stole into the chamber where two burning tapers soon shone out like stars and then without knowing how pierre again found himself in the little deserted garden on the bank of the tiber suffocating with fatigue and grief he must have come thither for fresh air darkness shrouded the charming nook where the streamlet of water falling from the tragic mask into the ancient sarcophagus ever sang its shrill and flute-like note and the laurel bush which shaded it and the bitter box plants and the orange trees skirting the paths now formed but vague masses under the blue-black sky ah how gay and sweet had that melancholy garden been in the morning and what a desolate echo it retained of benedetta's winsome laughter all that fine delight in coming happiness which now lay prone upstairs steeped in the nothingness of things and beings so dolorous was the pang which came to pierre's heart that he burst into sobs seated on the same broken column where she had sat and encompassed by the same atmosphere that she had breathed in which still lingered the perfume of her presence but all at once a distant clock struck six and the young priest started on remembering that he was to be received by the pope that very evening at nine yet three more hours he had not thought of that interview during the terrifying catastrophe and it seemed to him now as if months and months had gone by as if the appointment were some very old one which a man is only able to keep after years of absence when he has grown aged and had his heart and brain modified by innumerable experiences however he made an effort and rose to his feet in three hours time he would go to the vatican and at last he would see the pope end of section twenty six
Section 27 of Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, contact LibriVox.org. Rome by Emil Zola. Translated by Ernest Visitelli. Chapter 14, Part 1. That evening, when Pierre emerged from the Borgo in front of the Vatican, a sonorous stroke rang out from the clock amidst the deep silence of the dark and sleepy district. It was only half past eight, and being in advance, the young priest resolved to wait some twenty minutes in order to reach the doors of the papal apartments precisely at nine, the hour fixed for his audience. This respite brought him some relief amidst the infinite emotion and grief which gripped his heart. That tragic afternoon which he had spent in the chamber of death, where Dario and Benedetta now slept the eternal sleep in one another's arms, had left him very weary. He was haunted by a wild, dolorous vision of the two lovers, and involuntary sighs came from his lips whilst tears continually moistened his eyes. He had been altogether unable to eat that evening. Ah, how he would have liked to hide himself and weep at his ease! His heart melted at each fresh thought. The pitiful death of the lovers intensified the grievous feeling with which his book was instinct, and impelled him to yet greater compassion a perfect anguish of charity for all who suffered in the world and he was so distracted by the thought of the many physical and moral sores of paris and of rome where he had beheld so much unjust and abominable suffering that at each step he took he feared lest he should burst into sobs with arms upstretched towards the blackness of heaven in the hope of somewhat calming himself he began to walk slowly across the piazza of st peter's now all darkness and solitude on arriving he had fancied that he was losing himself in a murky sea but by degrees his eyes grew accustomed to the dimness the vast expanse was only lighted by the four candelabra at the corners of the obelisk and by infrequent lamps skirting the buildings which run on either hand towards the basilica under the colonnade too other lamps threw yellow gleams across the forest of pillars showing up their stone trunks in fantastic fashion while on the piazza only the pale, ghostly obelisk was at all distinctly visible. Pierre could scarcely perceive the dim, silent façade of St. Peter's. Whilst of the dome he merely divined a gigantic, bluey roundness faintly shadowed against the sky. In the obscurity he at first heard the plashing of the fountains without being at all able to see them, but on approaching he at last distinguished the slender phantoms of the ever-rising jets which fell again in spray and above the vast square stretched the vast and moonless sky of a deep and velvety blue, where the stars were large and radiant like carbuncles. Charles's wain, with golden wheels and golden shaft, tilted back, as it were, over the roof of the Vatican, and Orion, bedizened with the three bright stars of his belt, showing magnificently above Rome, in the direction of the Via Giulia. At last Pierre raised his eyes to the Vatican, but facing the piazza there was here merely a confused jumble of walls, amidst which only two gleams of light appeared on the floor of the papal apartments. The court of San Damaso was, of course, lighted, for the conservatory-like glasswork of two of its sides sparkled as with the reflection of gas lamps which could not be seen. For a time there was not a sound or sign of movement, but at last two persons crossed the expanse of the piazza, and then came a third who in his turn disappeared, nothing remaining but a rhythmical faraway echo of steps. The spot was indeed a perfect desert. There were neither promenaders nor passers-by, nor was there even the shadow of a prowler in the pillared forest of the colonnade, which was as empty as the wild primeval forests of the world's infancy. And what a solemn desert it was, full of the silence of haughty desolation. Never had so vast and black a presentment of slumber, so instinct with the sovereign nobility of death, appeared to Pierre. At ten minutes to nine he at last made up his mind and went towards the bronze portal. Only one of the folding doors was now open at the end of the right-hand porticus, where the increasing density of the gloom steeped everything in night. Pierre remembered the instructions which Monsignor Nani had given him. At each door that he reached he was to ask for Signor Squadra without adding a word, and thereupon each door would open and he would have nothing to do but to let himself be guided on. No one but the prelate now knew that he was there, since Benedetta, the only being to whom he had confided the secret, was dead. When he had crossed the threshold of the bronze doors and found himself in presence of the motionless sleeping Swiss guard, who was on duty there, he simply spoke the words agreed upon, 
Signor Squadra. And as the guard did not stir, did not seek to bar his way, he passed on, turning into the vestibule of the Scala Pia, the stone stairway which ascends to the court of San Damaso. And not a soul was to be seen. There was but the faint sound of his own light footsteps and the sleepy glow of the gas jets, whose light was softly whitened by globes of frosted glass. Up above, on reaching the courtyard, he found it a solitude, whose slumber seemed sepulchral amidst the mournful gleams of the gas-lamps which cast a pallid reflection on the lofty glasswork of the façades. And feeling somewhat nervous, affected by the quiver which pervaded all that void and silence, Pierre hastened on, turning to the right, towards the low flight of steps which leads to the staircase of the Pope's private apartments. Here stood a superb gendarme in full uniform. Signor Squadra, said Pierre, and without a word the gendarme pointed to the stairs. The young man went up. It was a broad stairway with low steps, balustrade of white marble, and walls covered with yellowish stucco. The gas, burning in globes of ground glass, seemed to have been already turned down in a spirit of prudent economy, and in the glimmering light nothing could have been more mournfully solemn than that cold and pallid staircase. On each landing there was a Swiss guard, halberd in hand, and in the heavy slumber spreading through the palace one only heard the regular monotonous footsteps of these men, ever marching up and down, in order no doubt that they might not succumb to the benumbing influence of their surroundings. Amidst the invading dimness and the quivering silence, the ascent of the stairs seemed interminable to Pierre, who by the time he reached the second-floor landing imagined that he had been climbing for ages. There, outside the glass door of the Sala Clementina, only the right-hand half of which was open, a last Swiss guard stood watching. Signor Squadra, Pierre said again, and the guard drew back to let him pass. The Sala Clementina, spacious enough by daylight, seemed immense at that nocturnal hour, in the twilight glimmer of its lamps. All the opulent decorative work, sculpture, painting and gilding became blended, the walls assuming a tawny vagueness amidst which appeared bright patches like the sparkle of precious stones. There was not an article of furniture, nothing but the endless pavement stretching away into the semi-darkness. At last, however, near a door at the far end, Pierre espied some men dozing on a bench. There were three Swiss guards. Signor Squadra, he said to them. One of the guards thereupon slowly rose and left the hall, and Pierre understood that he was to wait. He did not dare to move, disturbed as he was by the sound of his own footsteps on the paved floor, so he contented himself with gazing around and picturing the crowds which at times peopled that vast apartment, the first of the many papal antechambers. But before long the guard returned, and behind him, on the threshold of the adjoining room, appeared a man of forty or thereabouts, who was clad in black from head to foot, and suggested a cross between a butler and a beadle. He had a good-looking, clean-shaven face, with somewhat pronounced nose and large, clear, fixed eyes. Signor Squadra, said Pierre for the last time. The man bowed as if to say that he was Signor Squadra, and then, with a fresh reverence, he invited the priest to follow him. Thereupon, at a leisurely step, one behind the other, they began to thread the interminable suite of waiting rooms. Pierre, who was acquainted with the ceremonial of which he had often spoken with Narcisse, recognized the different apartments as he passed through them, recalling their names and purpose, and peopling them in imagination with the various officials of the papal retinue who have the right to occupy them. These, according to their rank, cannot go beyond certain doors so that the persons who are to have audience of the Pope are passed on from the servants to the noble guards, from the noble guards to the honorary camerieri, and from the latter to the camerieri segreti, until they at last reach the presence of the Holy Father. At eight o'clock, however, the anterooms empty and become both deserted and dim, only a few lamps being left alight upon the pier tables standing here and there against the walls. And first Pierre came to the anteroom of the Bussolanti, Mere ushers, clad in red velvet broidered with the papal arms, who conduct visitors to the door of the anteroom of honour. At that late hour only one of them was left there, seated on a bench in such a dark corner that his purple tunic looked quite black. Then the hall of the gendarmes was crossed, where according to the regulations the secretaries of cardinals and other high personages await their master's return. And this was now completely empty, void both of the handsome blue uniforms with white shoulder belts 
and the cassocks of fine black cloth which mingled in it during the brilliant reception hours empty also was the following room a smaller one reserved to the palatine guards who are recruited among the roman middle class and wear black tunics with gold epaulettes and charcos surmounted by red plumes then pierre and his guide turned into another series of apartments and again was the first one empty this was the hall of the arras a superb waiting-room with lofty painted ceiling and admirable gobelins tapestry designed by audran and representing the miracles of jesus and empty also was the antechamber of the noble guards which followed with its wooden stools its pier table on the right hand surmounted by a large crucifix standing between two lamps and its large door opening at the far end into another but smaller room a sort of alcove indeed where there is an altar at which the holy father says mass by himself whilst those privileged to be present remain kneeling on the marble slabs of the outer apartment which is resplendent with the dazzling uniforms of the guards and empty likewise was the ensuing ante-room of honour otherwise the grand throne room where the pope receives two or three hundred people at a time in public audience the throne an armchair of elaborate pattern gilded and upholstered with red velvet stands under a velvet canopy of the same hue in front of the windows beside it is the cushion on which the pope rests his foot in order that it may be kissed then facing one another right and left of the room there are two pier tables on one of which is a clock and on the other a crucifix between lofty candelabra with feet of gilded wood the wall hangings of red silk damask with a louis the fourteenth palm pattern are topped by a pompous frieze framing a ceiling decorated with allegorical figures and attributes and it is only just in front of the throne that a smyrna carpet covers the magnificent marble pavement on the days of private audience when the pope remains in the little throne room or at times in his bedchamber the grand throne room becomes simply the ante-room of honour where high dignitaries of the church ambassadors and great civilian personages wait their turns two camerieri one in violet coat the other of the cape and the sword here do duty receiving from the busolanti the persons who are to be honoured with audiences and conducting them to the door of the next room the secret or private antechamber where they hand them over to the camerieri segreti signor squadra who walking on with slow and silent steps had not yet once turned round paused for a moment on reaching the door of the anticamera segreta so as to give pierre time to breathe and recover himself somewhat before crossing the threshold of the sanctuary the camerieri segreti alone had the right to occupy that last antechamber and none but the cardinals might wait there till the pope should condescend to receive them and so when signor squadra made up his mind to admit pierre the latter could not restrain a slight nervous shiver as if he were passing into some redoubtable mysterious sphere beyond the limits of the lower world in the daytime a noble guard stood on sentry duty before the door but the latter was now free of access and the room within proved as empty as all the others it was rather narrow almost like a passage with two windows overlooking the new district of the castle fields and a third one facing the piazza of st peter's near the last was a door conducting to the little throne room and between this door and the window stood a small table at which a secretary now absent usually sat and here again as in all the other rooms one found a gilded pier table surmounted by a crucifix flanked by a pair of lamps in a corner too there was a large clock loudly ticking in its ebony case encrusted with brasswork still there was nothing to awaken curiosity under the panelled and gilded ceiling unless it were the wall hangings of red damask on which yellow scutcheons displaying the keys and the tiara alternated with armorial lions each with a paw resting on a globe signor squadra however now noticed that pierre still carried his hat in his hand whereas according to etiquette he should have left it in the hall of the busolanti only cardinals being privileged to carry their hats with them into the pope's presence accordingly he discreetly took the young priests from him and deposited it on the pier table to indicate that it must at least remain there then without a word by a simple bow he gave pierre to understand that he was about to announce him to his holiness and that he must be good enough to wait for a few minutes in that room on being left to himself pierre drew a long breath he was stifling his heart was beating as though it would burst nevertheless his mind remained clear and in spite of the semi-obscurity he had been able to form some idea of the famous and magnificent apartments of the pope a suite of splendid salons with tapestried or silken walls gilded or painted friezes and frescoed ceilings by way of furniture however 
There were only pier table, stools and thrones. And the lamps and the clocks and the crucifixes, even the thrones, were all presents brought from the four quarters of the world in the great fervent days of Jubilee. There was no sign of comfort. Everything was pompous, stiff, cold and inconvenient. All old in Italy was there, with its perpetual display and lack of intimate, cosy life. It had been necessary to lay a few carpets over the superb marble slabs which froze one's feet. And some calorifers had even lately been installed, but it was not thought prudent to light them lest the variations of temperature should give the Pope a cold. However, that which more particularly struck Pierre now that he stood there waiting was the extraordinary silence which prevailed all around, silence so deep that it seemed as if all the dark quiescence of that huge, somniferous Vatican were concentrated in that one suite of lifeless, sumptuous rooms, which the motionless flamelets of the lamps as dimly illumined. All at once the ebony clock struck nine, and the young man felt astonished. What, had only ten minutes elapsed since he had crossed the threshold of the bronze doors below? He felt as if he had been walking on for days and days. Then, desiring to overcome the nervous feeling which oppressed him, for he ever feared lest his enforced calmness should collapse amidst a flood of tears, he began to walk up and down, passing in front of the clock, glancing at the crucifix on the pier table, and the globe of the lamp on which had remained the mark of a servant's greasy fingers and the light was so faint and yellow that he felt inclined to turn the lamp up, but did not dare. Then he found himself with his brow resting against one of the panes of the window facing the piazza of St. Peter's, and for a moment he was thunderstruck, for between the imperfectly closed shutters he could see all Rome, as he had seen it one day from the loggia of Raffaele, and as he had pictured Leo XIII contemplating it from the window of his bedroom. However, it was now Rome by night, Rome spreading out into the depths of the gloom, as limitless as the starry sky. And in that sea of black waves one could only with certainty identify the larger thoroughfares, which the white brightness of electric lights turned, as it were, into milky ways. All the rest showed but a swarming of little yellow sparks, the crumbs, as it were, of a half-extinguished heaven swept down upon the earth. Occasional constellations of bright stars, tracing mysterious figures, vainly endeavoured to show forth distinctly, but they were submerged, blotted out by the general chaos, which suggested the dust of some old planet that had crumbled there, losing its splendour and reduced to mere phosphorescent sand. And how immense was the blackness thus sprinkled with light, how huge the mass of obscurity and mystery into which the eternal city, with its seven and twenty centuries, its ruins, its monuments, its people, its history, seemed to have been merged. You could no longer tell where it began or where it ended, whether it spread to the farthest recesses of the gloom, or whether it were so reduced that the sun on rising would illumine but a little pile of ashes. However, in spite of all Pierre's efforts, his nervous anguish increased each moment, even in the presence of that ocean of darkness which displayed such sovereign quiescence. He drew away from the window and quivered from head to foot on hearing a faint footfall, and thinking it was that of Signor Squadra approaching to fetch him. The sound came from an adjacent apartment, the little throne room whose door, he now perceived, had remained ajar. And at last, as he heard nothing further, he yielded to his feverish impatience, and peeped into this room which he found to be fairly spacious, again hung with red damask, and containing a gilded armchair, covered with red velvet under a canopy of the same material. And again there was the inevitable pier table, with a tall ivory crucifix, a clock, a pair of lamps, a pair of candelabra, a pair of large vases on pedestals, and two smaller ones of Sèvres manufacture, decorated with the Holy Father's portrait. At the same time, however, the room displayed rather more comfort, for a Smyrna carpet covered the whole of the marble floor, while a few armchairs stood against the walls, and an imitation chimney-piece, draped with damask, served as counterpart to the pier table as a rule, the Pope, whose bedchamber communicated with this little throne room, received in the latter such persons as he desired to honour. And Pierre's shiver became more pronounced at the idea that in all likelihood he would merely have the throne room to cross, and that Leo XIII was yonder behind its farther door. Why was he kept waiting, he wondered. He had been told of mysterious audiences granted at a similar hour to personages who had been received in similar silent fashion, great personages whose names were only mentioned in the lowest whispers. With regard to himself, no doubt, it was because he was considered compromising that there was a desire to receive him in this manner unknown to the personages of the court, and so as to speak with him at ease. 
then all at once he understood the cause of the noise he had recently heard for beside the lamp on the pier table of the little throne room he saw a kind of butler's tray containing some soiled plates knives forks and spoons with a bottle and a glass which had evidently just been removed from a supper table and he realized that signor squadra having seen these things in the pope's room had brought them there and had then gone in again perhaps to tidy up he knew also of the pope's frugality how he took his meals all alone at a little round table everything being brought to him in that tray a plate of meat a plate of vegetables a little bordeaux claret as prescribed by his doctor and a large allowance of beef broth of which he was very fond in the same way as others might offer a cup of tea he was wont to offer cups of broth to the old cardinals his friends and favourites quite an invigorating little treat which these old bachelors much enjoyed and o oh, ye orgies of alexander six ye banquets and galas of julius two and leo ten only eight lira a day six shillings and fourpence were allowed to defray the cost of leo thirteen's table however just as that recollection occurred to pierre he again heard a slight noise this time in his holiness's bedchamber and thereupon terrified by his indiscretion he hastened to withdraw from the entrance of the throne room which lifeless and quiescent though it was seemed in his agitation to flare as with sudden fire then quivering too violently to be able to remain still he began to walk up and down the antechamber he remembered that narcisse had spoken to him of that signor squadra his holiness's cherished valet whose importance and influence were so great he alone on reception days was able to prevail on the pope to don a clean cassock if the one he was wearing happened to be soiled by snuff and though his holiness stubbornly shut himself up alone in his bedroom every night from a spirit of independence which some called the anxiety of a miser determined to sleep alone with his treasure signor squadra at all events occupied an adjoining chamber and was ever on the watch ready to respond to the faintest call again it was he who respectfully intervened whenever his holiness sat up too late or worked too long but on this point it was difficult to induce the pope to listen to reason during his hours of insomnia he would often rise and send squadra to fetch a secretary in order that he might detail some memoranda or sketch out an encyclical letter when the drafting of one of the latter impassioned him he would have spent days and nights over it just as formerly when claiming proficiency in latin verse he had often let the dawn surprise him while he was polishing a line but indeed he slept very little his brain ever being at work ever scheming out the realization of some former ideas his memory alone seemed to have slightly weakened during recent times pierre as he slowly paced to and fro gradually became absorbed in his thoughts of that lofty and sovereign personality from the petty details of the pope's daily existence he passed to his intellectual life to the role which he was certainly bent on playing as a great pontiff and pierre asked himself which of his two hundred and fifty-seven predecessors the long line of saints and criminals men of mediocrity and men of genius he most desired to resemble was it one of the first humble popes those who followed on during the first three centuries mere heads of burial guilds fraternal pastors of the christian community was it pope damasus the first great builder the man of letters who took delight in intellectual matters the ardent believer who is said to have opened the catacombs to the piety of the faithful was it leo the third who by crowning charlemagne boldly consummated the rupture with the schismatic east and conveyed the empire to the west by the all-powerful will of god and his church which thenceforth disposed of the crowns of monarchs was it the terrible gregory the seventh the purifier of the temple the sovereign of kings was it innocent the third or boniface the eighth those masters of souls nations and thrones who armed with the fierce weapon of excommunication reigned with such despotism over the terrified middle ages that catholicism was never nearer the attainment of its dream of universal dominion was it urban the second or gregory the ninth or another of those popes in whom flared the red crusading passion which urged the nations on to the conquest of the unknown and the divine was it alexander the third who defended the holy see against the empire and at last conquered and set his foot on the neck of frederick barbarossa was it long after the sorrows of avignon julius the second who wore the cuirass and once more strengthened the political power of the papacy was it leo the tenth the pompous glorious patron of the renaissance of a whole great century of art whose mind however possessed with so little penetration and foresight that he looked on luther as a mere rebellious monk was it pius v who personified dark and avenging reaction 
the fire of the stakes that punished the heretic world was it some other of the popes who reigned after the council of trent with faith absolute belief re-established in its full integrity the church saved by pride and the stubborn upholding of every dogma or was it a pope of the decline such as benedict fourteen the man of vast intelligence the learned theologian who as his hands were tied and he could not dispose of the kingdoms of the world spent a worthy life in regulating the affairs of heaven in this wise in pierre's mind there spread out the whole history of the popes the most prodigious of all histories showing fortune in every guise the lowest the most wretched as well as the loftiest and most dazzling whilst an obstinate determination to live enabled the papacy to survive everything conflagrations massacres and the downfall of many nations for always did it remain militant and erect in the persons of its popes that most extraordinary of all lines of absolute conquering and domineering sovereigns every one of them even the puny and humble masters of the world every one of them glorious with the imperishable glory of heaven when they were thus evoked in that ancient vatican where their spirits assuredly awoke at night and prowled about the endless galleries and spreading halls in that tomb-like silence whose quiver came no doubt from the light touch of their gliding steps over the marble slabs however pierre was now thinking that he indeed knew which of the great popes leo xiii most desired to resemble it was first gregory the great the conqueror and organizer of the early days of catholic power he had come of ancient roman stock and in his heart there was a little of the blood of the emperors he administered rome after it had been saved from the goths cultivated the ecclesiastical domains and divided earthly wealth into thirds one for the poor one for the clergy and one for the church then too he was the first to establish the propaganda sending his priests forth to civilize and pacify the nations and carrying his conquests so far as to win great britain over to the divine law of christ and the second pope whom leo XIII took as model was one who had arisen after a long lapse of centuries sixtus v the pope financier and politician the vine dresser's son who when he had donned the tiara revealed one of the most extensive and supple minds of a period fertile in great diplomatists he heaped up treasure and displayed stern avarice in order that he might ever have in his coffers all the money needful for war or for peace he spent years and years in negotiations with kings never despairing of his own triumph and never did he display open hostility for his times but took them as they were and then sought to modify them in accordance with the interests of the holy see showing himself conciliatory in all things and with every one already dreaming of an european balance of power which he hoped to control and withal a very saintly pope a fervent mystic yet a pope of the most absolute and domineering mind blended with a politician ready for whatever courses might most conduce to the rule of god's church on earth and after all pierre amidst his rising enthusiasm which despite his efforts at calmness was sweeping away all prudence and doubt pierre asked himself why he need question the past was not leo xiii the pope whom he had depicted in his book the great pontiff who was desired and expected no doubt the portrait which he had sketched was not accurate in every detail but surely its main lines must be correct if mankind were to retain a hope of salvation whole pages of that book of his arose before him and he again beheld the leo thirteen that he had portrayed the wise and conciliatory politician labouring for the unity of the church and so anxious to make it strong and invincible against the day of the inevitable great struggle he again beheld him freed from the cares of the temporal power elevated radiant with moral splendour the only authority left erect above the nations he beheld him realizing what mortal danger would be incurred if the solution of the social question were left to the enemies of christianity and therefore resolving to intervene in contemporary quarrels for the defence of the poor and the lowly even as jesus had intervened once before and he again beheld him putting himself on the side of the democracies accepting the republic in france leaving the dethroned kings in exile and verifying the prediction which promised the empire of the world to rome once more when the papacy should have unified belief and have placed itself at the head of the people the times indeed were near accomplishment caesar was struck down the pope alone remained and would not the people the great silent multitude for whom the two powers had so long contended give itself to its father now that it knew him to be both just and charitable with heart aglow and hand outstretched to welcome all the penniless toilers and beggars of the roads given the catastrophe which threatened our rotten modern societies 
the frightful misery which ravaged every city there was surely no other solution possible leo XIII, the predestined necessary redeemer the pastor sent to save the flock from coming disaster by re-establishing the true christian community the forgotten golden age of primitive christianity the reign of justice would at last begin all men would be reconciled there would be but one nation living in peace and obeying the equalizing law of work under the high patronage of the pope sole bond of charity and love on earth and at this thought pierre was upbuoyed by fiery enthusiasm at last he was about to see the holy father empty his heart and open his soul to him he had so long and so passionately looked for the advent of that moment to secure it he had fought with all his courage through ever-recurring obstacles and the length and difficulty of the struggle and the success now at last achieved increased his feverishness his desire for final victory yes yes he would conquer he would confound his enemies as he had said to monsignor fornaro could the pope disavow him had he not expressed the holy father's secret ideas perhaps he might have done so somewhat prematurely but was not that a fault to be forgiven and then too he remembered his declaration to monsignor nani that he himself would never withdraw and suppress his book for he neither regretted nor disowned anything that was in it at this very moment he again questioned himself and felt that all his valour and determination to defend his book all his desire to work the triumph of his belief remained intact yet his mental perturbation was becoming great he had to seek for ideas wondering how he should enter the pope's presence what he should say what precise terms he should employ something heavy and mysterious which he could hardly account for seemed to weigh him down at bottom he was weary already exhausted only held up by his dream his compassion for human misery however he would enter in all haste he would fall upon his knees and speak as he best could letting his heart flow forth and assuredly the holy father would smile on him and dismiss him with a promise that he would not sign the condemnation of a work in which he had found the expression of his own most cherished thoughts then again such an acute sensation as of fainting came over pierre that he went up to the window to press his burning brow against the cold glass his ears were buzzing his legs staggering whilst his brain throbbed violently and he was striving to forget his thoughts by gazing upon the black immensity of rome longing to be steeped in night himself total and healing night the night in which one sleeps on forever knowing neither pain nor wretchedness when all at once he became conscious that somebody was standing behind him and thereupon with a start he turned round and there indeed stood signor squadra in his black livery again he made one of his customary bows to invite the visitor to follow him and again he walked on in front crossing the little throne room and slowly opening the farther door then he drew aside allowed pierre to enter and noiselessly closed the door behind him pierre was in his holiness's bedroom he had feared one of those overwhelming attacks of emotion which madden or paralyze one he had been told of women reaching the pope's presence in a fainting condition staggering as if intoxicated while others came with a rush as though upheld and borne along by invisible pinions and suddenly the anguish of his own spell of waiting his intense feverishness ceased in a sort of astonishment a reaction which rendered him very calm and so restored his clearness of vision that he could see everything as he entered he distinctly realized the decisive importance of such an audience he a mere petty priest in presence of the supreme pontiff the head of the church all his religious and moral life would depend on it and possibly it was this sudden thought that thus chilled him on the threshold of the redoubtable sanctuary which he had approached with such quivering steps and which he would not have thought to enter otherwise than with distracted heart and loss of senses unable to do more than stab on the simple prayers of childhood later on when he sought to classify his recollections he remembered that his eyes had first lighted on leo thirteen not however to the exclusion of his surroundings but in conjunction with them that spacious room hung with yellow damask whose alcove adorned with fluted marble columns was so deep that the bed was quite hidden away in it as well as other articles of furniture a couch a wardrobe and some trunks those famous trunks in which the treasure of the peter's pence was said to be securely locked a sort of louis the fourteenth writing desk with ornaments of engraved brass stood face to face with a large gilded and painted louis the fifteenth pier table on which a lamp was burning beside a lofty crucifix the room was virtually bare only three armchairs and four or five other chairs upholstered in light silk being disposed here and there over the well-worn carpet 
and on one of the armchairs sat Leo XIII, near a small table on which another lamp with a shade had been placed. Three newspapers, moreover, lay there, two of them French and one Italian, and the last was half unfolded as if the Pope had momentarily turned from it to stir a glass of syrup, standing beside him with a long silver gilt spoon. In the same way as Pierre saw the Pope's room, he saw his costume, his cassock of white cloth with white buttons, his white skull cap, his white cape and his white sash fringed with gold and broidered at either end with golden keys. His stockings were white, his slippers were of red velvet, and these again were broidered with golden keys. What surprised the young priest, however, was His Holiness's face and figure, which now seemed so shrunken that he scarcely recognized them. This was his fourth meeting with the Pope. He had seen him walking in the Vatican gardens, enthroned in the Hall of Beatifications, and pontifying at St. Peter's, and now he beheld him on that armchair, in privacy, and looking so slight and fragile that he could not restrain a feeling of affectionate anxiety. Leo's neck was particularly remarkable, slender beyond belief, suggesting the neck of some little aged white bird, and his face, of the pallor of alabaster, was characteristically transparent, to such a degree, indeed, that one could see the lamplight through his large commanding nose, as if the blood had entirely withdrawn from that organ. A mouth of great length, with white bloodless lips, streaked the lower part of the papal countenance, and the eyes alone had remained young and handsome. Superb eyes they were, brilliant like black diamonds, endowed with sufficient penetration and strength to lay souls open and force them to confess the truth aloud. Some scanty white curls emerged from under the white skullcap, thus whitely crowning the thin white face, whose ugliness was softened by all this whiteness, this spiritual whiteness in which Leo XIII's flesh seemed as it were but pure lily-white fluorescence. At the first glance, however, Pierre noticed that if Signor Squadra had kept him waiting, it had not been in order to compel the Holy Father to don a clean cassock, for the one he was wearing was badly soiled by snuff. A number of brown stains had trickled down the front of the garment beside the buttons, and just like any good bourgeois, his holiness had a handkerchief on his knees to wipe himself. Apart from all this, he seemed in good health, having recovered from his recent indisposition as easily as he usually recovered from such passing illnesses, sober, prudent old man that he was, quite free from organic disease, and simply declining by reason of progressive natural exhaustion. Immediately on entering, Pierre had felt that the Pope's sparkling eyes, those two black diamonds, were fixed upon him. The silence was profound, and the lamps burned with motionless, pallid flames. He had to approach, and after making the three genuflections prescribed by etiquette, he stooped over one of the Pope's feet resting on a cushion in order to kiss the red velvet slipper. And on the Pope's side there was not a word, not a gesture, not a movement. When the young man drew himself up again, he found the two black diamonds, those two eyes which were all brightness and intelligence, still riveted on him. But at last Leo XIII, who had been unwilling to spare the young priest the humble duty of kissing his foot, and who now left him standing, began to speak, whilst still examining him, probing, as it were, his very soul. "'My son,' he said, "'you greatly desired to see me, and I consented to afford you that satisfaction.' He spoke in French, somewhat uncertain French, pronounced after the Italian fashion, and so slowly did he articulate each sentence that one could have written it down like so much dictation and his voice, as Pierre had previously noticed, was strong and nasal, one of those full voices which people are surprised to hear coming from debile and apparently bloodless and breathless frames. In response to the Holy Father's remark, Pierre contented himself with bowing, knowing that respect required him to wait for a direct question before speaking. However, this question promptly came. "'You live in Paris?' asked Leo XIII. "'Yes, Holy Father.' Are you attached to one of the great parishes of the city? No, Holy Father, I simply officiate at the little church of Neuilly. Ah, yes, Neuilly, that is in the direction of the Bois de Boulogne, is it not? And how old are you, my son? Thirty-four, Holy Father. A short interval followed. Leo XIII had at last lowered his eyes. With frail ivory hand he took up the glass beside him, again stirred the syrup with the long spoon, and then drank a little of it. And all this he did gently and slowly, with a prudent, judicious air, as was his wont, no doubt, in everything. "'I have read your book, my son,' he resumed. 
Yes, the greater part of it. As a rule, only fragments are submitted to me. But a person who is interested in you handed me the volume, begging me to glance through it. And that is how I was able to look into it. As he spoke, he made a slight gesture in which Pierre fancied he could detect a protest against the isolation in which he was kept by those surrounding him, who, as Monsignor Nani had said, maintained a strict watch in order that nothing they objected to might reach him. And thereupon the young priest ventured to say, I thank your holiness for having done me so much honour. No greater or more desired happiness could have befallen me. He was indeed so happy. On seeing the Pope so calm, so free from all signs of anger, and on hearing him speak in that way of his book, like one well acquainted with it, he imagined that his cause was won. "'You are in relations with Monsieur le Vicomte Philibert de la Choux, are you not, my son?' continued Leo XIII. "'I was struck by the resemblance between some of your ideas and those of that devoted servant of the Church, who has in other ways given us previous testimony of his good feelings.' Yes, indeed, Holy Father, Monsieur de la Choux is kind enough to show me some affection. We have often talked together, so it is not surprising that I should have given expression to some of his most cherished ideas. No doubt, no doubt. For instance, there is that question of the working-class guilds with which he largely occupies himself, with which, in fact, he occupies himself rather too much. At the time of his last journey to Rome, he spoke to me of it in the most pressing manner, and in the same way, quite recently, another of your compatriots, one of the best and worthiest of men, Monsieur le Baron de Fouras, who brought us that superb pilgrimage of the St. Peter's Pence Fund, never ceased his efforts until I consented to receive him, when he spoke to me on the same subject during nearly an hour. Only it must be said that they do not agree in the matter, for one begs me to do things which the other will not have me do on any account. Pierre realized that the conversation was straying away from his book, but he remembered having promised the Viscount that if he should see the Pope, he would make an attempt to obtain from him a decisive expression of opinion on the famous question as to whether the working-class guilds or corporations should be free or obligatory, open or closed. And the unhappy Viscount, kept in Paris by the gout, had written the young priest letter after letter on the subject, whilst his rival the Baron, availing himself of the opportunity offered by the international pilgrimage, endeavoured to wring from the Pope an approval of his own views, with which he would have returned in triumph to France. Pierre conscientiously desired to keep his promise, and so he answered, Your Holiness knows better than any of us in which direction true wisdom lies. Monsieur de Fouras is of opinion that salvation, the solution of the labour question, lies simply in the re-establishment of the old free corporations whilst M. de la Choux desires the corporations to be obligatory, protected by the state and governed by new regulations. This last conception is certainly more in agreement with the social ideas now prevalent in France. Should Your Holiness condescend to express a favourable opinion in that sense, the young French Catholic party would certainly know how to turn it to good result, by producing quite a movement of the working classes in favour of the Church. In his quiet way, Leo XIII responded, But I cannot. Frenchmen always ask things of me which I cannot, will not do. What I will allow you to say on my behalf to Monsieur de la Choux is, that though I cannot content him, I have not contented Monsieur de Fouras. He obtained from me nothing beyond the expression of my sincere goodwill for the French working classes, who are so dear to me and who can do so much for the restoration of the faith. You must surely understand, however, that among you Frenchmen there are questions of detail, of mere organisation, so to say, into which I cannot possibly enter without imparting to them an importance which they do not have, and at the same time greatly discontenting some people should I please others. As the Pope pronounced these last words, he smiled a pale smile, in which the shrewd conciliatory politician, who was determined not to allow his infallibility to be compromised in useless and risky ventures, was fully revealed. And then he drank a little more syrup and wiped his mouth with his handkerchief, like a sovereign whose court day is over and who takes his ease, having chosen this hour of solitude and silence to chat as long as he may be so inclined. Pierre, however, sought to bring him back to the subject of his book. Monsieur de la Choux, said he, has shown me so much kindness, and is so anxious to know the fate reserved to my book, as if indeed it were his own, that I should have been very happy to convey to him an expression of your holiness's approval. 
However, the Pope continued wiping his mouth and did not reply. I became acquainted with the Viscount, continued Pierre, at the residence of His Eminence Cardinal Bergerot, another great heart whose ardent charity ought to suffice to restore the faith in France. This time the effect was immediate. Ah, yes, Monsieur le Cardinal Bergerot, said Leo XIII. I read that letter of his which is printed at the beginning of your book. He was very badly inspired in writing it to you. And you, my son, acted very culpably on the day you published it. I cannot yet believe that Monsieur le Cardinal Bergerot had read some of your pages when he sent you an expression of his complete and full approval. I prefer to charge him with ignorance and thoughtlessness. How could he approve of your attacks on dogma, your revolutionary theories which tend to the complete destruction of our holy religion? If it be a fact that he had read your book, the only excuse he can invoke is sudden and inexplicable aberration. It is true that a very bad spirit prevails among a small portion of the French clergy. What are called Gallican ideas are ever sprouting up like noxious weeds. There is a malcontent liberalism, rebellious to our authority, which continually hungers for free examination and sentimental adventures. The Pope grew animated as he spoke. Italian words mingled with his hesitating French, and every now and again his full nasal voice resounded with the sonority of a brass instrument. Monsieur le Cardinal Bergerot, he continued, must be given to understand that we shall crush him on the day when we see in him nothing but a rebellious son. He owes the example of obedience. We shall acquaint him with our displeasure, and we hope that he will submit. Humility and charity are great virtues, doubtless, and we have always taken pleasure in recognizing them in him. But they must not be the refuge of a rebellious heart, for they are as nothing unless accompanied by obedience. Obedience, obedience, the finest adornment of the great saints. Pierre listened, thunderstruck, overcome. He forgot himself to think of the apostle of kindliness and tolerance upon whose head he had drawn this all-powerful anger. So Don Vigilio had spoken the truth. Over and above his, Pierre's, head, the denunciations of the bishops of Evreux and Poitiers were about to fall on the man who opposed their ultramontane policy that worthy and gentle Cardinal Bergerot, whose heart was open to all the woes of the lowly and the poor. This filled the young priest with despair. He could accept the denunciation of the Bishop of Tarb acting on behalf of the fathers of the Grotto, for that only fell on himself, as a reprisal for what he had written about Lourdes. But the underhand warfare of the others exasperated him, filled him with dolorous indignation and from that puny old man before him with the slender scraggy neck of an aged bird, he had suddenly seen such a wrathful, formidable master arise that he trembled. How could he have allowed himself to be deceived by appearances on entering? How could he have imagined that he was simply in presence of a poor old man, worn out by age, desirous of peace, and ready for every concession? A blast had swept through that sleepy chamber, and all his doubts and his anguish awoke once more. Ah, that Pope, how thoroughly he answered to all the accounts that he, Pierre, had heard, but had refused to believe. So many people had told him in Rome that he would find Leo XIII a man of intellect rather than of sentiment, a man of the most unbounded pride, who from his very youth had nourished the supreme ambition, to such a point indeed that he had promised eventual triumph to his relatives, in order that they might make the necessary sacrifices for him while since he had occupied the pontifical throne his one will and determination had been to reign, to reign in spite of all, to be the sole absolute and omnipotent master of the world. And now here was reality arising with irresistible force and confirming everything. And yet Pierre struggled, stubbornly clutching at his dream once more. Oh, holy father, said he, I should be grieved indeed if his eminence should have a moment's worry on account of my unfortunate book. If I be guilty, I can answer for my error, but his eminence only obeyed the dictates of his heart, and can only have transgressed by excess of love for the disinherited of the world. End of section 27。section 28 of Rome This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Rome by Emil Zola, translated by Ernest Visitelli. Chapter 14, Part 2. 
Leo XIII made no reply. He had again raised his superb eyes, those eyes of ardent life set, as it were, in the motionless countenance of an alabaster idol, and once more he was fixedly gazing at the young priest. And Pierre, amidst his returning feverishness, seemed to behold him growing in power and splendour, whilst behind him arose a vision of the ages, a vision of that long line of popes whom the young priest had previously evoked, the saintly and the proud ones, the warriors and the ascetics, the theologians and the diplomatists, those who had worn armour, those who had conquered by the cross, those who had disposed of empires as of mere provinces which God had committed to their charge. And in particular Pierre beheld the great Gregory, the conqueror and founder, and Sixtus V, the negotiator and politician, who had first foreseen the eventual victory of the papacy over all the vanquished monarchies. Ah, what a throng of magnificent princes, of sovereign masters with powerful brains and arms, there was behind that pale, motionless old man. What an accumulation of inexhaustible determination, stubborn genius, and boundless domination. The whole history of human ambition, the whole effort of the ages to subject the nations to the pride of one man, the greatest force that has ever conquered, exploited, and fashioned mankind in the name of its happiness. And even now, when territorial sovereignty had come to an end, how great was the spiritual sovereignty of that pale and slender old man, in whose presence women fainted, as if overcome by the divine splendour radiating from his person. Not only did all the resounding glories, the masterful triumphs of history spread out behind him, but heaven opened, the very spheres beyond life shone out in their dazzling mystery. He, the Pope, stood at the portals of heaven, holding the keys and opening those portals to human souls. All the ancient symbolism was revived, freed at last from the stains of royalty here below. Oh, I beg you, Holy Father, resumed Pierre, if an example be needed, strike none other than myself. I have come and am here. Decide my fate, but do not aggravate my punishment by filling me with remorse at having brought condemnation on the innocent. Leo XIII still refrained from replying, though he continued to look at the young priest with burning eyes. And he, Pierre, no longer beheld Leo XIII, the last of a long line of popes, the vicar of Jesus Christ, the successor of the Prince of the Apostles, the Supreme Pontiff of the Universal Church, Patriarch of the East, Primate of Italy, Archbishop and Metropolitan of the Roman Province, Sovereign of the Temporal Domains of the Holy Church. He saw the Leo XIII that he had dreamt of, the awaited saviour who would dispel the frightful cataclysm in which rotten society was sinking. He beheld him with his supple, lofty intelligence and fraternal conciliatory tactics, avoiding friction and labouring to bring about unity. Whilst with his heart overflowing with love, he went straight to the hearts of the multitude, again giving the best of his blood in sign of the new alliance. He raised him aloft as the sole remaining moral authority, the sole possible bond of charity and peace. As the father, in fact, who alone could stamp out injustice among his children, destroy misery, and re-establish the liberating law of work by bringing the nations back to the faith of the primitive church, the gentleness and the wisdom of the true Christian community. And in the deep silence of that room the great figure which he thus set up assumed invincible all-powerfulness, extraordinary majesty. Oh, I beseech you, Holy Father, listen to me, he said. Do not even strike me, strike no one, neither a being nor a thing, anything that can suffer under the sun. Show kindness and indulgence to all, show all the kindness and indulgence which the sight of the world's sufferings must have set in you. And then, seeing that Leo XIII still remained silent and still left him standing there, he sank down upon his knees, as if felled by the growing emotion which rendered his heart so heavy. And within him there was a sort of debacle. All his doubts, all his anguish and sadness burst forth in an irresistible stream. There was the memory of the frightful day that he had just spent, the tragic death of Dario and Benedetta, which weighed on him like lead. There were all the sufferings that he had experienced since his arrival in Rome, the destruction of his illusions, the wounds dealt to his delicacy, the buffets with which men and things had responded to his young enthusiasm, and lying yet more deeply within his heart. There was the sum total of human wretchedness, the thought of famished ones howling for food, of mothers whose breasts were drained and who sobbed while kissing their hungry babes, of fathers without work who clenched their fists and revolted. Indeed, the whole of that hateful misery which is as old as mankind itself, which has preyed upon mankind since its earliest hour, and which he now had everywhere found increasing in horror and havoc. 
without a gleam of hope that it would ever be healed and withal yet more immense and more incurable he felt within him a nameless sorrow to which he could assign no precise cause or name an universal an illimitable sorrow with which he melted despairingly and which was perhaps the very sorrow of life o oh, holy father he exclaimed i myself have no existence and my book has no existence i desired passionately desired to see your holiness that i might explain and defend myself but i no longer know i can no longer recall a single one of the things that i wished to say i can only weep weep the tears which are stifling me yes i am but a poor man and the only need i feel is to speak to you of the poor oh the poor ones oh the lowly ones whom for two years past i have seen in our faubourgs of paris so wretched and so full of pain the poor little children that i have picked out of the snow the poor little angels who had eaten nothing for two days the women too consumed by consumption without bread or fire shivering in filthy hovels and the men thrown on the streets by slackness of trade weary of begging for work as one begs for arms sinking back into night drunken with rage and harbouring the sole avenging thought of setting the whole city afire and that night too that terrible night when in a room of horror i beheld a mother who had just killed herself with her five little ones she lying on a palliasse suckling her last born and two little girls two pretty little blondes sleeping the last sleep beside her while the two boys had succumbed farther away one of them crouching against a wall and the other lying upon the floor distorted as though by a last effort to avoid death o oh, holy father i am but an ambassador the messenger of those who suffer and who sob the humble delegate of the humble ones who die of want beneath the hateful harshness the frightful injustice of our present-day social system and i bring your holiness their tears and i lay their tortures at your holiness's feet i raise their cry of woe like a cry from the abyss that cry which demands justice unless indeed the very heavens are to fall oh show your loving kindness holy father show compassion the young man had stretched out his arms and implored leo xiii with a gesture as of supreme appeal to the divine compassion then he continued and here holy father in this splendid and eternal rome is not the want and misery as frightful during the weeks that i have roamed hither and thither among the dust of famous ruins i have never ceased to come in contact with evils which demand cure ah to think of all that is crumbling all that is expiring the agony of so much glory the fearful sadness of a world which is dying of exhaustion and hunger yonder under your holiness's windows have i not seen a district of horrors a district of unfinished palaces stricken like rickety children who cannot attain to full growth palaces which are already in ruins and have become places of refuge for all the woeful misery of rome and here as in paris what a suffering multitude what a shameless exhibition too of the social sore the devouring cancer openly tolerated and displayed in utter heedlessness there are whole families leading idle and hungry lives in the splendid sunlight fathers waiting for work to fall to them from heaven sons listlessly spending their days asleep on the dry grass mothers and daughters withered before their time shuffling about in loquacious idleness o oh, holy father already to-morrow at dawn may your holiness open that window yonder and with your benediction awaken that great childish people which still slumbers in ignorance and poverty may your holiness give it the soul it lacks a soul with the consciousness of human dignity of the necessary law of work of free and fraternal life regulated by justice only yes may your holiness make a people out of that heap of wretches whose excuse lies in all their bodily suffering and mental night who live like the beasts that go by and die never knowing nor understanding yet ever lashed onward with the whip pierre's sobs were gradually choking him and it was only the impulse of his passion which still enabled him to speak and holy father he continued is it not to you that i ought to address myself in the name of all these wretched ones are you not the father and is it not before the father that the messenger of the poor and the lowly should kneel as i am kneeling now and is it not to the father that he should bring the huge burden of their sorrows and ask for pity and help and justice yes particularly for justice and since you are the father throw the doors wide open so that all may enter even the humblest of your children the faithful the chance passers even the rebellious ones and those who have gone astray but who will perhaps enter and whom you will save from the errors of abandonment be as the house of refuge on the dangerous road 
the loving greeter of the wayfarer the lamp of hospitality which ever burns and is seen afar off and saves one in the storm and since o oh father you are power to be salvation also you can do all you have centuries of domination behind you you have nowadays risen to a moral authority which has rendered you the arbiter of the world you are there before me like the very majesty of the sun which illumines and fructifies oh be the star of kindness and charity be the redeemer take in hand once more the purpose of jesus which has been perverted by being left in the hands of the rich and the powerful who have ended by transforming the work of the gospel into the most hateful of all monuments of pride and tyranny and since the work has been spoilt take it in hand begin it afresh place yourself on the side of the little ones the lowly ones the poor ones and bring them back to the peace the fraternity and the justice of the original christian communion and say o oh father that i have understood you that i have sincerely expressed in this respect your most cherished ideas the sole living desire of your reign the rest oh the rest my book myself what matter they i do not defend myself i only seek your glory and the happiness of mankind say that from the depths of this vatican you have heard the rending of our corrupt modern societies say that you have quivered with loving pity say that you desire to prevent the awful impending catastrophe by recalling the gospel to the hearts of your children who are stricken with madness and by bringing them back to the age of simplicity and purity when the first christians lived together in innocent brotherhood yes it is for that reason is it not that you have placed yourself father on the side of the poor and for that reason i am here and entreat you for pity and kindness and justice with my whole soul then the young man gave way beneath his emotion and fell all of a heap upon the floor amidst a rush of sobs loud endless sobs which flowed forth in billows coming as it were not only from himself but from all the wretched from the whole world in whose veins sorrow coursed mingled with the very blood of life he was there as the ambassador of suffering as he had said and indeed at the foot of that mute and motionless pope he was like the personification of the whole of human woe leo XIII, who was extremely fond of talking and could only listen to others with an effort had twice raised one of his pallid hands to interrupt the young priest then gradually overcome by astonishment touched by emotion himself he had allowed him to continue to go on to the end of his outburst a little blood even had suffused the snowy whiteness of the pontiff's face whilst his eyes shone out yet more brilliantly and as soon as he saw the young man speechless at his feet shaken by those sobs which seemed to be wrenching away his heart he became anxious and leant forward calm yourself my son raise yourself he said but the sobs still continued still flowed forth all reason and respect being swept away amidst that distracted plaint of a wounded soul that moan of suffering dying flesh raise yourself my son it is not proper repeated leo thirteen there take that chair and with a gesture of authority he at last invited the young man to sit down pierre rose with pain and at once seated himself in order that he might not fall he brushed his hair back from his forehead and wiped his scalding tears away with his hands unable to understand what had just happened but striving to regain his self-possession you appeal to the holy father said leo XIII. ah rest assured that his heart is full of pity and affection for those who are unfortunate but that is not the point it is our holy religion which is in question i have read your book a bad book i tell you so at once the most dangerous and culpable of books precisely on account of its qualities the pages in which i myself felt interested yes i was often fascinated i should not have continued my perusal had i not felt carried away transported by the ardent breath of your faith and enthusiasm the subject new rome is such a beautiful one and impassions me so much and certainly there is a book to be written under that title but in a very different spirit to yours you think that you have understood me my son that you have so penetrated yourself with my writings and actions that you simply express my most cherished ideas but no no you have not understood me and that is why i desired to see you explain things to you and convince you it was now pierre who sat listening mute and motionless yet he had only come thither to defend himself for three months past he had been feverishly desiring this interview preparing his arguments and feeling confident of victory 
and now although he heard his book spoken of as dangerous and culpable he did not protest did not reply with any one of those good reasons which he had deemed so irresistible but the fact was that intense weariness had come upon him the appeal that he had made the tears that he had shed had left him utterly exhausted by and by however he would be brave and would say what he had resolved to say people do not understand me do not understand me resumed leo thirteen with an air of impatient irritation it is incredible what trouble i have to make myself understood in france especially take the temporal power for instance how can you have fancied that the holy see would ever enter into any compromise on that question such language is unworthy of a priest it is the chimerical dream of one who is ignorant of the conditions in which the papers he has hitherto lived and in which it must still live if it does not desire to disappear cannot you see the sophistry of your argument that the church becomes the loftier the more it frees itself from the cares of terrestrial sovereignty a purely spiritual royalty a sway of charity and love indeed tis a fine imaginative idea but who will ensure us respect who will grant us the arms of a stone on which to rest our head if we are ever driven forth and forced to roam the highways who will guarantee our independence when we are at the mercy of every state no no this soil of rome is ours we have inherited it from the long line of our ancestors and it is the indestructible eternal soil on which the church is built so that any relinquishment would mean the downfall of the holy catholic apostolic and roman church and moreover we could not relinquish it we are bound by our oath to god and man he paused for a moment to allow pierre to answer him but the latter to his stupefaction could say nothing for he perceived that this pope spoke as he was bound to speak all the heavy mysterious things which had weighed the young priest down whilst he was waiting in the anteroom now became more and more clearly defined they were indeed the things which he had seen and learnt since his arrival in rome the disillusions the rebuffs which he had experienced all the many points of difference between existing reality and imagination whereby his dream of a return to primitive christianity was already half shattered and in particular he remembered the hour which he had spent on the dome of st peter's when in presence of the old city of glory so stubbornly clinging to its purple he had realized that he was an imbecile with his idea of a purely spiritual pope he had that day fled from the furious shouts of the pilgrims acclaiming the pope king he had only accepted the necessity for money that last form of servitude still binding the pope to earth but all had crumbled afterwards when he had beheld the real rome the ancient city of pride and domination where the papacy can never be complete without the temporal power too many bonds dogma tradition environment the very soil itself rendered the church forever immutable it was only in appearances that she could make concessions and a time would even arrive when her concessions would cease in presence of the impossibility of going any further without committing suicide if his pierre's dream of a new rome were ever to be realized it would only be far away from ancient rome only in some distant region could the new christianity arise for catholicism was bound to die on the spot when the last of the popes riveted to that land of ruins should disappear beneath the falling dome of st peter's which would fall as surely as the temple of jupiter had fallen and as for that pope of the present day though he might have no kingdom though age might have made him weak and fragile though his bloodless pallor might be that of some ancient idol of wax he none the less flared with the red passion for universal sovereignty he was none the less the stubborn scion of his ancestry the pontifex maximus the caesar imperator in whose veins flowed the blood of augustus master of the world you must be fully aware resumed leo thirteen of the ardent desire for unity which has always possessed us we were very happy on the day when we unified the right by imposing the roman rites throughout the whole catholic world this is one of our most cherished victories for it can do much to uphold our authority and i hope that our efforts in the east will end by bringing our dear brethren of the dissident communions back to us in the same way as i do not despair of convincing the anglican sects without speaking of the other so-called protestant sects who will be compelled to return to the bosom of the only church the catholic apostolic and roman church when the times predicted by the christ shall be accomplished but a thing which you did not say in your book is that the church can relinquish nothing whatever of dogma on the contrary you seem to fancy that an agreement might be effected concessions made on either side 
and that my son is a culpable thought such language as a priest cannot use without being guilty of a crime no the truth is absolute not a stone of the edifice shall be changed oh in matters of form we will do whatever may be asked we are ready to adopt the most conciliatory courses if it be only a question of turning certain difficulties and weighing expressions in order to facilitate agreement again there is the part we have taken in contemporary socialism and here too it is necessary that we should be understood those whom you so well called the disinherited of the world are certainly the object of our solicitude if socialism be simply a desire for justice and a constant determination to come to the help of the weak and the suffering who can claim to give more thought to the matter and work with more energy than ourselves has not the church always been the mother of the afflicted the helper and benefactress of the poor we are for all reasonable progress we admit all new social forms which will promote peace and fraternity only we can but condemn that socialism which begins by driving away god as a means of ensuring the happiness of mankind therein lies simple savagery an abominable relapse into the primitive state in which there can only be catastrophe conflagration and massacre and that again is a point on which you have not laid sufficient stress for you have not shown in your book that there can be no progress outside the pale of the church that she is really the only initiatory and guiding power to whom one may surrender oneself without fear indeed and in this again you have sinned it seemed to me as if you set god on one side as if for you religion lay solely in a certain bent of the soul a florescence of love and charity which sufficed one to work one's salvation but that is execrable heresy god is ever present master of souls and bodies and religion remains the bond the law the very governing power of mankind apart from which there can only be barbarism in this world and damnation in the next and once again forms are of no importance it is sufficient that dogma should remain thus our adhesion to the french republic proves that we in no wise mean to link the fate of religion to that of any form of government however august and ancient the latter may be dynasties may have done their time but god is eternal kings may perish but god lives and moreover there is nothing anti-christian in the republican form of government indeed on the contrary it would seem like an awakening of that christian commonwealth to which you have referred in some really charming pages the worst is that liberty at once becomes license and that our desire for conciliation is often very badly requited but ah what a wicked book you have written my son with the best intentions i am willing to believe it and how your silence shows that you are beginning to recognize the disastrous consequences of your error pierre still remained silent overcome feeling as if his arguments would fall against some deaf blind and impenetrable rock which it was useless to assail since nothing could enter it and only one thing now preoccupied him he wondered how it was that a man of such intelligence and such ambition had not formed a more distinct and exact idea of the modern world he could divine that the pope possessed much information and carried the map of christendom with many of the needs deeds and hopes of the nations in his mind amidst his complicated diplomatic enterprises but at the same time what gaps there were in his knowledge the truth no doubt was that his personal acquaintance with the world was confined to his brief nunciature at brussels during his occupation of the sea of perugia which had followed he had only mingled with the dawning life of young italy and for eighteen years now he had been shut up in the vatican isolated from the rest of mankind and communicating with the nation solely through his entourage which was often most unintelligent most mendacious and most treacherous moreover he was an italian priest a superstitious and despotic high pontiff bound by tradition subjected to the influences of race environment pecuniary considerations and political necessities not to speak of his great pride the conviction that he ought to be implicitly obeyed in all things as the one sole legitimate power upon earth therein lay fatal causes of mental deformity of errors and gaps in his extraordinary brain though the latter certainly possessed many admirable qualities quickness of comprehension and patient stubbornness of will and strength to draw conclusions and act of all his powers however that of intuition was certainly the most wonderful for was it not this alone which owing to his voluntary imprisonment enabled him to divine the vast evolution of humanity at the present day he was thus keenly conscious of the dangers surrounding him of the rising tide of democracy and the boundless ocean of science which threatened to submerge the little islet where the dome of st peter's yet triumphed 
and the object of all his policy of all his labor was to conquer so that he might reign if he desired the unity of the church it was in order that the latter might become strong and inexpugnable in the contest which he foresaw if he preached conciliation granting concessions in matters of form tolerating audacious actions on the part of american bishops it was because he deeply and secretly feared the dislocation of the church some sudden schism which might hasten disaster and this fear explained his returning affection for the people the concern which he displayed respecting socialism and the christian solution which he offered to the woes of earthly life as caesar was stricken low was not the long contest for possession of the people over and would not the people the great silent multitude speak out and give itself to him the pope he had begun experiments with france forsaking the lost cause of the monarchy and recognizing the republic which he hoped might prove strong and victorious for in spite of everything france remained the eldest daughter of the church the only catholic nation which yet possessed sufficient strength to restore the temporal power at some propitious moment and briefly leo's desire was to reign to reign by the support of france since it seemed impossible to do so by the support of germany to reign by the support of the people since the people was now becoming the master the bestower of thrones to reign by means even of an italian republic if only that republic could wrest rome from the house of savoy and restore her to him a federal republic which would make him president of the united states of italy pending the time when he should be president of the united states of europe to reign in spite of everybody and everything such was his ambition to reign over the world even as augustus had reigned augustus whose devouring blood alone upheld this expiring old man yet so stubbornly clinging to power and another crime of yours my son resumed leo thirteen is that you have dared to ask for a new religion that is impious blasphemous sacrilegious there is but one religion in the world our holy catholic apostolic and roman religion apart from which there can be but darkness and damnation i quite understand that what you mean to imply is a return to early christianity but the error of so-called protestantism so culpable and so deplorable in its consequences never had any other pretext as soon as one departs from the strict observance of dogma and absolute respect for tradition one sinks into the most frightful precipices ah schism schism my son is a crime beyond forgiveness an assassination of the true god a device of the loathsome beast of temptation which hell sends into the world to work the ruin of the faithful if your book contained nothing beyond those words a new religion it would be necessary to destroy and burn it like so much poison fatal in its effects upon the human soul he continued at length on this subject while pierre recalled what don vigilio had told him of those all-powerful jesuits who at the vatican as elsewhere remained in the background secretly but none the less decisively governing the church was it true then that this pope whose opportunistic tendencies were so freely displayed was one of them a mere docile instrument in their hands though he fancied himself penetrated with the doctrines of st thomas aquinas in any case like them he compounded with the century made approaches to the world and was willing to flatter it in order that he might possess it never before had pierre so cruelly realized that the church was now so reduced that she could only live by dint of concessions and diplomacy and he could at last distinctly picture that roman clergy which at first is so difficult of comprehension to a french priest that government of the church represented by the pope the cardinals and the prelates whom the deity has appointed to govern and administer his mundane possessions mankind and the earth they begin by setting that very deity on one side in the depths of the tabernacle and impose whatever dogmas they please as so many essential truths that the deity exists is evident since they govern in his name which is sufficient for everything and being by virtue of their charge the masters if they consent to sign covenants concordats it is only as matters of form they do not observe them and never yield to anything but force always reserving the principle of their absolute sovereignty which must some day finally triumph pending that day's arrival they act as diplomatists slowly carrying on their work of conquest as the deity's functionaries and religion is but the public homage which they pay to the deity and which they organize with all the pomp and magnificence that is likely to influence the multitude their only object is to enrapture and conquer mankind in order that the latter may submit to the rule of the deity that is the rule of themselves 
since they are the deity's visible representatives expressly delegated to govern the world in a word they straightway descend from roman law they are still but the offspring of the old pagan soil of rome and if they have lasted until now and if they rely on lasting for ever until the awaited hour when the empire of the world shall be restored to them it is because they are the direct heirs of the purple-robed caesars the uninterrupted and living progeny of the blood of augustus and thereupon pierre felt ashamed of his tears ah those poor nerves of his that outburst of sentiment and enthusiasm to which he had given way his very modesty was appalled for he felt as if he had exhibited his soul in utter nakedness and so uselessly too in that room where nothing similar had ever been said before and in presence of that pontiff king who could not understand him his plan of the pope's reigning by means of the poor and lowly now horrified him his idea of the papacy going to the people at last rid of its former masters seemed to him a suggestion worthy of a wolf for if the papacy should go to the people it would only be to prey upon it as the others had done and really he pierre must have been mad when he had imagined that a roman prelate a cardinal a pope was capable of admitting a return to the christian commonwealth a fresh florescence of primitive christianity to pacify the aged nations whom hatred consumed such a conception indeed was beyond the comprehension of men who for centuries had regarded themselves as masters of the world so heedless and disdainful of the lowly and the suffering that they had at last become altogether incapable of either love or charity leo xiii however was still holding forth in his full unwearying voice and the young priest heard him saying why did you write that page on lourdes which shows such a thoroughly bad spirit lourdes my son has rendered great services to religion to the persons who have come and told me of the touching miracles which are witnessed at the grotto almost daily i have often expressed my desire to see those miracles confirmed proved by the most rigorous scientific tests and indeed according to what i have read i do not think that the most evilly disposed minds can entertain any further doubt on the matter for the miracles are proved scientifically in the most irrefutable manner science my son must be god's servant it can do nothing against him it is only by his grace that it arrives at the truth all the solutions which people nowadays pretend to discover and which seemingly destroy dogma will some day be recognized as false for god's truth will remain victorious when the times shall be accomplished that is a very simple certainty known even to little children and it would suffice for the peace and salvation of mankind if mankind would content itself with it and be convinced my son that faith and reason are not incompatible have we not got st thomas who foresaw everything explained everything regulated everything your faith has been shaken by the onslaught of the spirit of examination you have known trouble and anguish which heaven has been pleased to spare our priests in this land of ancient belief this city of rome which the blood of so many martyrs has sanctified however we have no fear of the spirit of examination study st thomas read him thoroughly and your faith will return definitive and triumphant firmer than ever these remarks caused pierre as much dismay as if fragments of the celestial vault were raining on his head o oh god of truth miracles the miracles of lourdes proved scientifically faith in the dogmas compatible with reason and the writings of st thomas aquinas sufficient to instill certainty into the minds of this present generation how could one answer that and indeed why answer it at all yes yours is a most culpable and dangerous book concluded leo xiii its very title new rome is mendacious and poisonous and the work is the more to be condemned as it offers every fascination of style every perversion of generous fancy briefly it is such a book that a priest if he conceived it in an hour of error can have no other duty than that of burning it in public with the very hand which traced the pages of error and scandal all at once pierre rose up erect he was about to exclaim tis true i had lost my faith but i thought i had found it again in the compassion which the woes of the world set in my heart you are my last hope the awaited saviour but behold that again is a dream you cannot take the work of jesus in hand once more and pacify mankind so as to avert the frightful fratricidal war which is preparing you cannot leave your throne and come along the roads with the poor and the humble to carry out the supreme work of fraternity well it is all over with you your vatican and your st peter's all is falling before the onslaught of the rising multitude and growing science you no longer exist there are only ruins and remnants left here 
However, he did not speak those words. He simply bowed and said, Holy Father, I make my submission and reprobate my book. And as he thus replied, his voice trembled with disgust, and his open hands made a gesture of surrender as though he were yielding up his soul. The words he had chosen were precisely those of the required formula. Auctor laudabiliter, se subiecit et opus reprobavit. The author has laudably made his submission and reprobated his work. No error could have been confessed, no hope could have accomplished self-destruction with loftier despair, more sovereign grandeur. But what frightful irony! That book which he had sworn never to withdraw, and for whose triumph he had fought so passionately, and which he himself now denied and suppressed, not because he deemed it guilty, but because he had just realized that it was as futile, as chimerical as a lover's desire, a poet's dream. Ah, yes, since he had been mistaken, since he had merely dreamed, since he had found there neither the deity nor the priest that he had desired for the happiness of mankind, why should he obstinately cling to the illusion of an awakening which was impossible? It were better to fling his book on the ground like a dead leaf, better to deny it, better to cut it away like a dead limb that could serve no purpose whatever. Somewhat surprised by such a prompt victory, Leo XIII raised a slight exclamation of content. That is well said, my son, that is well said. You have spoken the only words that can become a priest. And in his evident satisfaction, he who left nothing to chance, who carefully prepared each of his audiences, deciding beforehand what words he would say, what gestures even he would make, unbent somewhat and displayed real bonhomie. Unable to understand, mistaking the real motives of this rebellious priest's submission, he tasted positive delight in having so easily reduced him to silence the more so as report had stated the young man to be a terrible revolutionary. And thus his holiness felt quite proud of such a conversion. Moreover, my son, he said, I did not expect less of one of your distinguished mind. There can be no loftier enjoyment than that of owning one's error, doing penance and submitting. He had again taken the glass off the little table beside him and was stirring the last spoonful of syrup before drinking it and Pierre was amazed at again finding him as he had found him at the outset, shrunken, bereft of sovereign majesty, and simply suggestive of some aged bourgeois drinking his glass of sugared water before getting into bed. It was as if after growing and radiating like a planet ascending to the zenith, he had again sunk to the level of the soil in all human mediocrity. Again did Pierre find him puny and fragile, with the slender neck of a little sick bird, and all those marks of senile ugliness which rendered him so exacting with regard to his portraits, whether they were oil paintings or photographs, gold medals or marble busts, for of one and the other he would say that the artist must not portray Papa Pecci, but Leo XIII, the great Pope, of whom he desired to leave such a lofty image to posterity. And Pierre, after momentarily ceasing to see them, was again embarrassed by the handkerchief which lay on the Pope's lap, and the dirty cassock soiled by snuff. His only feelings now were affectionate pity for such white old age, deep admiration for the stubborn power of life which had found a refuge in those dark black eyes, and respectful deference, such as became a worker, for that large brain which harboured such vast projects, and overflowed with such innumerable ideas and actions. The audience was over, and the young man bowed low. I thank your holiness for having deigned to give me such a fatherly reception, he said. However, Leo XIII detained him for a moment longer, speaking to him of France and expressing his sincere desire to see her prosperous, calm and strong for the greater advantage of the Church. And Pierre, during that last moment, had a singular vision, a strange haunting fancy. As he gazed at the Holy Father's ivory brow and thought of his great age, and of his liability to be carried off by the slightest chill, he involuntarily recalled the scene instinct with a fierce grandeur which is witnessed each time a Pope dies. He recalled Pius the Ninth, Giovanni Mastai, two hours after death, his face covered by a white linen cloth, while the pontifical family surrounded him in dismay. And then Cardinal Pecci, the Camerlingo, approaching the bed, drawing aside the veil and dealing three taps with his silver hammer on the forehead of the deceased, repeating at each tap the call, Giovanni, Giovanni, Giovanni. And as the corpse made no response, turning after an interval of a few seconds and saying, The Pope is dead. And at the same time, yonder in the Via Giulia, Pierre pictured Cardinal Boccanera, the present Camerlingo, awaiting his turn with his silver hammer, 
and he imagined Leo XIII, otherwise Joachino Pecci, dead, like his predecessor, his face covered by a white linen cloth, and his corpse surrounded by his prelates in that very room. And he saw the Camerlingo approach, draw the veil aside, and tap the ivory forehead, each time repeating the call, Joachino, Joachino, Joachino. Then, as the corpse did not answer, he waited for a few seconds and turned and said, The Pope is dead. Did Leo XIII remember how he had thrice tapped the forehead of Pius the Ninth, And did he ever feel on the brow an icy dread of the silver hammer with which he had armed his own Camarlingo, the man whom he knew to be his implacable adversary, Cardinal Boccanera? Go in peace, my son, at last said His Holiness by way of parting benediction. Your transgression will be forgiven you, since you have confessed and testify your horror for it. With distressful spirit, accepting humiliation as well-deserved chastisement for his chimerical fancies, Pierre retired, stepping backwards according to the customary ceremonial. He made three deep bows and crossed the threshold without turning, followed by the black eyes of Leo XIII, which never left him. Still he saw the Pope stretch his arm towards the table to take up the newspaper which he had been reading prior to the audience, for Leo retained a great fancy for newspapers, and was very inquisitive as to news, though in the isolation in which he lived he frequently made mistakes respecting the relative importance of articles. And once more the chamber sank into deep quietude, whilst the two lamps continued to diffuse a soft and steady light. In the centre of the Anticamera Segreta, Signor Squadra stood waiting black and motionless, and on noticing that Pierre in his flurry forgot to take his hat from the pier table, he himself discreetly fetched it and handed it to the young priest with a silent bow. Then, without any appearance of haste, he walked ahead to conduct the visitor back to the Sala Clementina. The endless promenade through the interminable anterooms began once more, and there was still not a soul, not a sound, not a breath. In each empty room stood the one solitary lamp, burning low amidst a yet deeper silence than before. The wilderness seemed also to have grown larger as the night advanced, casting its gloom over the few articles of furniture scattered under the lofty gilded ceilings, the thrones, the stools, the pier tables, the crucifixes, and the candelabra which recurred in each succeeding room. And at last the Sala Clementina, which the Swiss guards had just quitted, was reached again, and Signor Squadra, who hitherto had not turned his head, thereupon drew aside without word or gesture, and saluting Pierre with a last bow, allowed him to pass on. Then he himself disappeared. And Pierre descended the two flights of the monumental staircase where the gas jets in their globes of ground glass glimmered like nightlights amidst a wondrously heavy silence, now that the footsteps of the sentries no longer resounded on the landings. And he crossed the court of St. Damasus, empty and lifeless in the pale light of the lamps above the steps, and descended the Scala Pia, that other great stairway as dim, deserted and void of life as all the rest, and at last passed beyond the bronze door which a porter slowly shut behind him. And with what a rumble, what a fierce roar did the hard metal close upon all that was within, all the accumulated darkness and silence, the dead motionless centuries perpetuated by tradition, the indestructible idols, the dogmas, bound round for preservation like mummies, every chain which may weigh on one or hamper one, the whole apparatus of bondage and sovereign domination, with whose formidable clang all the dark, deserted halls re-echoed. Once more the young man found himself alone on the gloomy expanse of the piazza of St. Peter's. Not a single belated pedestrian was to be seen. There was only the lofty, livid, ghost-like obelisk, emerging between its four candelabra from the mosaic pavement of red and serpentine porphyry. The façade of the basilica also showed vaguely, pale as a vision, whilst from it on either side like a pair of giant arms stretched the quadruple colonnade, a thicket of stone steeped in obscurity. The dome was but a huge roundness scarcely discernible against the moonless sky, and only the jets of the fountains, which could at last be detected rising like slim phantoms ever on the move, lent a voice to the silence the endless murmur of a plaintive sorrow coming one knew not whence. Ah, how great was the melancholy grandeur of that slumber, that famous square, the Vatican and St. Peter's, thus seen by night when wrapped in silence and darkness. But suddenly the clock struck ten with so slow and loud a chime that never, so it seemed, had more solemn and decisive an hour rung out amidst blacker and more unfathomable gloom. 
all pierre's poor weary frame quivered at the sound as he stood motionless in the centre of the expanse what had he spent barely three-quarters of an hour chatting up yonder with that white old man who had just wrenched all his soul away from him yes it was the final wrench his last belief had been torn from his bleeding heart and brain the supreme experiment had been made a world had collapsed within him and all at once he thought of monsignor nani and reflected that he alone had been right he pierre had been told that in any case he would end by doing what monsignor nani might desire and he was now stupefied to find that he had done so but sudden despair seized upon him such atrocious distress of spirit that from the depths of the abyss of darkness where he stood he raised his quivering arms into space and spoke aloud no no thou art not here o god of life and love o god of salvation but come appear since thy children are perishing because they know neither who thou art nor where to find thee amidst the infinite of the worlds above the vast square spread the vast sky of dark blue velvet the silent disturbing infinite where the constellations palpitated over the roofs of the vatican charles's wain seemed yet more tilted its golden wheels straying from the right path its golden shaft upreared in the air whilst yonder over rome towards the via giulia orion was about to disappear and already showed but one of the three golden stars which bedecked his belt End of section 28section 29 of rome this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org rome by emil zola translated by ernest visitelli chapter 15 part 1 it was nearly daybreak when pierre fell asleep exhausted by emotion and hot with fever and at nine o'clock when he had risen and breakfasted he at once wished to go down into cardinal bocanera's rooms where the bodies of dario and benedetta had been laid in state in order that the members of the family its friends and clients might bring them their tears and prayers whilst he breakfasted victorine who showing an active bravery amidst her despair had not been to bed at all told him of what had taken place in the house during the night and early morning donna serafina proved that she was had again made an attempt to have the bodies separated but this had proved an impossibility as rigor mortis had set in and to part the lovers it would have been necessary to break their limbs moreover the cardinal who had interposed once before almost quarrelled with his sister on the subject unwilling as he was that any one should disturb the lovers last slumber their union of eternity beneath his priestly garb there coursed the blood of his race a pride in the passions of former times and he remarked that if the family counted two popes among its forerunners it had also been rendered illustrious by great captains and ardent lovers never would he allow any one to touch those two children whose dolorous lives had been so pure and whom the grave alone had united he was the master in his house and they should be sewn together in the same shroud and nailed together in the same coffin then too the religious service should take place at the neighbouring church of san carlo of which he was cardinal priest and where again he was the master and if needful he would address himself to the pope and such being his sovereign will so authoritatively expressed everybody in the house had to bow submissively donna serafina at once occupied herself with the laying out according to the roman custom the servants were present and victorine as the oldest and most appreciated of them assisted the relatives all that could be done in the first instance was to envelope both corpses in benedetta's unbound hair thick and odorous hair which spread out into a royal mantle and they were then lain together in one shroud of white silk fastened about their necks in such wise that they formed but one being in death and again the cardinal imperatively ordered that they should be brought into his apartments and placed on a state bed in the centre of the throne room so that a supreme homage might be rendered to them as to the last scions of the name the two tragic lovers with whom the once resounding glory of the bocaneros was about to return to earth the story which had been arranged was already circulating through rome folks related how dario had been carried off in a few hours by infectious fever and how benedetta maddened by grief had expired whilst clasping him in her arms to bid him a last farewell and there was talk too of the royal honours which the bodies were to receive 
the superb funeral nuptials which were to be accorded them as they lay clasped on their bed of eternal rest all rome quite overcome by this tragic story of love and death would talk of nothing else for several weeks pierre would have started for france that same night eager as he was to quit the city of disaster where he had lost the last shreds of his faith but he desired to attend the obsequies and therefore postpones his departure until the following evening and thus he would spend one more day in that old crumbling palace near the corpse of that unhappy young woman to whom he had been so much attached and for whom he would try to find some prayers in the depths of his empty and lacerated heart when he reached the threshold of the cardinal's reception rooms he suddenly remembered his first visit to them they still presented the same aspect of ancient princely pomp falling into decay and dust the doors of the three large anterooms were wide open and the rooms themselves were at that early hour still empty in the first one the servants anteroom there was nobody but giacomo who stood motionless in his black livery in front of the old red hat hanging under the baldacchino where spiders spun their webs between the crumbling tassels in the second room which the secretary formerly had occupied abbe paparelli the train bearer was softly walking up and down whilst waiting for visitors and with his conquering humility his all-powerful obsequiousness he had never before so closely resembled an old maid whitened and wrinkled by excess of devout observances finally in the third anteroom the anticamera nobile where the red cap lay on a credence facing the large imperious portrait of the cardinal in ceremonial costume there was don vigilio who had left his little work table to station himself at the door of the throne room and there bow to those who crossed the threshold and on that gloomy winter morning the rooms appeared more mournful and dilapidated than ever the hangings frayed and ragged the few articles of furniture covered with dust the old woodwork crumbling beneath the continuous onslaught of termites and the ceilings alone retaining their pompous show of gilding and painting however pierre to whom abbe paparelli addressed a profound bow in which one divined the irony of a sort of dismissal given to one who was vanquished felt more impressed by the mournful grandeur which those three dilapidated rooms presented that day conducting as they did to the old throne room now a chamber of death where the two last children of the house slept their last sleep what a superb and sorrowful gala of death every door wide open and all the emptiness of those over spacious rooms void of the throngs of ancient days and leading to the supreme affliction the end of a race the cardinal had shut himself up in his little workroom where he received the relatives and intimates who desired to present their condolences to him whilst donna serafina had chosen an adjoining apartment to await her lady friends who would come in a procession until evening and pierre informed of the ceremonial by victorine had in the first place to enter the throne room greeted as he passed by a deep bow from don vigilio who pale and silent did not seem to recognize him a surprise awaited the young priest he had expected such a lying in state as is seen in france and elsewhere all windows closed so as to steep the room in night and hundreds of candles burning round a catafalco whilst from ceiling to floor the walls were hung with black drapery he had been told that the bodies would lie in the throne room because the antique chapel on the ground floor of the palazzo had been shut up for half a century and was in no condition to be used whilst the cardinal's little private chapel was altogether too small for any such ceremony and thus it had been necessary to improvise an altar in the throne room an altar at which masses had been said ever since dawn masses and other religious services were moreover to be celebrated all day long in the private chapel and two additional altars had even been set up one in a small room adjoining the anticamera nobile and the other in a sort of alcove communicating with the second anteroom and in this wise priests franciscans and members of other orders bound by the vow of poverty would simultaneously and without intermission celebrate the divine sacrifice on those four altars the cardinal indeed had desired that the divine blood should flow without pause under his roof for the redemption of those two dear souls which had flown away together and thus in that morning mansion through those funeral halls the bells scarcely stopped tinkling for the elevation of the host whilst the quivering murmur of latin words ever continued and consecrated wafers were continually broken and chalices drained in such wise that the divine presence could not for a moment quit the heavy atmosphere all redolent of death on the other hand however pierre to his great astonishment found the throne room much as it had been on the day of his first visit the curtains of the four large windows had not even been drawn 
and the grey, cold, subdued light of the gloomy winter morning freely entered. Under the ceiling of carved and gilded woodwork there were the customary red wall hangings of Brocatel, worn away by long usage, and there was the old throne with the armchair turned to the wall, uselessly waiting for a visit from the Pope which would never more come. The principal changes in the aspect of the room were that its seats and tables had been removed, and that, in addition to the improvised altar arranged beside the throne, it now contained the state bed on which lay the bodies of Benedetta and Dario amidst a profusion of flowers. The bed stood in the centre of the room on a low platform, and at its head were two lighted candles, one on either side. There was nothing else, nothing but that wealth of flowers, such a harvest of white roses that one wondered in what fairy garden they had been culled, sheaves of them on the bed, sheaves of them toppling from the bed, sheaves of them covering the step of the platform and falling from that step onto the magnificent marble paving of the room. Pierre drew near to the bed, his heart faint with emotion. Those tapers whose little yellow flamelets scarcely showed in the pale daylight, that continuous low murmur of the mass being said at the altar, that penetrating perfume of roses which rendered the atmosphere so heavy, filled the antiquated dusty room with a spirit of infinite woe, a lamentation of boundless mourning. And there was not a gesture, not a word spoken, save by the priest officiating at the altar, nothing but an occasional faint sound of stifled sobbing among the few persons present. Servants of the house constantly relieved one another, four always standing erect and motionless at the head of the bed, like faithful familiar guards. From time to time consistorial advocate Morano, who since early morning had been attending to everything, crossed the room with a silent step and the air of a man in a hurry. And at the edge of the platform all who entered knelt, prayed and wept. Pierre perceived three ladies there, their faces hidden by their handkerchiefs. And there was also an old priest who trembled with grief and hung his head in such wise that his face could not be distinguished. However, the young man was most moved by the sight of a poorly clad girl, whom he took for a servant, and whom sorrow had utterly prostrated on the marble slabs. Then in his turn he knelt down, and with the professional murmur of the lips sought to repeat the Latin prayers which, as a priest, he had so often said at the bedside of the departed. But his growing emotion confused his memory, and he became wrapped in contemplation of the lovers whom his eyes were unable to quit. Under the wealth of flowers which covered them, the clasped bodies could scarcely be distinguished, but the two heads emerged from the silken shroud, and lying there on the same cushion with their hair mingling, they were still beautiful, beautiful as with satisfied passion. Benedetta had kept her divinely gay, loving and faithful face for eternity, transported with rapture at having rendered up her last breath in a kiss of love, whilst Dario retained a more dolorous expression amidst his final joy and their eyes were still wide open, gazing at one another with a persistent and caressing sweetness which nothing would ever more disturb. O oh God, was it true that yonder lay that Benedetta whom he, Pierre, had loved with such pure brotherly affection? He was stirred to the very depths of his soul by the recollection of the delightful hours which he had spent with her. She had been so beautiful, so sensible, yet so full of passion, and he had indulged in so beautiful a dream that of animating with his own liberating fraternal feelings that admirable creature with soul of fire and indolent air, in whom he had pictured all ancient Rome, and whom he would have liked to awaken and win over to the Italy of tomorrow. He had dreamt of enlarging her brain and heart by filling her with love for the lowly and the poor, with all present-day compassion for things and beings. How he would now have smiled at such a dream had not his tears been flowing! yet how charming she had shown herself in striving to content him despite the invincible obstacles of race, education and environment. She had been a docile pupil but was incapable of any real progress. One day she had certainly seemed to draw nearer to him, as though her own sufferings had opened her soul to every charity. But the illusion of happiness had come back, and then she had lost all understanding of the woes of others, and had gone off in the egotism of her own hope and joy. Did that mean then that this Roman race must finish in that fashion, beautiful as it still often is, and fondly adored but so closed to all love for others, to those laws of charity and justice which, by regulating labour, can henceforth alone save this world of ours? Then there came another great sorrow to Pierre which left him stammering, unable to speak any precise prayer. He thought of the overwhelming reassertion of nature's powers which had attended the death of those two poor children. 
was it not awful to have taken that vow to the virgin to have endured torment throughout life and to end by plunging into death on the loved one's neck distracted by vain regret and eager for self-bestowal the brutal fact of impending separation had sufficed for benedetta to realize how she had duped herself and to revert to the universal instinct of love and therein again once more was the church vanquished therein again appeared the great god pan mating the sexes and scattering life around if in the days of the renaissance the church did not fall beneath the assault of the venuses and hercules then exhumed from the old soil of rome the struggle at all events continued as bitterly as ever and at each and every hour new nations overflowing with sap hungering for life and warring against a religion which was nothing more than an appetite for death threatened to sweep away that old holy apostolic roman and catholic edifice whose walls were already tottering on all sides and at that moment pierre felt that the death of that adorable benedetta was for him the supreme disaster he was still looking at her and tears were scorching his eyes she was carrying off his chimera this time it was really the end rome the catholic and the princely was dead lying there like marble on that funeral bed she had been unable to go to the humble the suffering ones of the world and had just expired amidst the impotent cry of her egotistical passion when it was too late either to love or to create never more would children be born of her the old roman house was henceforth empty sterile beyond possibility of awakening pierre whose soul mourned such a splendid dream was so grieved at seeing her thus motionless and frigid that he felt himself fainting he feared lest he might fall upon the step beside the bed and so struggled to his feet and drew aside then as he sought refuge in a window recess in order that he might try to recover self-possession he was astonished to perceive victorine seated there on a bench which the hangings half concealed she had come thither by donna serafina's orders and sat watching her two dear children as she called them whilst keeping an eye upon all who came in and went out and on seeing the young priest so pale and nearly swooning she at once made room for him to sit down beside her ah he murmured after drawing a long breath may they at least have the joy of being together elsewhere of living a new life in another world victorine however shrugged her shoulders and in an equally low voice responded oh live again monsieur l'abbé why when one's dead the best is to remain so and to sleep those poor children had enough torments on earth one mustn't wish that they should begin again elsewhere this naive yet deep remark on the part of an ignorant unbelieving woman sent a shudder through pierre's very bones to think that his own teeth had chattered with fear at night-time at the sudden thought of annihilation he deemed her heroic at remaining so undisturbed by any ideas of eternity and the infinite and she as she felt he was quivering went on what can you suppose there should be after death we've deserved a right to sleep and nothing to my thinking can be more desirable and consoling but those two did not live murmured pierre so why not allow oneself the joy of believing that they now live elsewhere recompensed for all their torments victorine however again shook her head no no she replied ah i was quite right in saying that my poor benedetta did wrong in torturing herself with all those superstitious ideas of hers when she was really so fond of her lover yes happiness is rarely found and how one regrets having missed it when it's too late to turn back that's the whole story of those poor little ones it's too late for them they are dead then in her turn she broke down and began to sob poor little ones poor little ones look how white they are and think what they will be when only the bones of their heads lie side by side on the cushion and only the bones of their arms still clasp one another ah may they sleep may they sleep at least they know nothing and feel nothing now a long interval of silence followed pierre amidst the quiver of his own doubts the anxious desire which in common with most men he felt for a new life beyond the grave gazed at this woman who did not find priests to her fancy and who retained all her beauceron frankness of speech with the tranquil contented air of one who has ever done her duty in her humble station as a servant lost though she had been for five and twenty years in a land of wolves whose language she had not even been able to learn ah yes tortured as the young man was by his doubts he would have liked to be as she was a well-balanced healthy ignorant creature 
who was quite content with what the world offered and who when she had accomplished her daily task went fully satisfied to bed careless as to whether she might never wake again however as pierre's eyes once more sought the state bed he suddenly recognized the old priest who was kneeling on the step of the platform and whose features he had hitherto been unable to distinguish isn't that abbe pisoni the priest of santa brigida where i sometimes said mass he inquired the poor old man how he weeps in her quiet yet desolate voice victorine replied he has good reason to weep he did a fine thing when he took it into his head to marry my poor benedetta to count prada all those abominations would never have happened if the poor child had been given her dario at once but in this idiotic city they are all mad with their politics and that old priest who is none the less a very worthy man thought he had accomplished a real miracle and saved the world by marrying the pope and the king as he said with a soft laugh poor old savant that he is who for his part has never been in love with anything but old stones you know all that antiquated rubbish of theirs of a hundred thousand years ago and now you see he can't keep from weeping the other one came too not twenty minutes ago father lorenzo the jesuit who became the contesina's confessor after abbe pisoni and who undid what the other had done yes a handsome man he is but a fine bungler all the same a perfect killjoy with all the crafty hindrances which he brought into that divorce affair i wish you had been here to see what a big sign of the cross he made after he had knelt down he didn't cry he didn't he seemed to be saying that as things had ended so badly it was evident that god had withdrawn from all share in the business so much the worse for the dead victorine spoke gently and without a pause as if it relieved her to empty her heart after the terrible hours of bustle and suffocation which she had spent since the previous day and that one yonder she resumed in a lower voice don't you recognize her she glanced towards the poorly clad girl whom pierre had taken for a servant and whom intensity of grief had prostrated beside the bed with a gesture of awful suffering this girl had just thrown back her head a head of extraordinary beauty enveloped by superb black hair la pierrina said pierre ah poor girl victorine made a gesture of compassion and tolerance what would you have said she i let her come up i don't know how she heard of the trouble but it's true that she is always prowling round the house she sent and asked me to come down to her and you should have heard her sob and entreat me to let her see the prince once more well she does no harm to anybody there on the floor looking at them both with her beautiful loving eyes full of tears she's been there for half an hour already and i had made up my mind to turn her out if she didn't behave properly but since she's so quiet and doesn't even move she may well stop and fill her heart with the sight of them for her whole life long it was really sublime to see that ignorant passionate beautiful pierina thus overwhelmed below the nuptial couch on which the lovers slept for all eternity she had sunk down on her heels her arms hanging heavily beside her and her hands open and with raised face motionless as in an ecstasy of suffering she did not take her eyes from that adorable and tragic pair never had human face displayed such beauty such a dazzling splendour of suffering and love never had there been such a portrayal of ancient grief not however cold like marble but quivering with life what was she thinking of what were her sufferings as she thus fixedly gazed at her prince now and forever locked in her rival's arms was it some jealousy which could have no end that chilled the blood of her veins or was it mere suffering at having lost him at realizing that she was looking at him for the last time without thought of hatred for that other woman who vainly sought to warm him with her arms as icy cold as his own there was still a soft gleam in the poor girl's blurred eyes and her lips were still lips of love though curved in bitterness by grief she found the lovers so pure and beautiful as they lay there amidst that profusion of flowers and beautiful herself beautiful like a queen ignorant of her own charms she remained there breathless a humble servant a loving slave as it were whose heart had been wrenched away and carried off by her dying master people were now constantly entering the room slowly approaching with mournful faces then kneeling and praying for a few minutes and afterwards retiring with the same mute desolate mien a pang came to pierre's heart when he saw dario's mother the ever beautiful flavia enter accompanied by her husband the handsome jules laporte that ex-sergeant of the swiss guard whom she had turned into a marquis pontefiori 
warned of the tragedy directly it had happened she had already come to the mansion on the previous evening but now she returned in grand ceremony and full mourning looking superb in her black garments which were well suited to her massive juno-like style of beauty when she had approached the bed with a queenly step she remained for a moment standing with two tears at the edges of her eyelids tears which did not fall then at the moment of kneeling she made sure that jules was beside her and glanced at him as if to order him to kneel as well they both sank down beside the platform and remained in prayer for the proper interval she very dignified in her grief and he even surpassing her with the perfect sorrow-stricken bearing of a man who knew how to conduct himself in every circumstance of life even the gravest and afterwards they rose together and slowly betook themselves to the entrance of the private apartments where the cardinal and donna seraphina were receiving their relatives and friends five ladies then came in one after the other while two capuchins and the spanish ambassador to the holy see went off and victorine who for a few minutes had remained silent suddenly resumed ah there's the little princess she's much afflicted too and no wonder she was so fond of our benedetta pierre himself had just noticed celia coming in she also had attired herself in full mourning for this abominable visit of farewell behind her was a maid who carried on either arm a huge sheaf of white roses the dear girl murmured victorine she wanted her wedding with her artilio to take place on the same day as that of the poor lovers who lie there and they alas have forestalled her their wedding's over there they sleep in their bridal bed celia had at once crossed herself and knelt down beside the bed but it was evident that she was not praying she was indeed looking at the lovers with desolate stupefaction at finding them so white and cold with a beauty as of marble what had a few hours sufficed had life departed would those lips never more exchange a kiss she could again see them at the ball of that other night so resplendent and triumphant with their living love and a feeling of furious protest rose from her young heart so open to life so eager for joy and sunlight so angry with the hateful idiocy of death and her anger and affright and grief as she thus found herself face to face with the annihilation which chills every passion could be read on her ingenuous candid lily-like face she herself stood on the threshold of a life of passion of which she yet knew nothing and behold on that very threshold she encountered the corpses of those dearly loved ones the loss of whom racked her soul with grief she gently closed her eyes and tried to pray whilst big tears fell from under her lowered eyelids some time went by amidst the quivering silence which only the murmur of the mass near by disturbed at last she rose and took the sheaves of flowers from her maid and standing on the platform she hesitated for a moment then placed the roses to the right and left of the cushion on which the lovers heads were resting as if she wished to crown them with those blossoms perfume their young brows with that sweet and powerful aroma then though her hands remained empty she did not retire but remained there leaning over the dead ones trembling and seeking what she might yet say to them what she might leave them of herself for evermore an inspiration came to her and she stooped forward and with her whole deep loving soul set a long long kiss on the brow of either spouse ah the dear girl said victorine whose tears were again flowing you saw that she kissed them and nobody had yet thought of that not even the poor young prince's mother ah the dear little heart she surely thought of her artilio however as celia turned to descend from the platform she perceived la pierina whose figure was still thrown back in an attitude of mute and dolorous adoration and she recognized the girl and melted with pity on seeing such a fit of sobbing come over her that her whole body her goddess-like hips and bosom shook as with frightful anguish that agony of love quite upset the little princess and she could be heard murmuring in a tone of infinite compassion calm yourself my dear calm yourself be reasonable my dear i beg you then as la pierina thunderstruck at thus being pitied and succoured began to sob yet more loudly so as to create quite a stir in the room celia raised her and held her up with both arms for fear lest she should fall again and she led her away in a sisterly clasp like a sister of affection and despair lavishing the most gentle consoling words upon her as they went follow them go and see what becomes of them victorine said to pierre i do not want to stir from here it quiets me to watch over my two poor children 
the capuchin was just beginning a fresh mass at the improvised altar and the low latin psalmody went on again while in the adjoining antechamber where another mass was being celebrated a bell was heard tinkling for the elevation of the host the perfume of the flowers was becoming more violent and oppressive amidst the motionless and mournful atmosphere of the spacious throne room the four servants standing at the head of the bed as for a gala reception did not stir and the procession of visitors ever continued men and women entering in silence suffocating there for a moment and then withdrawing carrying away with them the never-to-be-forgotten vision of the two tragic lovers sleeping their eternal sleep pierre joined celia and la pierina in the anticamera nobile where stood don vigilio the few seats belonging to the throne room had there been placed in a corner and the little princess had just compelled the work-girl to sit down in an armchair in order that she might recover self-possession celia was in ecstasy before her enraptured at finding her so beautiful more beautiful than any other as she said then she spoke of the two dead ones who also had seemed to her very beautiful endowed with an extraordinary beauty at once superb and sweet and despite all her tears she still remained in a transport of admiration on speaking with la pierina pierre learned that her brother tito was at the hospital in great danger from the effects of a terrible knife thrust dealt him in the side and since the beginning of the winter said the girl the misery in the district of the castle fields had become frightful it was a source of great suffering to everyone and those whom death carried off had reason to rejoice celia however with a gesture of invincible hopefulness brushed all idea of suffering even of death aside no no we must live she said and beauty is sufficient for life come my dear do not remain here do not weep any more live for the delight of being beautiful then she led la pierina away and pierre remained seated in one of the armchairs overcome by such sorrow and weariness that he would have liked to remain there for ever don vigilio was still bowing to each fresh visitor that arrived a severe attack of fever had come on him during the night and he was shivering from it with his face very yellow and his eyes ablaze and haggard he constantly glanced at pierre as if anxious to speak to him but his dread lest he should be seen by abbe paparelli who stood in the next ante-room the door of which was wide open doubtless restrained him for he did not cease to watch the train-bearer at last the latter was compelled to absent himself for a moment and the secretary thereupon approached the young frenchman you saw his holiness last night he said and as pierre gazed at him in stupefaction he added oh everything gets known i told you so before well and you purely and simply withdrew your book did you not the young priest's increasing stupor was sufficient answer and without leaving him time to reply don vigilio went on i suspected it but i wished to make certain ah that's just the way they work do you believe me now have you realized that they stifle those whom they don't poison he was no doubt referring to the jesuits however after glancing into the adjoining room to make sure that abbe paparelli had not returned thither he resumed and what has monsignor nani just told you but i have not yet seen monsignor nani was pierre's reply oh i thought you had he passed through before you arrived if you did not see him in the throne room he must have gone to pay his respects to donna serafina and his eminence however he will certainly pass this way again you will see him by and by then with the bitterness of one who was weak ever terror smitten and vanquished don vigilio added i told you that you would end by doing what monsignor nani desired with these words fancying that he heard the light footfall of abbe paparelli he hastily returned to his place and bowed to two old ladies who just then walked in and pierre still seated overcome his eyes wearily closing at last saw the figure of nani arise before him in all its reality so typical of sovereign intelligence and address he remembered what don vigilio on the famous night of his revelations had told him of this man who was far too shrewd to have labelled himself so to say with an unpopular robe and who withal was a charming prelate with thorough knowledge of the world acquired by long experience at different nunciatures and at the holy office mixed up in everything informed with regard to everything one of the heads one of the chief minds in fact of that modern black army which by dint of opportunism hopes to bring this century back to the church and all at once full enlightenment fell on pierre he realized by what supple clever strategy that man had led him to the act which he desired of him the pure and simple withdrawal of his book accomplished with every appearance of free will 
first there had been great annoyance on nanny's part on learning that the book was being prosecuted for he feared lest its excitable author might be prompted to some dangerous revolt then plans had at once been formed information had been collected concerning this young priest who seemed so capable of schism he had been urged to come to rome invited to stay in an ancient mansion whose very walls would chill and enlighten him and afterwards had come the ever-recurring obstacles the system of prolonging his sojourn in rome by preventing him from seeing the pope but promising him the much desired interview when the proper time should come that is after he had been sent hither and thither and brought into collision with one and all and finally when every one and everything had shaken wearied and disgusted him and he was restored once more to his old doubts there had come the audience for which he had undergone all this preparation that visit to the pope which was destined to shatter whatever remained to him of his dream pierre could picture nani smiling at him and speaking to him declaring that the repeated delays were a favour of providence which would enable him to visit rome study and understand things reflect and avoid blunders how delicate and how profound had been the prelate's diplomacy in thus crushing his feelings beneath his reason appealing to his intelligence to suppress his work without any scandalous struggle as soon as his knowledge of the real rome should have shown him how supremely ridiculous it was to dream of a new one at that moment pierre perceived nani in person just coming from the throne room and did not feel the irritation and rancour which he had anticipated on the contrary he was glad when the prelate in his turn seeing him drew near and held out his hand nani however did not wear his wonted smile but looked very grave quite grief-stricken ah my dear son he said what a frightful catastrophe i have just left his eminence he is in tears it is horrible horrible he seated himself on one of the chairs inviting the young priest who had risen to do the same and for a moment he remained silent weary with emotion no doubt and needing a brief rest to free himself of the weight of thoughts which visibly darkened his usually bright face then with a gesture he strove to dismiss that gloom and recover his amiable cordiality well my dear son he began you saw his holiness yes monseigneur yesterday evening and i thank you for your great kindness in satisfying my desire nanny looked at him fixedly and his invincible smile again returned to his lips you thank me i can well see that you behaved sensibly and laid your full submission at his holiness's feet i was certain of it i did not expect less of your fine intelligence but all the same you render me very happy for i am delighted to find that i was not mistaken concerning you and then setting aside his reserve the prelate went on i never discussed things with you what would have been the good of it since facts were there to convince you and now that you have withdrawn your book a discussion would be still more futile however just reflect that if it were possible for you to bring the church back to her early period to that christian community which you have sketched so delightfully she could only again follow the same evolutions as those in which god the first time guided her so that at the end of a similar number of centuries she would find herself exactly in the position which she occupies today no what god has done has been well done the church such as she is must govern the world such as it is it is for her alone to know how she will end by firmly establishing her reign here below and this is why your attack upon the temporal power was an unpardonable fault a crime even for by dispossessing the papacy of her domains you hand her over to the mercy of the nations your new religion is but the final downfall of all religion moral anarchy the liberty of schism in a word the destruction of the divine edifice that ancient catholicism which has shown such prodigious wisdom and solidity which has sufficed for the salvation of mankind till now and will alone be able to save it tomorrow and always pierre felt that nani was sincere pious even and really unshakable in his faith loving the church like a grateful son and convinced that she was the only social organization which could render mankind happy and if he were bent on governing the world it was doubtless for the pleasure of governing but also in the conviction that no one could do so better than himself oh certainly said he methods are open to discussion i desire them to be as affable and humane as possible as conciliatory as can be with this present century which seems to be escaping us precisely because there is a misunderstanding between us but we shall bring it back i am sure of it and that is why my dear son i am so pleased to see you return to the fold thinking as we think and ready to battle on our side is that not so in nani's words the young priest once more found the arguments of leo thirteen 
desiring to avoid a direct reply for although he now felt no anger the wrenching away of his dream had left him a smarting wound he bowed and replied slowly in order to conceal the bitter tremble of his voice i repeat monseigneur that i deeply thank you for having amputated my vain illusions with the skill of an accomplished surgeon a little later when i shall have ceased to suffer i shall think of you with eternal gratitude monsignor nani still looked at him with a smile he fully understood that this young priest would remain on one side that as an element of strength he was lost to the church what would he do now something foolish no doubt however the prelate had to content himself with having helped him to repair his first folly he could not foresee the future and he gracefully waved his hand as if to say that sufficient unto the day was the evil thereof will you allow me to conclude my dear son he at last exclaimed be sensible your happiness as a priest and a man lies in humility you will be terribly unhappy if you use the great intelligence which god has given you against him then with another gesture he dismissed this affair which was all over and with which he need busy himself no more and thereupon the other affair came back to make him gloomy that other affair which also was drawing to a close but so tragically with those two poor children slumbering in the adjoining room ah he resumed that poor princess and that poor cardinal quite upset my heart never did catastrophe fall so cruelly on a house no no it is indeed too much misfortune goes too far it revolts one's soul just as he finished a sound of voices came from the second anteroom and pierre was thunderstruck to see cardinal sanguinetti go by escorted with the greatest obsequiousness by abbe paparelli if your most reverend eminence will have the extreme kindness to follow me the train-bearer was saying i will conduct your most reverend eminence myself yes replied sanguinetti i arrived yesterday evening from frascati and when i heard the sad news i at once desired to express my sorrow and offer consolation your eminence will perhaps condescend to remain for a moment near the bodies i will afterwards escort your eminence to the private apartments yes by all means i desire every one to know how greatly i participate in the sorrow which has fallen on this illustrious house then sanguinetti entered the throne room leaving pierre quite aghast at his quiet audacity the young priest certainly did not accuse him of direct complicity with santo bono he did not even dare to measure how far his moral complicity might go but on seeing him pass by like that his brow so lofty his speech so clear he had suddenly felt convinced that he knew the truth how or through whom he could not have told but doubtless crimes become known in those shady spheres by those whose interest it is to know of them and pierre remained quite chilled by the haughty fashion in which that man presented himself perhaps to stifle suspicion and certainly to accomplish an act of good policy by giving his rival a public mark of esteem and affection the cardinal here pierre murmured despite himself nani who followed the young man's thoughts in his childish eyes in which all could be read pretended to mistake the sense of his exclamation yes said he i learnt that the cardinal returned to rome yesterday evening he did not wish to remain away any longer the holy father being so much better that he might perhaps have need of him although these words were spoken with an air of perfect innocence pierre was not for a moment deceived by them and having in his turn glanced at the prelate he was convinced that the latter also knew the truth then all at once the whole affair appeared to him in its intricacy in the ferocity which fate had imparted to it nani an old intimate of the palazzo bocconera was not heartless he had surely loved benedetta with affection charmed by so much grace and beauty one could thus explain the victorious manner in which he had at last caused her marriage to be annulled but if don vigilio were to be believed that divorce obtained by pecuniary outlay and under pressure of the most notorious influences was simply a scandal which he nani had in the first instance spun out and then precipitated towards a resounding finish with the sole object of discrediting the cardinal and destroying his chances of the tiara on the eve of the conclave which everybody thought imminent it seemed certain too that the cardinal uncompromising as he was could not be the candidate of nani who was so desirous of universal agreement and so the latter's long labour in that house whilst conducing to the happiness of the contesina had been designed to frustrate donna serafina and cardinal pio in their burning ambition that third triumphant elevation to the papacy which they sought to secure for their ancient family 
however if nani had always desired to balk this ambition and had even at one moment placed his hopes in sanguinetti and fought for him he had never imagined that bocanera's foes would go to the point of crime to such an abomination as poison which missed its mark and killed the innocent no no as he himself said that was too much and made one's soul rebel he employed more gentle weapons such brutality filled him with indignation and his face so pinky and carefully tended still wore the grave expression of his revolt in presence of the tearful cardinal and those poor lovers stricken in his stead believing that sanguinetti was still the prelate's secret candidate pierre was worried to know how far their moral complicity in this baleful affair might go so he resumed the conversation by saying it is asserted that his holiness is on bad terms with his eminence cardinal sanguinetti of course the reigning pope cannot look on the future pope with a very kindly eye at this nani for a moment became quite gay in all frankness oh said he the cardinal has quarrelled and made things up with the vatican three or four times already and in any event the holy father has no motive for posthumous jealousy he knows very well that he can give his eminence a good greeting then regretting that he had thus expressed a certainty he added i am joking his eminence is altogether worthy of the high fortune which perhaps awaits him pierre knew what to think however sanguinetti was certainly nani's candidate no longer it was doubtless considered that he had used himself up too much by his impatient ambition and was too dangerous by reason of the equivocal alliances which in his feverishness he had concluded with every party even that of patriotic young italy and thus the situation became clearer cardinals sanguinetti and bocanera devoured and suppressed one another the first ever intriguing accepting every compromise dreaming of winning rome back by electoral methods and the other erect and motionless in his stern maintenance of the past excommunicating the century and awaiting from god alone the miracle which would save the church and indeed why not leave the two theories thus placed face to face to destroy one another including all the extreme disquieting views which they respectively embodied if bocanera had escaped the poison he had none the less become an impossible candidate killed by all the stories which had set rome buzzing while if sanguinetti could say that he was rid of a rival he had at the same time dealt a mortal blow to his own candidature by displaying such passion for power and such unscrupulousness with regard to the methods he employed as to be a danger for every one monsignor nani was visibly delighted with this result neither candidate was left it was like the legendary story of the two wolves who fought and devoured one another so completely that nothing of either of them was found left not even their tails and in the depths of the prelate's pale eyes in the whole of his discreet person there remained nothing but redoubtable mystery the mystery of the yet unknown but definitively selected candidate who would be patronized by the all-powerful army of which he was one of the most skilful leaders a man like him always had a solution ready who then who would be the next pope end of section 29section 30 of rome this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org rome by emil zola translated by ernest visitelli chapter 15 part 2 however he now rose and cordially took leave of the young priest i doubt if i shall see you again my dear son he said i wish you a good journey still he did not go off but continued to look at pierre with his penetrating eyes and finally made him sit down again and did the same himself i feel sure he said that you will go to pay your respects to cardinal bergerot as soon as you have returned to france kindly tell him that i respectfully desired to be reminded to him i knew him a little at the time when he came here for his hat he is one of the great luminaries of the french clergy ah if a man of such intelligence would only work for a good understanding in our holy church unfortunately i fear that race and environment have instilled prejudices into him for he does not always help us pierre who was surprised to hear nani speak of the cardinal for the first time at this moment of farewell listened with a curiosity then in all frankness he replied yes his eminence has very decided ideas about our old church of france for instance he professes perfect horror of the jesuits with a light exclamation nani stopped the young man 
and he wore the most sincerely, frankly astonished air that could be imagined. What? Horror of the Jesuits? In what way can the Jesuits disquiet him? The Jesuits? There are none. That's all over. Have you seen any in Rome? Have they troubled you in any way, those poor Jesuits who haven't even a stone of their own left here on which to lay their heads? No, no, that bogey mustn't be brought up again. It's childish. Pierre, in his turn, looked at him, marvelling at his perfect ease, his quiet courage in dealing with this burning subject. He did not avert his eyes, but displayed an open face like a book of truth. Ah, he continued, if by Jesuits you mean the sensible priests who, instead of entering into sterile and dangerous struggles with modern society, seek by human methods to bring it back to the church, why, then, of course, we are all of us more or less Jesuits, for it would be madness not to take into account the times in which one lives. And besides, I won't haggle over words. They are of no consequence. Jesuits. Well, yes, if you like, Jesuits. He was again smiling with that shrewd smile of his in which there was so much raillery and so much intelligence. Well, when you see Cardinal Bergerot, tell him that it is unreasonable to track the Jesuits and treat them as enemies of the nation. The contrary is the truth. The Jesuits are for France because they are for wealth, strength and courage. France is the only great Catholic country which has yet remained erect and sovereign, the only one on which the papacy can some day lean. Thus the Holy Father, after momentarily dreaming of obtaining support from victorious Germany, has allied himself with France, the vanquished, because he has understood that apart from France there can be no salvation for the Church. And in this he has only followed the policy of the Jesuits, those frightful Jesuits whom your Parisians execrate. And tell Cardinal Bergeron also that it would be grand of him to work for pacification by making people understand how wrong it is for your republic to help the Holy Father so little in his conciliatory efforts. It pretends to regard him as an element in the world's affairs that may be neglected, and that is dangerous, for although he may seem to have no political means of action, he remains an immense moral force, and can at any moment raise consciences in rebellion and provoke a religious agitation of the most far-reaching consequences. It is still he who disposes of the nations, since he disposes of their souls, and the Republic acts most inconsiderately from the standpoint of its own interests in showing that it no longer even suspects it. And tell the Cardinal, too, that it is really pitiful to see in what a wretched way your Republic selects its bishops, as though it intentionally desired to weaken its episcopacy. Leaving out a few fortunate exceptions, your bishops are men of small brains, and as a result your cardinals, likewise mere mediocrities, have no influence, play no part here in Rome. Ah, what a sorry figure you Frenchmen will cut at the next conclave. And so why do you show such blind and foolish hatred of those Jesuits who, politically, are your friends? Why don't you employ their intelligent zeal, which is ready to serve you, so that you may assure yourselves the help of the next, the coming Pope? It is necessary for you that he should be on your side, that he should continue the work of Leo XIII, which is so badly judged and so much opposed, but which cares little for the petty results of today, since its purpose lies in the future, in the union of all the nations under their holy mother, the Church. Tell Cardinal Bergerot, tell him plainly that he ought to be with us, that he ought to work for his country by working for us. The coming Pope, why the whole question lies in that, and woe to France if in him she does not find a continuator of Leo XIII. Nani had again risen, and this time he was going off. Never before had he unbosomed himself at such length. But most assuredly he had only said what he desired to say, for a purpose that he alone knew of, and in a firm, gentle and deliberate voice by which one could tell that each word had been weighed and determined beforehand. Farewell, my dear son, he said, and once again think over all you have seen and heard in Rome. Be as sensible as you can, and do not spoil your life. Pierre bowed and pressed the small, plump, supple hand which the prelate offered him. Monseigneur, he replied, I again thank you for all your kindness. You may be sure that I shall forget nothing of my journey. Then he watched Nani as he went off, with a light and conquering step as if marching to all the victories of the future. No, no, he, Pierre, would forget nothing of his journey. He well knew that union of all the nations under their holy mother, the Church, that temporal bondage in which the law of Christ would become the dictatorship of Augustus, master of the world. And as for those Jesuits, he had no doubt that they did love France, the eldest daughter of the Church, 
and the only daughter that could yet help her mother to recover universal sovereignty but they loved her even as the black swarms of locusts love the harvests which they swoop on and devour infinite sadness had returned to the young man's heart as he dimly realized that in that sorely stricken mansion in all that mourning and downfall it was they they again who must have been the artisans of grief and disaster as this thought came to him he turned round and perceived don vigilio leaning against the credence in front of the large portrait of the cardinal holding his hands to his face as if he desired to annihilate himself the secretary was shivering in every limb as much with fear as with fever at a moment when no fresh visitors were arriving he had succumbed to an attack of terrified despair mon dieu what is the matter with you asked pierre stepping forward i will can i help you but don vigilio suffocating and still hiding his face could only gasp between his close-pressed hands ah paparelli paparelli what is it what has he done to you asked the other astonished then the secretary disclosed his face and again yielded to his quivering desire to confide in someone eh what he has done to me can't you feel anything can't you see anything then didn't you notice the manner in which he took possession of cardinal sanguinetti so as to conduct him to his eminence to impose that suspected hateful rival on his eminence at such a moment as this what insolent audacity and a few minutes previously did you notice with what wicked cunning he bowed out an old lady a very old family friend who only desired to kiss his eminence's hand and show a little real affection which would have made his eminence so happy ah i tell you that he's the master here he opens or closes the door as he pleases and holds us all between his fingers like a pinch of dust which one throws to the wind pierre became anxious seeing how yellow and feverish don vigilio was come come my dear fellow he said you are exaggerating exaggerating do you know what happened last night what i myself unwillingly witnessed no you don't know it well i will tell you thereupon he related that donna serafina on returning home on the previous day to face the terrible catastrophe awaiting her had already been overcome by the bad news which she had learnt when calling on the cardinal secretary and various prelates of her acquaintance she had then acquired a certainty that her brother's position was becoming extremely bad for he had made so many fresh enemies among his colleagues of the sacred college that his election to the pontifical throne which a year previously had seemed probable now appeared an impossibility thus all at once the dream of her life collapsed the ambition which she had so long nourished lay in dust at her feet on despairingly seeking the why and wherefore of this change she had been told of all sorts of blunders committed by the cardinal acts of rough sternness unseasonable manifestations of opinion inconsiderate words or actions which had sufficed to wound people in fact such provoking demeanour that one might have thought it adopted with the express intention of spoiling everything and the worst was that in each of the blunders she had recognised errors of judgment which she herself had blamed but which her brother had obstinately insisted on perpetrating under the unacknowledged influence of abbe paparelli that humble and insignificant train-bearer in whom she detected a baneful and powerful adviser who destroyed her own vigilant and devoted influence and so in spite of the mourning in which the house was plunged she did not wish to delay the punishment of the traitor particularly as his old friendship with that terrible santo bono and the story of that basket of figs which had passed from the hands of the one to those of the other chilled her blood with a suspicion which she even recoiled from elucidating however at the first words she spoke directly she made a formal request that the traitor should be immediately turned out of the house she was confronted by invincible resistance on her brother's part he would not listen to her but flew into one of those hurricane-like passions which swept everything away reproaching her for laying blame on so modest pious and saintly a man and accusing her of playing into the hands of his enemies who after killing monsignor gallo was seeking to poison his sole remaining affection for that poor insignificant priest he treated all the stories he was told as abominable inventions and swore that he would keep the train-bearer in his service if only to show his disdain for calumny and she was thereupon obliged to hold her peace however don vigilio's shuddering fit had again come back he carried his hands to his face stammering ah paparelli paparelli and muttered invectives followed the train-bearer was an artful hypocrite who feigned modesty and humility a vile spy appointed to pry into everything listen to everything and pervert everything that went on in the palace he was a loathsome destructive insect feeding on the most noble prey 
devouring the lion's mane, a Jesuit, a Jesuit who is at once lackey and tyrant, in all his base horror, as he accomplishes the work of vermin. Calm yourself, calm yourself, repeated Pierre, who, whilst allowing for foolish exaggeration on the secretary's part, could not help shivering at the thought of all the threatening things which he himself could divine astir in the gloom. However, since Don Vigilio had so narrowly escaped eating those horrible figs, his fright was such that nothing could calm it. Even when he was alone at night, in bed, with his door locked and bolted, sudden terror fell on him and made him hide his head under the sheet, and vent stifled cries as if he thought that men were coming in through the wall to strangle him. In a faint, breathless voice, as if just emerging from a struggle, he now resumed, I told you what would happen on the evening when we had a talk together in your room. Although all the doors were securely shut, I did wrong to speak of them to you. I did wrong to ease my heart by telling you all that they were capable of. I was sure they would learn it, and you see they did learn it, since they tried to kill me. Why, it's even wrong of me to tell you this, for it will reach their ears and they won't miss me the next time. Ah, oh, it's all over, I'm as good as dead. This house which I thought so safe will be my tomb. Pierre began to feel deep compassion for this ailing man, whose feverish brain was haunted by nightmares, and whose life was being finally wrecked by the anguish of persecution mania. But you must run away in that case, he said. Don't stop here. Come to France. Don Vigilio looked at him, momentarily calmed by surprise. Run away? Why? Go to France? Why, they are there. No matter where I might go, they would be there. They are everywhere. I should always be surrounded by them. No. No, I prefer to stay here, and would rather die at once if his eminence can no longer defend me. With an expression of ardent entreaty in which a last gleam of hope tried to assert itself, he raised his eyes to the large painting in which the cardinal stood forth resplendent in his cassock of red moiré. But his attack came back again and overwhelmed him with increased intensity of fever. Leave me, I beg you, leave me, he gasped. Don't make me talk any more. Ah, oh, Paparelli, Paparelli! If he should come back and see us and hear me speak. Oh, I'll never say anything again. I'll tie up my tongue. I'll cut it off. Leave me. You are killing me, I tell you. He'll be coming back, and that will mean my death. Go away. Oh, for mercy's sake, go away. Thereupon Don Vigilio turned towards the wall as if to flatten his face against it and immure his lips in tomb-like silence. And Pierre resolved to leave him to himself fearing lest he should provoke a yet more serious attack if he went on endeavouring to succour him. On returning to the throne room, the young priest again found himself amidst all the frightful mourning. Mass was following Mass. Without cessation, murmured prayers entreated the divine mercy to receive the two dear departed souls with loving kindness. And amidst the dying perfume of the fading roses, in front of the pale stars of the lighted candles, Pierre thought of that supreme downfall of the Bocaneras. Dario was the last of the name, and one could well understand that the cardinal, whose only sin was family pride, should have loved that one remaining scion by whom alone the old stock might yet blossom afresh. And indeed, if he and Donna Serafina had desired the divorce, and then the marriage of the cousins, it had been less with the view of putting an end to the scandal than with the hope of seeing a new line of Bocanera spring up. But the lovers were dead and the last remains of a long series of dazzling princes of sword and of gown lay there on that bed, soon to rot in the grave. It was all over. That old maid and that aged cardinal could leave no posterity. They remained face to face like two withered oaks, sole remnants of a vanished forest, and their fall would soon leave the plain quite clear. And how terrible the grief of surviving in impotence! What anguish to have to tell oneself that one is the end of everything! that with oneself all life, all hope for the morrow, will depart. Amidst the murmur of the prayers, the dying perfume of the roses, the pale gleams of the two candles, Pierre realised what a downfall was that bereavement, how heavy was the gravestone which fell forever on an extinct house, a vanished world. He well understood that as one of the familiars of the mansion he must pay his respects to Donna Serafina and the Cardinal and he at once sought admission to the neighbouring room where the princess was receiving her friends. He found her robed in black, very slim and very erect in her armchair, when she rose with slow dignity to respond to the bow of each person that entered. She listened to the condolences but answered never a word, overcoming her physical pain by rigidity of bearing. 
pierre who had learned to know her could divine however by the hollowness of her cheeks the emptiness of her eyes and the bitter twinge of her mouth how frightful was the collapse within her not only was her race ended but her brother would never be pope never secure the elevation which she had so long fancied she was winning for him by dint of devotion dint of feminine renunciation giving brain and heart care and money foregoing even wifehood and motherhood spoiling her whole life in order to realize that dream and amidst all the ruin of hope it was perhaps the non-fulfilment of that ambition which most made her heart bleed she rose for the young priest her guest as she rose for the other persons who presented themselves but she contrived to introduce shades of meaning into the manner in which she quitted her chair and pierre fully realized that he had remained in her eyes a mere petty french priest an insignificant domestic of the divinity who had not known how to acquire even the title of prelate when she had again seated herself after acknowledging his compliment with a slight inclination of the head he remained for a moment standing out of politeness not a word not a sound disturbed the mournful quiescence of the room for although there were four or five lady visitors seated there they remained motionless and silent as with grief pierre was most struck however by the sight of cardinal sarno who was lying back in an armchair with his eyes closed the poor puny lopsided old man had lingered there forgetfully after expressing his condolences and overcome by the heavy silence and close atmosphere had just fallen asleep and everybody respected his slumber was he dreaming as he dozed of that map of christendom which he carried behind his low obtuse looking brow was he continuing in dreamland his terrible work of conquest that task of subjecting and governing the earth which he directed from his dark room at the propaganda the ladies glanced at him affectionately and deferentially he was gently scolded at times for overworking himself the sleepiness which nowadays frequently overtook him in all sorts of places being attributed to excess of genius and zeal and of this all-powerful eminence pierre was destined to carry off only this last impression an exhausted old man resting amidst the emotion of a morning gathering sleeping there like a candid child without any one knowing whether this were due to the approach of senile imbecility or to the fatigues of a night spent in organizing the reign of god over some distant continent two ladies went off and three more arrived donna serafina rose bowed and then reseated herself reverting to her rigid attitude her bust erect her face stern and full of despair cardinal sarno was still asleep then pierre felt as if he would stifle a kind of vertigo came on him and his heart beat violently so he bowed and withdrew and on passing through the dining-room on his way to the little study where cardinal boccanera received his visitors he found himself in the presence of paparelli who was jealously guarding the door when the train-bearer had sniffed at the young man he seemed to realize that he could not refuse him admittance moreover as this intruder was going away the very next day defeated and covered with shame there was nothing to be feared from him you wish to see his eminence said paparelli good good by and by wait and opining that pierre was too near the door he pushed him back to the other end of the room for fear no doubt lest he should overhear anything his eminence is still engaged with his eminence cardinal sanguinetti wait wait there sanguinetti indeed had made a point of kneeling for a long time in front of the bodies in the throne room and had then spun out his visit to donna serafina in order to mark how largely he shared the family's sorrow and for more than ten minutes now he had been closeted with cardinal boccanera nothing but an occasional murmur of their voices being heard through the closed door pierre however on finding paparelli there was again haunted by all that don vigilio had told him he looked at the train-bearer so fat and short puffed out with bad fat in his dirty cassock his face flabby and wrinkled and his whole person at forty years of age suggestive of that of a very old maid and he felt astonished how was it that cardinal boccanera that superb prince who carried his head so high and who was so supremely proud of his name had allowed himself to be captured and swayed by such a frightful creature reeking of baseness and abomination was it not the man's very physical degradation and profound humility that had struck him disturbed him and finally fascinated him as wondrous gifts conducing to salvation which he himself lacked paparelli's person and disposition were like blows dealt to his own handsome presence and his own pride he who could not be so deformed he who could not vanquish his passion for glory must by an effort of faith have grown jealous of that man who was so extremely ugly and so extremely insignificant 
he must have come to admire him as a superior force of penitence and human abasement which threw the portals of heaven wide open who can ever tell what ascendancy is exercised by the monster over the hero by the horrid-looking saint covered with vermin over the powerful of this world in their terror at having to endure everlasting flames in payment of their terrestrial joys and twas indeed the lion devoured by the insect vast strength and splendour destroyed by the invisible ah to have that fine soul which was so certain of paradise which for its welfare was enclosed in such a disgusting body to possess the happy humility of that wide intelligence that remarkable theologian who scourged himself with rods each morning on rising and was content to be the lowest of servants standing there a heap of livid fat paparelli on his side watched pierre with his little grey eyes blinking amidst the myriad wrinkles of his face and the young priest began to feel uneasy wondering what their eminences could be saying to one another shut up together like that for so long a time and what an interview it must be if Bocanera suspected Sanguinetti of counting Santo Bono among his clients. What serene audacity it was on Sanguinetti's part to have dared to present himself in that house, and what strength of soul there must be on Bocanera's part, what empire over himself, to prevent all scandal by remaining silent and accepting the visit as a simple mark of esteem and affection. What could they be saying to one another, however? How interesting it would have been to have seen them face to face, and have heard them exchange the diplomatic phrases suited to such an interview whilst their souls were raging with furious hatred all at once the door opened and cardinal sanguinetti appeared with calm face no ruddier than usual indeed a trifle paler and retaining the fitting measure of sorrow which he had thought it right to assume his restless eyes alone revealed his delight at being rid of a difficult task and he was going off all hope in the conviction that he was the only eligible candidate to the papacy that remained. Abbe Paparelli had darted forward. If your eminence will kindly follow me, I will escort your eminence to the door. Then turning towards Pierre, he added, You may go in now. Pierre watched them walk away, the one so humble behind the other, who was so triumphant. Then he entered the little workroom, furnished simply with a table and three chairs, and in the centre of it he at once perceived Cardinal Bocanera still standing in the lofty, noble attitude which he had assumed to take leave of Sanguinetti, his hated rival to the pontifical throne. And visibly Bocanera also believed himself the only possible pope, the one whom the coming conclave would elect. However, when the door had been closed and the cardinal beheld that young priest, his guest, who had witnessed the death of those two dear children lying in the adjoining room, he was again mastered by emotion, an unexpected attack of weakness in which all his energy collapsed. His human feelings were taking their revenge now that his rival was no longer there to see him. He staggered like an old tree smitten with the axe, and sank upon a chair, stifling with sobs. And as Pierre, according to usage, was about to stoop and kiss his ring, he raised him and at once made him sit down, stammering in a halting voice, "'No, no, my dear son. Seat yourself there. Wait.' excuse me leave me to myself for a moment my heart is bursting he sobbed with his hands to his face unable to master himself unable to drive back his grief with those yet vigorous fingers which were pressed to his cheeks and temples tears came into pierre's eyes for he also lived through all that woe afresh and was much upset by the weeping of that tall old man that saint and prince usually so haughty so fully master of himself but now only a poor, suffering, agonizing man, as weak and as lost as a child. However, although the young priest was likewise stifling with grief, he desired to present his condolences, and sought for kindly words by which he might soothe the other's despair. I beg your eminence to believe in my profound grief, he said. I have been overwhelmed with kindness here, and desired at once to tell your eminence how much that irreparable loss. But with a brave gesture the cardinal silenced him no no say nothing for mercy's sake say nothing and silence reigned while he continued weeping shaken by the struggle he was waging his efforts to regain sufficient strength to overcome himself at last he mastered his quiver and slowly uncovered his face which had again become calm like that of a believer strong in his faith and submissive to the will of god in refusing a miracle in dealing so hard a blow to that house god had doubtless had his reasons and he the cardinal one of god's ministers one of the high dignitaries of his terrestrial court was in duty bound to bow to it 
the silence lasted for another moment and then in a voice which he managed to render natural and cordial bocanera said you are leaving us you are going back to france tomorrow are you not my dear son yes i shall have the honour to take leave of your eminence tomorrow again thanking your eminence for your inexhaustible kindness and you have learnt that the congregation of the index has condemned your book as was inevitable yes i obtained the signal favour of being received by his holiness and in his presence made my submission and reprobated my book the cardinal's moist eyes again began to sparkle ah you did that ah you did well my dear son he said it was only your strict duty as a priest but there are so many nowadays who do not even do their duty as a member of the congregation i kept the promise i gave you to read your book particularly the incriminated pages and if i afterwards remained neutral to such a point even as to miss the sitting in which judgment was pronounced it was only to please my poor dear niece who was so fond of you and who pleaded your cause to me tears were coming into his eyes again and he paused feeling that he would once more be overcome if he evoked the memory of that adored and lamented benedetta and so it was with a pugnacious bitterness that he resumed but what an execrable book it was my dear son allow me to tell you so you told me that you had shown respect for dogma and i still wonder what aberration can have come over you that you should have been so blind to all consciousness of your offences respect for dogma good lord when the entire work is the negation of our holy religion did you not realize that by asking for a new religion you absolutely condemned the old one the only true one the only good one the only one that can be eternal and that sufficed to make your book the most deadly of poisons one of those infamous books which in former times were burnt by the hangman and which one is nowadays compelled to leave in circulation after interdicting them and thereby designating them to evil curiosity which explains the contagious rottenness of the century ah i well recognized there some of the ideas of our distinguished and poetical relative that dear viscount philibert de la choux a man of letters yes a man of letters literature mere literature i beg god to forgive him for he most surely does not know what he is doing or whither he is going with his elegiac christianity for talkative working men and young persons of either sex to whom scientific notions have given vagueness of soul and i only feel angry with his eminence cardinal bergerot for he at any rate knows what he does and does as he pleases no say nothing do not defend him he personifies revolution in the church and is against god although pierre had resolved that he would not reply or argue he had allowed a gesture of protest to escape him on hearing this furious attack upon the man whom he most respected in the whole world however he yielded to cardinal bocanera's injunction and again bowed i cannot sufficiently express my horror the cardinal roughly continued yes my horror for all that hollow dream of a new religion that appeal to the most hideous passions which stir up the poor against the rich by promising them i know not what division of wealth what community of possession which is nowadays impossible that base flattery shown to the lower orders to whom equality and justice are promised but never given for these can come from god alone it is only he who can finally make them reign on the day appointed by his almighty power and there is even that interested charity which people abuse of to rail against heaven itself and accuse it of iniquity and indifference that lackadaisical weakening charity and compassion unworthy of strong firm hearts for it is as if human suffering were not necessary for salvation as if we did not become more pure greater and nearer to the supreme happiness the more and more we suffer he was growing excited full of anguish and superb it was his bereavement his heart wound which thus exasperated him the great blow which had felled him for a moment but against which he again rose erect defying grief and stubborn in his stoic belief in an omnipotent god who was the master of mankind and reserved felicity to those whom he selected again however he made an effort to calm himself and resumed in a more gentle voice at all events the fold is always open my dear son and here you are back in it since you have repented you cannot imagine how happy it makes me in his turn pierre strove to show himself conciliatory in order that he might not further ulcerate that violent grief-stricken soul your eminence said he may be sure that i shall endeavour to remember every one of the kind words which your eminence has spoken to me in the same way as i shall remember the fatherly greeting of his holiness leo xiii this sentence seemed to throw bocanera into agitation again 
at first only murmured restrained words came from him as if he were struggling against a desire to question the young priest ah yes you saw his holiness you spoke to him and he told you i suppose as he tells all the foreigners who go to pay their respects to him that he desires conciliation and peace for my part i now only see him when it is absolutely necessary for more than a year i have not been received in private audience this proof of disfavour of the covert struggle which as in the days of pius ninth kept the holy father and the camerlingo at variance filled the latter with bitterness he was unable to restrain himself and spoke out reflecting no doubt that he had a familiar before him one whose discretion was certain and who moreover was leaving rome on the morrow one may go a long way said he with those fine words peace and conciliation which are so often void of real wisdom and courage the terrible truth is that leo XIII's eighteen years of concessions have shaken everything in the church and should he long continue to reign catholicism would topple over and crumble into dust like a building whose pillars have been undermined interested by this remark pierre in his desire for knowledge began to raise objections but hasn't his holiness shown himself very prudent he asked has he not placed dogma on one side in an impregnable fortress if he seems to have made concessions on many points have they not always been concessions in mere matters of form matters of form ah yes the cardinal resumed with increasing passion he told you no doubt as he tells others that whilst in substance he will make no surrender he will readily yield in matters of form it's a deplorable axiom an equivocal form of diplomacy even when it isn't so much low hypocrisy my soul revolts at the thought of that opportunism that jesuitism which makes artifice its weapon and only serves to cast doubt among true believers the confusion of a sauve qui peut which by and by must lead to inevitable defeat it is cowardice the worst form of cowardice abandonment of one's weapons in order that one may retreat the more speedily shame of oneself assumption of a mask in the hope of deceiving the enemy penetrating into his camp and overcoming him by treachery no no form is everything in a traditional and immutable religion which for eighteen hundred years has been is now and till the end of time will be the very law of god the cardinal's feelings so stirred him that he was unable to remain seated and began to walk about the little room and it was the whole reign the whole policy of leo thirteen which he discussed and condemned unity too he continued that famous unity of the christian church which his holiness talks of bringing about and his desire for which people turned to his great glory why it is only the blind ambition of a conqueror enlarging his empire without asking himself if the new nations that he subjects may not disorganize adulterate and impregnate his old and hitherto faithful people with every error what if all the schismatical nations on returning to the catholic church should so transform it as to kill it and made it a new church there is only one wise course which is to be what one is and that firmly again isn't there both shame and danger in that pretended alliance with the democracy which in itself gives the lie to the ancient spirit of the papacy the right of kings is divine and to abandon the monarchical principle is to set oneself against god to compound with revolution and to harbour a monstrous scheme of utilising the madness of men the better to establish one's power over them all republics are forms of anarchy and there can be no more criminal act one which must forever shake the principle of authority order and religion itself than that of recognizing a republic as legitimate for the sole purpose of indulging a dream of impossible conciliation and observe how this bears on the question of the temporal power he continues to claim it he makes a point of no surrender on that question of the restoration of rome but in reality has he not made the loss irreparable has he not definitively renounced rome by admitting that nations have the right to drive away their kings and live like wild beasts in the depths of the forests all at once the cardinal stopped short and raised his arms to heaven in a burst of holy anger ah that man ah that man who by his vanity and craving for success will have proved the ruin of the church that man who has never ceased corrupting everything dissolving everything crumbling everything in order to reign over the world which he fancies he will reconquer by those means why almighty god why hast thou not already called him to thee so sincere was the accent in which that appeal to death was raised to such a point was hatred magnified by a real desire to save the deity imperiled here below that a great shudder swept through pierre also he now understood that cardinal bocanera who religiously and passionately hated leo thirteen 
he saw him in the depths of his black palace waiting and watching for the pope's death that death which as camerlingo he must officially certify how feverishly he must wait how impatiently he must desire the advent of the hour when with his little silver hammer he would deal the three symbolic taps on the skull of leo thirteen while the latter lay cold and rigid on his bed surrounded by his pontifical court ah to strike that wall of the brain to make sure that nothing more would answer from within that nothing beyond night and silence was left there and the three calls would ring out joachino 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 and the corpse making no answer the camerlingo after waiting for a few seconds would turn and say the pope is dead conciliation however is the weapon of the times remarked pierre wishing to bring the cardinal back to the present and it is in order to make sure of conquering that the holy father yields in matters of form he will not conquer he will be conquered cried bocanera never has the church been victorious save in stubbornly clinging to its integrality the immutable eternity of its divine essence and it would for a certainty fall on the day when it should allow a single stone of its edifice to be touched remember the terrible period through which it passed at the time of the council of trent the reformation had just deeply shaken it laxity of discipline and morals was everywhere increasing there was a rising tide of novelties ideas suggested by the spirit of evil unhealthy projects born of the pride of man running riot in full license and at the council itself many members were disturbed poisoned ready to vote for the wildest changes a fresh schism added to all the others well if catholicism was saved at that critical period under the threat of such great danger it was because the majority enlightened by god maintained the old edifice intact it was because with divinely inspired obstinacy it kept itself within the narrow limits of dogma it was because it made no concession none whether in substance or in form nowadays the situation is certainly not worse than it was at the time of the council of trent let us suppose it to be much the same and tell me if it is not nobler braver and safer for the church to show the courage which she showed before and declare aloud what she is what she has been and what she will be there is no salvation for her otherwise than in her complete indisputable sovereignty and since she has always conquered by non-surrender all attempts to conciliate her with the century are tantamount to killing her the cardinal had again begun to walk to and fro with thoughtful step no no said he no compounding no surrender no weakness rather the wall of steel which bars the road the block of granite which marks the limit of a world as i told you my dear son on the day of your arrival to try to accommodate catholicism to the new times is to hasten its end if really it be threatened as atheists pretend and in that way it would die basely and shamefully instead of dying erect proud and dignified in its old glorious royalty ah to die standing denying naught of the past braving the future and confessing one's whole faith that old man of seventy seemed to grow yet loftier as he spoke free from all dread of final annihilation and making the gesture of a hero who defies futurity faith had given him serenity of peace he believed he knew he had neither doubt nor fear of the morrow of death still his voice was tinged with haughty sadness as he resumed god can do all even destroy his own work should it seem evil in his eyes but though all should crumble to-morrow though the holy church should disappear among the ruins though the most venerated sanctuaries should be crushed by the falling stars it would still be necessary for us to bow and adore god who after creating the world might thus annihilate it for his own glory and i wait submissive to his will for nothing happens unless he wills it if really the temples be shaken if catholicism be fated to fall to-morrow into dust i shall be here to act as the minister of death even as i have been the minister of life it is certain i confess it that there are hours when terrible signs appear to me perhaps indeed the end of time is nigh and we shall witness that fall of the old world with which others threaten us the worthiest the loftiest are struck down as if heaven erred and in them punished the crimes of the world have i not myself felt the blast from the abyss into which all must sink since my house for transgressions that i am ignorant of has been stricken with that frightful bereavement which precipitates it into the gulf which casts it back into night everlasting he again evoked those two dear dead ones who were always present in his mind 
sobs were once more rising in his throat his hands trembled his lofty figure quivered with the last revolt of grief yes if god had stricken him so severely by suppressing his race if the greatest and most faithful were thus punished it must be that the world was definitively condemned did not the end of his house mean the approaching end of all and in his sovereign pride as priest and as prince he found a cry of supreme resignation once more raising his hands on high almighty god thy will be done may all die all fall all return to the night of chaos i shall remain standing in this ruined palace waiting to be buried beneath its fragments and if thy will doth summon me to bury thy holy religion be without fear i shall do nothing unworthy to prolong its life for a few days i will maintain it erect like myself as proud as uncompromising as in the days of all its power i will yield nothing whether in discipline or in right or in dogma and when the day shall come i will bury it with myself carry it whole into the grave rather than yielding aught of it encompassing it with my cold arms to restore it to thee even as thou didst commit it to the keeping of thy church almighty god and sovereign master dispose of me make me if such be thy good pleasure the pontiff of destruction the pontiff of the death of the world pierre who was thunderstruck quivered with fear and admiration at the extraordinary vision this evoked the last of the popes interring catholicism he understood that bocanera must at times have made that dream he could see him in the vatican in st peter's which the thunderbolts had riven asunder he could see him erect and alone in the spacious halls whence his terrified cowardly pontifical court had fled clad in his white cassock thus wearing white mourning for the church he once more descended to the sanctuary there to wait for heaven to fall on the evening of time's accomplishment and annihilate the earth thrice he raised the large crucifix overthrown by the supreme convulsions of the soil then when the final crack rent the steps apart he caught it in his arms and was annihilated with it beneath the falling vaults and nothing could be more instinct with fierce and kingly grandeur voiceless but without weakness his lofty stature invincible and erect in spite of all cardinal bocanera made a gesture dismissing pierre who yielding to his passion for truth and beauty found that he alone was great and right and respectfully kissed his hand it was in the throne room with closed doors at nightfall after the visits had ceased that the two bodies were laid in their coffin the religious services had come to an end and in the close silent atmosphere there only lingered the dying perfume of the roses and the warm odour of the candles as the latter's pale stars scarcely lighted the spacious room some lamps had been brought and servants held them in their hands like torches according to custom all the servants of the house were present to bid a last farewell to the departed there was a little delay morano who had been giving himself no end of trouble ever since morning was forced to run off again as the triple coffin did not arrive at last it came some servants brought it up and then they were able to begin the cardinal and donna serafina stood side by side near the bed pierre was also present as well as don figilio it was victorine who sewed the lovers up in the white silk shroud which seemed like a bridal robe the gay pure robe of their union then two servants came forward and helped pierre and don vigilio to lay the bodies in the first coffin of pine wood lined with pink satin it was scarcely broader than an ordinary coffin so young and slim were the lovers and so tightly were they clasped in their last embrace when they were stretched inside they there continued their eternal slumber their heads half hidden by their odorous mingling hair and when this first coffin had been placed in the second one a leaden shell and the second had been enclosed in the third of stout oak and when the three lids had been soldered and screwed down the lovers faces could still be seen through the circular opening covered with thick glass which in accordance with the roman custom had been left in each of the coffins and then forever parted from the living alone together they still gazed at one another with their eyes obstinately open having all eternity before them wherein to exhaust their infinite love end of section thirty